Let Yourself Run Free Again. Written by Janet Hooper. Performed by Daniel Daly. Chapter 1. September 1961. Up next is old Betsy Murphy, straight from Amarillo, Texas. Betsy's heart sped at the announcer's words. She's already in the running for nationals next month. The crowd went berserk, drowning out her swishing pulse. Are you ready, Betsy? The voice over the loudspeaker asked. Her mare's quickened breath added to her own, and for a moment it was just her and Pearl and throbbing adrenaline. Toughest place to compete is in your own hometown. What I want you to do is cheer on that crowd and don't wait. When she clears barrel number one, start making some noise for her. Come on, all you fans out there. Let's hear it. Shouts from the stands and the Texan twang of the announcer all blurred together. A continuous roar choked off by the thrum in her ears. Pearl's muscles tensed beneath her. Anticipation pumped through her, every charged nerve igniting with energy. Betsy shifted low over the saddle, the reins in her outstretched arms at Pearl's ears. With only a tap of her foot, Pearl leapt forward and shot out from the back of the arena, all nerves forgotten. She goes. Give it up, uh, people. The voice blared. As loud as the announcer was, all Betsy heard was her da's voice in her head. Lower. Get lower. It began to drown out the sounds from the bleachers. Flatten yourself, Bet. Let that beast know who's boss. Coming up on the first barrel, Betsy pushed the voice back and signaled. Hey, to her horse a hand on the saddle horn, the other high on Pearl's neck. She peeled her around to the right. Too tight. Almost caught that barrel. Tighter next time! She heard her da shout from the stands, though she knew she imagined it. They sped to the next barrel. Hey! Betsy called, then rounded to the left, completing her figure eight. The mare skidded a little. Betsy gripped the horn tighter, tapped the barrel, it rocked as it left her vision. Not good, not good. She hoped it didn't go over. Not so tight next time. Her da's voice shouted the opposite. Tighter! Will you ever get this right, Bet? Her stomach flipped at the criticism and the masculine nickname she hated, even if the voice was in her head. Hey! She signaled at the last barrel. Anticipating her da's disapproval, she tugged at the reins. Too high. The mistake pulled the mare's head up going into the turn. As one, horse and rider slanted hard right. Time slowed to a crawl as Pearl's legs slipped out from under her. Her skid slammed a shoulder into the barrel. The steel drum banged over and rolled. She's going down! The announcer shouted to the fans. The mare hit the dirt hard. Betsy saw her boots against blue sky. Weightlessness. Then nothing. Betsy, can you hear me? A man said above her. Her eyelids fluttered open. Sunlight streamed in, knifing her pupils, gushing pain into her skull. She blinked and again rolled her eyes from one side to the other, taking in her surroundings. Still in the arena, flat on her back, neck wrenched. She moved it. It's okay. She remembered to roll when she hit the ground. Her da's voice reminded her, one good thing coming from his incessant buzz in her head. Put your hands together. Let Betsy know you're pulling for her. Came the ceaseless broadcast, along with shouts and the thunder of boots against wooden bleachers. Betsy, the same male voice, can you move? Startled by the notion she mayhap couldn't, she moved all her limbs at once, scrambling to sit up. Lay still, the same voice said. Who was that? She squinted up at the sound. Jimmy, at her side. Of course he was. He was her only friend on the circuit. The men didn't like women in their good old boys club of rodeoing, and her fellow competitors kept their distance since she had a good chance of taking the world championship and the cash. It would be over 8,000 this year. A fortune. I'm fine, she said to a friend. 
Pearl? The horse is hurt, but she'll recover. Bet's looking after her. Betsy groaned in agony. For herself? For her horse? At least she didn't need this wind to make nationals. Help me up. Jimmy thrust out a hand. She grabbed hold of his thumb as he wrapped his hand around hers. He braced the small of her back with his other hand and hauled her to her feet. The crowd went wild. Betsy lifted her head to glance at the stands, then bent over and threw up. Folding the last of her jeans, Betsy pressed them into her suitcase, at the same time bolstering herself for a hard talk with her da. They'd already been back home for three days. Time was wasting. She chewed on her upper lip, irritated by the bad habit but thankful for it all the same. At least it kept her from spewing every gall darn thought that entered her head. Nuts, unhinged, or maybe even deranged, some called her. Spirited was how she'd like to think of herself. Da wasn't going to want her to go on a twelve-hour trip north to Wyoming. That was a given. Mostly because it wasn't his idea. Her anxiety had gotten the better of her through the night, though, so it was time to get this over with. Whether he liked it or not, a horse was needed to win nationals. Pearl would recover, but not soon enough, and losing wasn't an option. The money was necessary so she could move out on her own. Now all it boiled down to was a horse. Betsy had to find one and find it fast. Jogging down the steps, she purposefully slowed her gait when she entered the kitchen. Her father was sipping coffee at the little round table. She strolled in as calmly as possible, though her insides were burning with dread. Once she had a cup of coffee in her hands, she sat down across from her da, forcing a smile instead of the usual lip-chewing. Giving her da a once-over, she noticed the deep lines between his eyes from the constant frown. It's been three days since Pearl was hurt, da, she said, digging right in, knowing she had to get it all out before his temper emerged. She won't be ready for nationals. The break we have right now isn't long enough for her to heal properly. I need another horse, a good one. One who's flexible and can manage the barrels. Or I don't stand a chance. You know how important this is to me. To all women, she wanted to say, but didn't dare. Pearl be fine, Da said, not even looking up from his newspaper. It was time men stopped dictating everything in this world. It should have happened when women gained the right to vote back in 1920. Betsy's drive to overturn male dominance had leaked over into rodeo. At least women were given a chance to compete, finally, even though it was in a separate event that was considered a sideshow. Stop your snivelin', her da said, reminding her again why she fought so hard against men. Betsy ignored her da's comment. He didn't know horses, not like she did though he thought he did. Have you heard of Jake Cooper? She ventured. Course I have. Horse trainer, half Scott. Well known. From Montana. He lives in Wyoming now. I'm going to see him. Da snorted. He ain't going to see us. I've already called him. He says he'll meet with me. Da jumped to his feet in a fit of anger and threw his cup across the kitchen. Betsy jerked when it hit and shattered against the cabinets. He always welded his temper to get his way. He used to work when she was younger. Through the years, she'd learned to put a cap on her fear and not react. It was surprising how well that worked, especially when she left him to pick up his messes. I'll be leaving tomorrow. I'm taking the telephone truck and horse trailer. He remained motionless, other than his hands clenching and unclenching, huffing his next few breaths. Since Betsy had turned 21, nearly a year ago, his power over her was starting to slip. It was about time. He'd almost succeeded in making her into a man, longing for a son as he did. Her mother had never provided him one before she skipped out on both of them. Just because you learned how to drive in that old crate, Bet, don't make it steady enough for a trip. I bought that old discard for the ranch to carry me tools in the side panels. Nothing more. And you'll be aware of it. He frowned again, splitting his brows with that deep crease. You'll not be going alone, lass, and I'll not be going right now. 
have that Arbor and Company meet in tonight? He had to be desperate, burrowing deep for excuses. She took a few steps toward him, something that usually baffled and unbalanced him. Oh, no. You don't get to say you're worried about me now, Da. It's too late. You've thought of me as a son my whole life. You've done well. I can take care of myself. He huffed, reminding her of their bull, Stony, when he got agitated. After a few stolid seconds, his face softened. A look of respect took over. Take Jimmy, lass. That was fast. These days, when she pushed back, he backed down. She should have stood up to her da long ago. Perhaps I will. With two of us driving, we can make it in two days easy. Take the pickup, it's newer, more reliable. I do not want to come and get you when you break down. Nay, she shook her head. I'm used to the telephone truck. Besides, if anything happens to it, I'll have all your tools to fix it. Win-win. Thanks for the offer, though. No, say here, loss. I'll be needing those tools here. I've got to go hook up the trailer. Don't worry, Da. I'll leave your favorite tools behind. Betsy skirted the table for the back door, giving last reminders as she went. Remember, I won't be here to make your breakfasts. Have some cereal. There's plenty in the cupboard. What? Why? Gotta go, Da. She continued for the door, but stopped and turned back. She caught his gaze. Should she request he oversee Pearl's recovery? Her stomach churned at the thought. It would seem like begging to him. Turning back from the door, she grabbed an apple out of the fruit basket. She'd swing by Pearl's stall before she hitched the trailer. Make sure someone took over her task of cold water hosing Pearl's shoulder twice a day, the full fifteen minutes. Be sure she was given the two grams of butte once a day for the next week. Remind that someone the bottle was in her home treatment bucket the vet gave her in Dallas. She hesitated once again, the doorknob in hand. Should I ask? Her daw had berated her so many times when she worried like a girl. She didn't even know why asking for his help had even crossed her mind. No. She twisted the knob and flung the door open before she could change her mind. She'd handle Pearl's treatment with their foreman, leave her da out of it. After all, her da had created this male version of Elizabeth Riley Murphy. Now he had to live with it. And so did she. Chapter 2 Colt Cooper rasped a hand on his face for the third time in as many minutes. This filly was driving him nuts. When his cousin Jake had sold her to him a few weeks ago, he hadn't mentioned this endless gusto. There wasn't enough space in the corral for her liking, so she looped in circles, figure eights, ran the fence line, and then began again. Maybe he should think about breeding her, leech some energy from her. That thought instantly soured his stomach. She was young, and a stallion had grown more aggressive. He'd tried with over a half a dozen mares since the stallion had been covertly dosed with loco weed last year, and none had taken. Each time he'd had to return the money to the rancher and send the mare home with an empty womb. He feared Jake's assessment of the stud sterility correct. His attention focused on the mare, who was still acting like a young filly. Active, headstrong, disobedient. He groaned under his breath. What he needed was Jake's judgment on how to train her. Ever since he'd begun his horse training business, Colt had had nothing but trouble. Rebecca had been a big help before she'd married his father. Now the newlyweds were on an extended honeymoon, and Colt and his older brother were in charge of the ranch. That left little time for Colt to work his horses, since it was either help Trevor or watch him drop in his own footprints. Enough running, you stinking female! he hollered at his current youngster. Why is it men always lump all females together when one of them is giving him conniption fits? Colt swung around to face the familiar voice. Rebecca, you're back! He jogged over and swung her off her feet in a bear hug. Hold up there, son. That's my wife you got your hands on, his dad said. Colt plunked his new stepmother back on the ground. 
He didn't know whether to grimace or laugh at her new title. Rebecca, seventeen years his father's junior, made an odd match with the old man. But they were perfect for each other. With a broad smile on his face, he took the few steps to his dad and shook his hand. The smile lines and snappy grin on his dad's face told Cole everything he needed to know. Rebecca scooted over to her husband, and in an all-encompassing embrace, for several long seconds they joined in a very public, very passionate kiss. Cole cleared his throat. Okay, stud, I got she's your mare. The two lovebirds broke the kiss, but were busy staring with love in each other's eyes. Colt was glad they were happy. But come on. Enough already, Colt said. Get the heck out of my sight, or control yourselves. Your choice. Dad swung his arm around Rebecca's waist and held her to his side. Colt lifted one brow. How was the honeymoon? As if I need to ask. They turned their heads to each other and fastened foreheads, both smiling like they had a grand secret. Yeah, yeah, Colt knew all about that. Well, are you going to tell me about it? Only the stuff outside the bedroom. Or are you going back to the house? His dad turned back to Colt, letting the goofy smile slip away. How's the ranch? Is Trevor holding up? You? Trev worries me. The ranch? It's okay, but we had a few more incidents. His dad released Rebecca's waist, but caught her by the hand as he stepped closer. What do you mean? Is the dang widow still causing trouble? Even after I made sure her lawyer had proof Becca and my marriage was real? His dad's face reddened as he recalled his former rage. We've been gone three weeks for crying out loud. Things should have died down by now. What happened? First off, the widow and her foreman took off for Texas right after you left. Word is they're checking out a new type hay baler called a wafer machine. Guess it was something she'd hoped to own with you before your whole contract collapsed. It makes six by four by four inch solid hay wafers. Easy to store, easy to use as feed, supposedly. Doesn't mold. More on that another time. Fact is, she was gone, so it can't be her or her foreman. Cord cursed, then apologized to Rebecca. Who then? Beats the heck out of me. All this time we thought the widow was the problem. Either she's left someone else to do the job for her, or it's been someone else all along. Rebecca lifted their joined hands to her lips, pressing a kiss to Cord's knuckles. Listen, honey, I'll go back to the house and fix us some lunch. Unpack start a load of wash. You and Colt sort this out and tell me later, okay? She smiled at her husband, then nodded to Colt. She started to release his hand, but his dad tugged her back, surrounding her in his arms for another deep kiss. Colt groaned and averted his gaze. He could joke all he wanted, but each display of affection plucked at his rusted heart. Bald as it was like tangled barbed wire, waiting to be hauled off and trashed. At times like this, he contemplated taking a closer look at the women who flocked to him, until he remembered how all-fangled irritating they all were. His aim was to ripen into an old leathery rancher who eyed the temptations and hazards of the opposite sex from a distance. He couldn't make time for them anyway. Trev needed him too much. Everyone needed him too much. No one knew his desire to be released from the life that had been carved out for him. He'd had to keep it to himself, be content to offer himself to everyone as the old soul Rebecca insisted on calling him. He was caged, but he didn't know any other way to live safely. So he'd keep working, keep avoiding a chance at a different kind of life and he'd never let anyone find out just how much he wanted to run free. Two days later, Jake stood at the corral fence with Colt. Hey, the mare's flighty. Always has been. If Jake thought so, why hadn't he told Colt? I always kent she'd be perfect for the right person. Found that person, mayhap. Yeah? Colt's forearms rode the fence top, his neck craned to look into Jake's face. 
Who would that be? Got a call from a lass out Texas way, wanting a horse for barrel racing. Been told she's a big name on the circuit already. From what I can see, this mare is perfect for her. Wants to run, endless. Wants a very good start. Seems flexible enough. The lass is in a hurry for a horse. Needs it for nationals next month. Next month? Well, not possible, Jake. There's no way you can get this filly ready in a month. Nay, not me. Puzzled, Colt narrowed his eyes. You. Colt stepped back, pulling away from the top board and dropping his hands to his hips. He eyed Jake. How can I do it if you can't? Dinna say I couldn't. Just that you will be doing it. Why? Two stallions I'm working over right now. They have to be ready in a month as well. I do nay have time, Letty. Why did you agree to let her come then? Sounded desperate. I only promised to meet with her. She's on her way. I figured you could do it. Jake turned his head to Colt and gave him a double dimple grin. Before he'd married Susanna, Jake never smiled like that. Now he was a veritable spotlight. Looked just like his dad's goofy grin. Gad! Two happy Coopers when only a year ago they'd all been in the same miserable heap of brokenness. Jake laid a hand on Colt's shoulder. You will have to let her stay with you whilst the two of you train this mare. He nodded to the flash of russet coat that whizzed by again. Colt lifted Jake's hand off his shoulder and raised both his up in a mocked strangle at Jake's neck. Jake laughed. <laughs> I'm not letting any her stay here. Do you know how hard it would be to get rid of her later? Can I be helped? Jake's grin died off as he studied Colt for a few seconds, seeming to decide how to say something else. She is offering a great deal of money, Letty. You cannot turn it down. The scowl fell from Colt's face. His shoulders slumped. No, he couldn't afford to be picky. He looked like he'd have to invest in another stud. Without extra cash, that could break him. How much? Nearly double what you paid for that stallion in there. Jake nodded toward the barn where his valuable stallion now lazed about in a stall. Colt wondered yet again who was after the destruction of the Bar Six. Or maybe it was only his slice of it. Had specializing in horse training and studying been a bad idea, making the Bar Six a target somehow? You with me, Letty? Colt shook off his dark thoughts. She'd pay that much? Colt's brows flattened against his eyes in a serious look. When a joke about money. Colt watched the filly fly past them again. How will I do it, Jake? I had you come by today for advice. But to train her for barrel racing? Colt shook his head and ran a hand over his nape. Don't tell my dad and brothers this, but I don't know what I'm doing. Jake chuckled, not to mock him, more to commiserate. <laughs> I'm here today. We'll give you a good start and some tips. You have a lot more experience than you think. Have faith, laddie. You can do it, eh? I... I'll sure give it a try. Betsy eyed the Cooper Bar Six Ranch sign hanging between two tall poles, then scowled at it. Yep, this was it. Turn in here, Jimmy. Her last telephone call to Jay Cooper from their motel room in Denver had been disheartening. She'd planned on the famous horse trainer helping her pick a horse and training it. Instead, he had pointed her in the direction of the Cooper Bar Six Ranch and his cousin, Colt. Having come all this way, she'd expected the best. She didn't have time for half measures. If this other Cooper didn't know his stuff, she would track down Jake and personally demand his attention. They'd been on the road for two days, and her Irish temper had been on a slow boil for the last seven hours. She was tired, worried, and in no mood for some shoddy cowboy who believed he could train a horse. She could have found that back in Amarillo. It was Texas, after all. She decided to share her irritation with Jimmy. He'd been such a great sport, 
willing to drive this last leg of the trip. Coopers have a reputation as big Wyoming cattle ranchers. But what are the chances this cousin colt can train a horse to barrel race as well as Jay Cooper? Jimmy snorted, his eyes peeled to the road ahead. <laughs> Not much, I'm afraid. Jake only got his reputation in the last year as is. That was after years and years of horse training, I hear. The telephone truck dipped into a deep pothole, bouncing on its stiff springs while Jimmy trounced on the brake and clutch. Betsy slapped one hand on the ceiling and the other on the dashboard. They both cursed simultaneously. He slowed and took more time to wrestle out the hole. Crap! This is just great! Ranchers who can't fill their darn potholes? And they're going to train a champion in time for nationals? What had she gotten herself into? Best wait and see. Don't let that temper of yours go flying out of control, neither. What do you mean? I've got total control of my temper. Always have. Always haven't, you mean? Jimmy darted a glance Betsy's direction. His deep brown eyes seemed to knife right through her. He is a good friend, she reminded herself, always looking out for me. She averted her gaze to the fields where red Herefords and black Angus nibbled at the countryside under a dark layer of high clouds. Promise me, Jimmy said. Betsy whipped her head back in his direction and glowered. I know you watch out for me, Jimmy, but you're stepping way over the line here, my friend. How so? That was a good question. Weren't friends supposed to be willing to tell you the truth, no matter how painful? I'm half Irish, Jimmy, she argued. Red hair, green eyes, and hot temper are in my genes. It doesn't mean you have to act on it. Get you in trouble more often than not, she sighed. I, I promise to try. Try harder. Betsy's temper shouldn't be simmering at Jimmy. He was right. She had a problem with it. She would have to bite her upper lip to keep the temper in line. So, a raw lip it would be. Jimmy bounced along over the last few yards of the poorly maintained road. My word! If they were so successful here on Cooper Ranch, why can't they fix their dang road? No judgments, Miss Murphy. Maybe they had a rough year. Something you can recently relate to. Why was Jimmy always right? He was good for her, though. A calming presence. Sometimes she thought he'd be ideal for her as a husband when the time came that she might consider having one. But no, she'd run right over the poor man. There wasn't a feminine or romantic bone in her body. Her father had seen to that. Here we are, Jimmy said with a grin. Let's go get you a horse. He jumped out of the old telephone truck and ran around to greet her as she jumped down from the other side. He stuffed his hands in his pockets. Should we go to the house or the barn? House first. More polite, Betsy said, feeling a sudden shiver of apprehension. She hated meeting people. If she could have only horses and a few friends, she'd be good. Betsy stood at the door and rapped and waited, but not patiently. Prickles of sweat popped out on her forehead and her palms in spite of the overcast sky. Running her hands down her jeans, she jumped when the door swung open. A young lady with long chestnut-colored hair took one look at her and smiled. Her smile seemed to take up her whole face and was so infectious, Betsy found herself answering it back. "'You must be Betsy Murphy, the barrel racer. Would you like to come in for a, a lemonade and a bathroom break?' or are you anxious to meet Colt? Betsy's brows shot up, her chin dropped. Another woman who was direct. How refreshing. Thank you, but we stopped in town. I am anxious to check out the horse Jake mentioned. Is Jake Cooper here? The woman stepped out on the porch with them. No, I'm sorry. Jake said you'd be meeting with Colt. I can take you to him. Betsy nodded, then thought to smile. That would be good. I'm Rebecca Cooper, by the way. She thrust out a hand as they walked. Betsy took it and was surprised it was a good solid shake. A man's handshake. She liked this Rebecca already and wondered if she was a sister or Colt's wife. 
This is Jimmy Schultz. She gestured to Jimmy on her other side. He reached around Betsy to give Rebecca a hearty handshake as well. Nice to meet you, ma'am, Jimmy said, always so polite. Rebecca smiled in return. Colt is at the main barn. He has a horse he thinks you might be interested in. She's a beauty. A deep foreboding came over Betsy. She didn't know what it was, but she always listened to her instinct. Was it the horse? The trainer? The coopers in general? The three stepped into the barn. Betsy inhaled deeply. This was a well-cared-for barn. The wholesome smells of clean hay, leather, and horse tickled her nose with pleasure. Her trepidations clicked down a notch. But the moment the figure of a man came out from one of the stalls, Betsy knew why the foreboding had come. The large man strode toward them, all loose-hipped confidence. As male images went, this one was near perfection. Funny, she didn't usually care about that. She was surrounded by handsome ruggedness during rodeo season. But this man, this man wore his masculinity like most men wore their weakness. She tried to avert her gaze, but couldn't. Her eyes stayed glued to him. Clad in work-worn blue jeans, a light blue work shirt with sleeves haphazardly pushed up, dark cowboy hat and beat-up boots, so worn and broken with muck, she wondered at their original color. Dark hair peeked out from under his hat, and the shadow on his face spoke of a forgotten shave. Deep blue eyes, sharp and intense, glittered with mystery. She'd never been so taken by a first impression in her life, not ever. And then he smiled. Gut kicked. That's how she felt. Her knees wobbled before she could force them back to a locked position. Never had she wished more than she'd worn something other than her belted jeans, wrinkled blouse, and tattered vest. Would he notice if she reached up to slip the band off her thick ponytail? Hello, you must be Miss Murphy. He stuck his hand out to shake hers. She dropped her gaze to his large, ranch-battered hand. What was wrong with her? Other than taller, he was no different than the other men she'd lived and worked around. Her hand met his without her telling it to do so. The air around them practically singed her hair as she held his warm, calloused palm against her own. They shook. Then she dared raise her eyes back up to his. Their gazes locked tight. His eyes were so penetrating that she got the sense he dove clear inside her brain and read her scrambling thoughts, deciphered her every motivation. She'd never experienced such a sensation. A deep crevice drew his dark brows even closer together, and his smile fell off. You are Elizabeth Murphy, correct? Oh, gosh. She'd been gaping while her mind had taken a hiatus. Yes, yes, of course. I'm Elizabeth Murphy, uh, uh, Betsy, she said, thankful her voice worked. Okay, enough of this. No man had caught her eye before, and she certainly wouldn't allow it to happen now. Winning at nationals was her only goal. Colt's eyebrows rose as if he'd just read her mind. He dropped her hand and gestured toward the open barn door. Let's take a look at the filly I have in mind for you. Before he made a move, he sucked in a quick breath and stuck out his hand a second time. Betsy instantly took it as if anchoring herself to this man would save her life. Forgive my manners. Name's Colt Cooper. Colt released her. Jimmy mimicked the gesture and grasped Colt's hand. Jimmy Schultz, I'm with Betsy. Frowning, she studied Jimmy, wondering at his implication. Colt's brows dipped in confusion, too, at Jimmy's emphasis on with. But then Colt was back to smiles. Good to meet you, Jimmy. You too, Jimmy said. A filly? Betsy asked. How old is she? She needed a young mare or gelding, surely not a filly. Sorry, 
I've been calling her that because, well, you'll see why. She's actually over four. Not a filly anymore. Four. That would work. Good. As Colt led her outside to the corral, Betsy hung back a little. When she realized she'd done that to scrutinize the rest of the man as he walked away, she chided herself. Stop complicating this. All I need is a horse, not a man. Chapter 3 Colt's first thoughts upon meeting Miss Elizabeth Murphy were purely carnal. She was a fiery redhead with flashing pine-colored eyes and a shapely nose turned up slightly at the end. Freckles sprinkled all the surfaces he could see, making him wonder about parts he couldn't see. She had a self-assured yet lively gait. Short, curvy, sure, but all lean muscle built for work. On second look, when he'd stared into her eyes while they shook hands and a frisson of energy buzzed around them, he recognized his own keen attraction to her. But on third notice, he caught the fascination in her eyes toward him, and it incinerated anything he'd felt up to that point. Not another one. Colt didn't fancy himself a conceited man. He had no right to be. But the looks God had given him had caused nothing but trouble with the ladies. Each one he'd allowed remotely close to him had turned out to be a clingy, uninvited nuisance at the ranch. Thankfully, once at the corral, with the mare racing around it, Betsy's attention left him as she watched in fascination. His mind drifted back to last year, when he'd finally relented and dated a girl he'd known from his high school days, Jenny Renford, partly to eliminate the string of women lined up for their turn and partly to satisfy his curiosity over her reserve, believing he'd finally found someone who wasn't clamoring for his constant attention made life more doable. He'd been dead wrong. Colt gave a side glance at the redhead watching the other red-coated female in the corral. What a match they'd make. But if this Betsy Murphy wanted the mare, she'd be around the bar six, and him, for weeks. That was risky. Darn near as risky as when he'd allowed Jenny to tag along during last summer's roundup of strays. Alone, under the stars, she'd slipped into his bedroll each night that week. He hadn't regretted it then. No. He was no saint. But after that pregnancy scare, he couldn't believe how foolish he'd been, playing around with a woman he didn't love. He ended things with Jenny and left himself emotionally bankrupt when he saw that doing the right thing broke her heart anyway. He would never make that mistake again. He glanced at Betsy, her wide green eyes glued to the mare. Dread seeped in. Betsy was a client. That was it. Working himself to the bone every day with Trevor was the only way forward. Mr. Cooper? Betsy's voice cut into his musings. Colt glanced over his shoulder, looking for his dad. Nope. He turned back to Betsy. She was gazing at him in confusion. Are you with us? She said, then laughed. The deep, throaty sound washed over him and tore at his new resolve. He gritted his teeth and nodded toward the frisky mare dominating the corral. Her name is Nutmeg. We call her Meg for short. Jimmy strode up, and the three of them watched for a few measured minutes as the horse raced about. Cole glanced at his prospective client to see her reaction to the beauty in the ring and got caught up in her natural beauty again. The sunlight shone on Betsy's thick red ponytail. Gad, they were a match, these two ladies. He couldn't wait to see her astride the sorrel mare and watch her red hair streaming in the wind. She runs like a dream, Betsy mumbled. Colt knew she hadn't meant to say that aloud, and she surely hadn't expected him to catch it. He didn't know this woman, but he would bet that mare in the corral that Betsy was a fierce negotiator. Probably a tough cookie all around. Rodeo was a man's world. She had to be hardy to break through and survive, let alone thrive. And she had excelled as one of the top barrel racers in the nation. That said a lot of her gumption, abilities, and stick to She's not trained yet. 
hard to sit even, but we can work her together. Betsy's gaze left the mare for him. She shook her head. No, thanks. Since Jake's not available, I can handle it. This is Wyoming. I'm from Texas. We know our horses. Colt's jaw went slack. Wyoming? She'd said it as if it was a third world country. Texas, like it was the only state where old glory could fly. And she thought to do the training herself? Sorry, Miss Murphy. That's not how we work around here. He winced at how curt that sounded, but may as well tell her how the cow ate the cabbage right up front. She twisted more to face him and planted her fists on top of a set of rounded hips. How much do you want for her? Colt felt his ire rise. Now hold on a minute. I'm giving you a look-see is all. She's not trained yet. Won't leave here until she is. Listen here, you big... Jimmy stopped her words with a jarring hand on her shoulder. He stepped past her. What red here means is she's interested in that mare. He nodded his head in the mare's direction, though his gaze never left Colt's. If it's all right with you, we'd like to stick around and check her out. Jimmy grinned then. Though not much taller than Miss Murphy, he was a nice-looking fellow. Colt wondered what they were to each other not that it mattered. Fine, was all Colt let slip through his lips. If he said much more, he knew the words would be unkind. Blast! He couldn't remember the last time he'd felt fury build in him, especially toward a woman. Sure, he and his brothers got into scrapes, but true anger never sparked them. He couldn't allow it, because when that day came, he might not be able to control the explosion just waiting to break out of his hardened skin. What was it about this spitfire that lit the fuse to an untapped inner rage? Her glare would have seared any man's corneas, much less his ego, but apparently not Jimmy's. That work for you, Red? He smiled even bigger at her. Guess he knows what he's doing, Colt thought, cringing. Sure enough, her shoulders slumped and her face relaxed. Hmm, Colt would have to remember a mega smile worked best when she bristled like that. She sighed and turned back to him. Jake thought you'd have a place to put us up for a few days until we decided on the horse. I'd like to talk with him. Is that possible? The talking with Jake or the place to stay? A snide look formed a wrinkle between her brows. Both. She stretched out the words so the unsaid stupid rang out anyway. Colt rolled his jaw forward, then bit the corner of his mouth so he wouldn't shout something rude back. He pasted on a hard smile and let his drawl thicken. Shoot, you're welcome to pitch a tent under that oak over yonder, ma'am. He tipped his hat toward the pasture. It'll be a good shelter. You can use the pond for bathing, and those pines over there as a necessary. She stiffened. Anis, is this a joke? Well, this here is the backwoods country of Wyoming, ma'am, you know? Colt laced his draw with even more country twang. I hope you brung with you a few more blankets, cause we kinda run short with all those cow patty slingers we got living in the back of the barn. The surprised look on her face blasted the anger right out of him. He didn't usually badger women. What was it about this woman that set him afire? Was it as simple as she hadn't fallen at his feet? Could he be that shallow? Jimmy started laughing nervously. He's joshing you, Red, he said, then turned to Colt. Aren't you? Those snapping green eyes flayed first Jimmy and then Colt. He didn't know her at all yet. But just by what he'd observed so far, he should have guessed what was coming. Mr. Cooper, do you always treat your clients with such disdain? Colt recoiled at the sting in her words. Embarrassment came first, then anger at himself, as his face filled with heat. She was right. He'd fancied himself amiable with everyone, certainly clients. But somehow this spunky gal had massacred his country boy manner in a few minutes flat. He dipped his head. 
We have a place you can stay, and I'll set up a meeting with Jake. Come, I'll show you your quarters. He turned away quickly to break free from her blistering eyes and his inexplicable attraction to her. Maybe then he'd think more clearly and smarter things would come out of his mouth. Long ago, the Cooper man had set up a small surgery center in the back of the second barn. More of a shed, really. It housed the old fire engine that they'd bought from the town. After last year's mishap with Dash, Trevor's dog, and the overnight stay by the local veterinarian, they'd added an apartment to the shed. Now, anyone who wished to stay on the Cooper spread, who wasn't a good friend or family member, was put up there. Colt slid open the door to the little barn and led them inside. Miss Murphy looked around the place, her eyes widening at what she saw. Is that a fire truck? Colt sighed with relief that she seemed to have let their dispute lie. Yeah, used to belong to the town of Sundance. Dad bought it a while back. Smart, she said with awe on her face. It has been. Hay is one of our commodities, so fires happen. Champion comes in handy. Champion? she said with a smirk. We're nicknamers around here. He smiled back at her. It's faster than saying, go get the fire engine out of the shed. This way we just holler, Champion! and everyone knows what to do. When she sputtered and threw her head back in that raspy laugh for the second time, Colt found himself caught up in a whirlwind of pleasure. The realization hit that he'd tried for that laugh again, and would attempt to coax it out each day she was here. It certainly beat the sound of her anger. Follow me, Colt said once he got his mind and body back under his command, then trekked toward the apartment. He opened the door and let it swing in. There's two bedrooms, a living room, and a bathroom with a shower. He looked the redhead in the eyes and grinned. No necessary outside. She grunted and pushed past him to enter the living space. Once she checked over each room, she turned back. This'll do. Thank you, Jimmy said, elbowing the spitfire. Miss Murphy. If we're going to work together, she interrupted, you need to call me Elizabeth or Betsy. How about spitfire? Miss Murphy fixed that green glare on him. How about Betsy? That's what my fans call me. Well, if it were possible to hang icicles on words, Betsy had accomplished it. Jimmy frowned, grabbed her by the elbow, and escorted her out of the apartment, past Champion, and on outside. Colt followed close behind, but stopped short of the doors when he realized Jimmy was having a talk with his companion outside. What are you trying to do, Red? I know you. You want that mare just by the look of her. She belongs to Mr. Colt Cooper right now. Do you think he's going to sell her to you if you keep flapping your Irish roots in his face? Silence. Why don't you go on over there and watch her? Check out her angles, her adaptability. See if she's smart enough, has heart. We already know she has stamina. Look at her. She's still running. The other stuff will take time, but you need to get started. Go on now. Colt peeked around the corner and saw the woman square her shoulders. But in the end, she sank her teeth into that full upper lip of hers, then nodded and turned towards the crowd. Colt came out of the door and slid it closed behind him. Jimmy turned and smiled, though Colt saw the tension riding the man's mouth. I can't believe that mare is still flying around the corral. What'd you give her, loco weed? Colt froze a chill seizing him at the very real possibility. It hadn't been that long ago someone had laced his stallion's feed with the poisonous weed. He gritted his teeth and thought through what he recalled of the mare's behavior. When the stallion was dosed, he'd been crazy wild. This mare only seemed to love running, weaving circles and figure eights. No, he didn't think local weed was fueling her activities, though he'd be sure to consult Jake on the matter. Trying to put the dark thoughts behind him, Colt gestured to Jimmy. Let's join Miss Murphy. Give you a chance to watch another lively female. Colt chuckled. Jimmy chuckled, too. <laughs> Listen, just call her Betsy. She hates being called Miss Murphy. 
Most people know her as Betsy. Elizabeth was too formal. Betsy and even Beth were too close to the Cooper patriarch's own Becca for his pea brain. How about Lizzie? Jimmy pulled his teeth back into a grimace. Um, you could try. Don't recall if anyone ever called her that. Perfect. If you say so, man, good luck. As the both of them strolled over to the corral, Colt had to ask, So is Lizzie hard to get along with? Jimmy slowed his pace. Colt matched it until Jimmy stopped altogether and faced him, still out of hearing range of the redhead. Here's the thing you ought to know. Red has had a hard go of it. Her ma skipped out on her and her dad when she was a youngster. Her dad raised her. By nature, he's a harsh man. But when his wife left, he got bitter. Real bitter. He takes it out on Red. Hates all women now. So he treats Betsy like a son. In his defense, I think he done it to keep from hating her. Gotta give him credit for that, anyways. Is that why she entered the rodeo world? Competing with the men cause she needs to act like one? Jimmy nodded. Well, at first. I found she was pretty good at it, though. She loves it now. She's making her way in a man's arena and wipes out all the other girls on her way up. A win-win. Jimmy grinned then. Kind of put a cork in her old man's mouth, you know? It was grand. Colt wondered again who exactly Jimmy was to Betsy. Lizzie. It sure appeared he took care of her. Colt's protectiveness flared for a moment before he could rein it in. Truth was, he didn't need another woman trailing him. Maybe he would treat her like a man as her father did. The thought churned his gut. But it had some possibilities. The way he looked at it, he had two choices. Either think of her as a man, or agonize over his attraction to her. The latter would take too much work. So, the former it is. Chapter 4 Betsy was mesmerized by the mare in the corral. She'd never seen a more graceful, enthusiastic animal. What marvels they would be as a team. Out of the corner of her eye, she saw Mr. Cooper striding toward her. Her heart made a wee leap. When he reached the corral fence, he slung his elbows onto the top rung, then propped his chin on a fist. Her one glance at him presented her with his striking profile, as well as the muscles pressed against his shirt sleeves. She swallowed and refocused on the mare. She's something, isn't she, Lizzie? Betsy glanced over her right shoulder, then her left. Who's Lizzie? I don't see anyone else. You're Lizzie. She shook her head back and forth. Oh, no, I'm not. I already told you the name you can use, Mr. Cooper. His gaze never left the mare. Colt to you. I don't choose that name. Well, I won't answer to Lizzie. Colt huffed, then turned to her, still resting an elbow on the fence. Fine. What's your middle name? Riley, Jimmy piped in, then immediately appeared sheepish. Riley? Different, Colt said. Betsy elbowed Jimmy hard in the stomach, just as she caught him signaling Colt to stop talking. Colt nodded back to Jimmy. Now what was Jimmy doing, and why had he given away her long-hated middle name anyway? Feeling compelled to explain, she said, My ma didn't allow Da to give me my first name, so he let him choose the second. It means Irish Meadow. Now why had she said all that? She hated the name because her Da had given it to her, and it meant nothing to him. Less and less as the years went on, he may as well have given her the man's name, Alroy, meaning red. For as much feeling as he had for her, Alroy would have at least described her. Cole didn't move for a moment, looked a bit shell-shocked. Riley it is, he finally said. She scowled at him but didn't correct him. What would be the point? He was just another man showing his dominance over the weaker sex. She'd buy the horse, let Colt train the mare as much as his ego needed before he let them go, 
and then she'd never see the men again. Goodbye, good riddance. Still, she couldn't let it go without giving something back. What would embarrass a man like Colt Cooper? She tapped her index finger to her lips. Hmm, she had a pretty good idea. Though he was one of the best-looking cowboys she'd ever seen, he didn't seem vain. She guessed he probably didn't like attention drawn to himself. So she'd just draw a little, the kind of attention she sensed he'd hate. She was almost giddy at the thought. Okay, blue eyes, call me what you want. Colt snapped his head toward her. Jimmy tapped her arm to catch her notice, waved, and slinked off for the barn. Usually he stayed to watch over her when she took on someone, but this time it had been his fault. Coward. Those long brows of Colt's knit together in the center as they flattened close to those blue eyes of his. No doubt about it, the man was magnificent. Shoot. At least her comment had the intended effect. She waited for the comeback, watched as his mouth opened and closed like a landed fish while his mind whirled with what to say. She almost giggled. It was too good. If he was going to address her by her despised middle name, he'd have to put up with some teasing of his own. She was going to shoot Jimmy as soon as she got the chance. The big man yanked his hat off his head in frustration, ran his fingers through a mop of black hair, and then shoved it back on. Good, she thought. She'd gotten to him. She prided herself on how she could push people's buttons. It was one of her many tools of psychological warfare, in the ranch business and the arena. With one last flare of his nostrils on a deep breath, Colt seemed to relax a mite. He shook his head and said, as calmly as he could, What would you like to do first? That surprised her. She was sure Colt didn't usually work that way. It was a good sign she'd planted her first barb good and deep. Being in control was a must for her. I'd like to get in there with her, get to know her. Colt edged in front of her, sat those startling eyes on her, and delved deep. She tried to look away, but couldn't quite bring herself to it. She fidgeted. What did he think he saw in there? Or was he just trying to intimidate her, make her tell him her secrets? It took all her might to close her eyes to his gaze, but she finally succeeded. Gad, how had he mastered such an ability? Sounds like a plan, he finally said, then took her by the shoulders and turned her toward a gate in the corral. Her eyes popped back open to his touch, warm and welcoming and unnerving all at the same time, another reason she would be staying far from him. Just as Colt reached for the rope looped over the post of the gate, the mare charged toward them and skidded to a stop for the first time since she and Jimmy had arrived. Nutmeg's nostrils flared, her eyes flashed with excitement. Betsy wasn't sure she'd ever seen such a larger-than-life personality. Cold eyed the mare and promptly replaced the rope. Let's go back to the house. What? We'll give Jake a call, and I'll introduce you to my dad. I think I saw him head to the house a while ago. You... wait. Why? I want to go into the corral. Now. She almost stomped her foot but thought better of it. Rain in your temper, Red, she heard Jimmy's voice in her head. Come on, was all the man said before he took her by the hand and pulled her toward the main house. Jimmy appeared from the barn and fell in behind them as they went. Colt's big hand swallowed hers, and his dry, roughened palm scratched as he tugged her along. She wasn't used to men touching her. They sure fire never held her hand. As much as she wanted to protest, she decided to bide her time and scamper meekly along. The idea was downright comical, but until that horse was hers, she'd do whatever it took. Colt let them in the back door, then released his hold. She pulled her arms stiff to her side as she looked around the mudroom. This room clearly doubled as a laundry room. Men's shirts hung across a bar above the Maytag washer and dryer. My, but these coopers seemed to be on the cutting edge. At home she was still hanging clothes on the clothesline outside, and when the weather was unpredictable, on the collapsible wooden drying rack inside. 
The bootjack sat by the door where Colt removed his boots. She and Jimmy followed his lead. "'Come on in,' Colt said, bringing her gaze back to him. He turned and entered another doorway with a bright glow of light streaming through it. As she followed, the room opened up into a sunny and modern kitchen. She wondered offhandedly if these Cooper bachelors had a cook, or if the only woman who seemed to reside there had that unfavorable job. Thinking of Rebecca seemed to call her up. There she was, entering from the other room, greeting them with a broad smile as they converged at the room's center. "'Welcome. I have some sweet tea or coffee and some snacks.' Betsy guessed this woman saw very few of her own gender on this ranch. Mayhap figured we should stick together, she mused. Well, little did the woman of the Cooper household know that Betsy had always been considered one of the guys, even to the point her unusual bathroom was the great outdoors. She chuckled to herself. It would probably shock someone with feminine sensibilities. No doubt Rebecca was like all the other women she'd known, would never think of lowering her drawers to squat in the woods. Ha! <laughs> Two boots clunked to the floor in the mudroom. They all turned in unison to the towering figure that entered the kitchen from the back room. This man was huge and handsome and rugged as all get-out. Another Cooper male. She wondered if any Cooper had physical flaws— even though half the ranch's mud and dirt seemed to ride on him, he was still a pleasing sight. Rebecca scowled. Go right back out to the mudroom, Trevor Cooper. It's called a mudroom for a reason. She jabbed her finger toward the room he'd just exited. Trevor. Betsy had heard he was the backbone of this ranch. The workhorse brother. The one with no personal life since he ran the show around here... Three hundred sixty-five days a year. He grunted, turned on his stocking feet, and did as Rebecca commanded. Wow, that was impressive. But when Betsy turned back to Rebecca, she saw the reason he'd obeyed so quickly. A gentleman, equally as attractive and commanding as the two she'd already met, an older brother possibly, stood behind Rebecca with a stony expression fixed to Trevor's retreating back. By the startled look on Rebecca's face, she was shocked Trevor had obeyed her so easily. Then Betsy noticed how close this new man was standing to Rebecca's back. Couldn't be her husband, could he? He looked too young to have fathered these grown sons. But when he dropped his head to plant a kiss into the curve of Rebecca's neck, she had her answer, and with a squeal and a laugh, so did Rebecca. So that's why Trevor scuttled out of here so quickly. She continued to laugh as she turned and came up on tiptoes to give her husband a quick kiss on the mouth. The man's eyes twinkled for a moment at his young wife. Then he came forward with an outstretched hand to Jimmy. Hello, folks. I'm Cord Cooper. Welcome to our home. As they shook hands, Jimmy made the introductions. Pleased to meet you both. Cord said as he released Betsy's firm handshake. Cordial bunch, these Coopers. Usually, she didn't waste time getting to know people. This time, she was kind of stuck. She glanced around the room for Colt, hoping to get back to the sorrel mare. But Colt was missing. Could she figure a way to wander the house to look for him? She sidled up next to Rebecca. I would like to use the bathroom now, if you don't mind. Rebecca smiled. Of course. I'll show you where it is. They entered a spacious living room with a definite masculine flair, then on down a hallway. Still no cold. Here it is. Washcloths and towels are under the sink. Help yourself. Rebecca was hard not to like. Friendly, gracious, a wonderful hostess, something Betsy would never be. A small pang hit her chest. Was that envy? Regret? Goodness, she couldn't remember ever valuing a real woman's strength. Thank you. Appreciate it. Once she finished her deed and cleaned up as best she could from her hours of travel, she laid the wet washcloth and hand towel next to the sink and moseyed out of the bathroom, again hoping to run into Colt. Taking her time, she glanced into bedrooms along the hall. 
Each was clean and cheerful. It appeared Rebecca was also a good housekeeper. One more strike against herself. She did do the housework at home, but the house barely got a lick and a promise. A low, gruff voice reached her ears from the room to her immediate right. She peeked in and saw it was an office. Big mahogany desk, leather, chairs, dark wood, bookcases from floor to ceiling loaded with books. So not what she expected from a houseful of mostly bachelors. Colt paced back and forth in front of the desk, stretching the telephone cord as far as it would go, yanking the telephone across the flat surface each time he turned. I don't know, Jake, but she reminds me of how the stallion was acting. A pause. No, not the same. Another pause. No, I'd say more like excited eyes, not wild. She shouldn't be eavesdropping, but she was sure Colt and the elusive Jake were talking about her horse. Why was Colt worried? Yep, one time, Colt answered whatever question Jake had asked. Came skidding right up to us. That's the first time she'd stopped to I uh, Miss Murphy. Silence. Yeah, the same way I did the moment I laid eyes on her. He chuckled and continued listening to Jake. Yeah, only a bit besotted. Cold besotted? With her? Or was he talking about his initial reaction to the mayor? Probably the mayor. Of course, the mayor. Still, for some reason, a light sneeze could have bowled her over right there. Why was she giddy, thinking Colt might be talking about her? Since when had a man's notice pleased her? It usually made her fighting mad, or she ignored it altogether. Tell her. Sure. Shoot. Her mind was in the clouds. she just missed part of their conversation. What are you doing? Jimmy's objection came from the hallway ahead. She jumped a mile, flattening a hand to her chest. Jimmy, don't do that to me, she staged whispered. See you in a few, came Colt's voice, then a distinct rattle of the receiver hitting the cradle. Don't do what? Stop you from eavesdropping, Jimmy said, not so quietly. Shh, hush up. For crying out loud, Jimmy. Colt strode toward them, stopping at the doorframe. He filled the space. She realized then that most of the men she knew were shorter, smaller, Jimmy's size. All the better to keep their seat on a bucking bronc, wild-eyed bull, or roping horse mid-skid. Uh, can I do something for you two? Colt's lips did that twitchy thing, and those deep blue eyes of his twinkled. Aha! Amusement, that's what his lips had been doing. Trying to smile, or trying not to. Uh, yes, well, no, I mean, I was looking for you. Can we go back out to Nutmeg? Did that sound congenial enough? Glancing at Jimmy, she looked for his approval. He rolled his eyes. Okay, maybe it was a little too meek. She wanted to demand to see the mare. Let's get a bite to eat first, Colt said. Her mouth dropped open. Eat? Now see here. Jimmy's nudge nearly knocked her sideways. Sounds great. I'm starved, Jimmy said. She sputtered through her next words, or at least she thought she'd said them. Apparently not by the look on both men's faces. Her temper was up, and she was about to make her words crystal clear. Jimmy took hold of her elbow and hurried her down the hall toward the kitchen. She heard Colt's footfalls behind them. Darn Jimmy's voice for reason. If she just told Colt what she wanted, she was sure he'd see her logic. She needed to get to know the mare, start training her, and then be on her way, in one short month, to win nationals. Time was of the essence. Time was money. Time was a resource. Time was wasting. Couldn't these two bullheaded men see that? There you are, Rebecca said. Then, seeing the look on Betsy's face, she said, Everything all right? Fine as frog's hair, Jimmy said, with too broad a grin. 
My, weren't they both full of clichés today. Sit down and have a bite. I'm sure you're anxious to have at that mare out there, Rebecca said with a gesture toward the south barn and corral. At least someone understood. Thank you, Betsy said, hoping Rebecca caught her expression and double meaning. Rebecca pushed at Colt's shoulder, who was talking to Jimmy by the sink. Stop John and sit down. Can't you see Betsy's in a hurry? Rebecca winked at her, and she smiled back. I am waiting on Jake, or we'd be out there right now, Colt said matter-of-factly. Why in the world hadn't he just said that to her? Betsy sat and dug into the half-sandwich before her. Across the table, Trevor had already wolfed down most of his sandwich in a few big bites. For pity's sake, Trevor, Rebecca said, we haven't offered grace yet. Stop eating. Sheepishly, Betsy sat her sandwich back down, hoping no one had noticed her rudeness. She didn't have a patient bone in her body, and most times it made her embarrass herself, like now. She thought to apologize, but in one glance noticed no one had paid attention to her. Figured, this time she was grateful. Trevor looked straight into Rebecca's eyes as he jammed the last of his sandwich into his mouth, rose while he chewed, then grabbed his coffee cup to swig down the remainder of the contents. Done. See you at supper, he said around the ball of food in his mouth. And then he was gone, out to the mudroom. The stomping of one boot, then the other, trailed to her ears. The back door banged open and slammed shut. She thought she was impatient. Colt surprised her by sitting down next to her and bowing his head. Lord, thank you for this food, for the hands that prepared it, for your saving grace. Amen. That was short and sweet, not too painful. Though Betsy never understood why people needed to believe in something or someone bigger than themselves. It was okay with her if they did, but she didn't need such a crutch. Life was too short to waste at worshipping an invisible nothing. Colt held the plate of sandwiches for her to take another half. She shook her head. Thanks, no. You don't like tuna? It's not that. I have to keep slim while I'm competing. Easier on the horse. Colt leaned back in his chair, giving her a glimpse of the muscles stretching his shirt. She gulped and flushed. Colt's gaze slid up and down what he could see of her. You're plenty slim. I'm sure any horse barely feels you as it is. A few extra pounds wouldn't hurt. He'd probably look better. Look better? Fuming, Betsy halted words that would have cut straight into his condescending quick. As she sat there panting with fury and biting a hole in her tongue, she wondered why in the world she cared. But still, on impulse, she ripped too big a chunk off another sandwich and stuffed it in her mouth. Her eyes watered, but she managed to chew, then swallow it in a painful lump. Colt watched with an upticked eyebrow, right up until the moment she winced. Then he flew forward and grabbed her coffee, thrusting it into her hand. She took a gulp, and the chunk of sandwich softened a bit more as it found its way to her stomach. Resting a hand lightly on her shoulder, he peered into her eyes and soothed in a low voice. Easy now. No wonder the man was good with horses. She hiccuped, then burped, then burped again. Excuse me. The heat of her predictable redhead's flesh scaled her neck and ended in her cheeks. What was she doing? Sitting, eating, flirting or more like fighting, with a man and for what? Time to get a move on, or nationals would slip right through her fingers. Chapter 5 Colt and Jake stood side by side at the corral gate, both with their forearms braced on the top slat, both watching the mare run circles, the fence line, and back to circles, anything to keep moving. It was highly unusual, and after Jimmy's comment about local weed, 
It had Colt worried his worst nightmare was about to repeat itself. That someone was trying to ruin Cooper Ranch hung over all their heads like a Wyoming thundercloud. Hey, I see your concern, Jake said, his eyes fastened to the mare. But it is nay local weed. I told you before, this one loves to show off. It is why I chose her for you. Breed her. Her foals will have keen personalities. Plenty of energy. Colt threw a side glance at Jake, then fixed his eyes back on the red whirlwind in the corral. You think so? Colt pulled off his hat and swiped his forearm across his sweaty face before stuffing it back in place. It was particularly humid today, or maybe it was only his worries. Gad, I hope you're right. I'll take a closer look. How will you know for sure? The mare dashed toward them on one of her circles, and Jake gestured toward her head. Her eyes, mainly. They are nay wild, just determined. He looked puzzled for a moment. Or mayhap excited. Like Trevor's dog when he sees his master coming. She likes people, you can? He thinks she's lazing about when people aren't here to see her? Colt shook his head not quite believing the possibility, though it would explain how she appeared to be continually running. It'd be easy enough to prove. Hole up in the barn. Watch her through a crack. Jake nudged Colt in the arm and grinned. Good grief, the man smiled a lot these days. It amazed Colt how different Jake was now compared to the brooding cousin he'd known his whole life. Sounds easy enough. Colt heard the door to the back of the house close, feeling the urgency to get all the information he could get out of Jake before Riley and Jimmy arrived. Colt nudged him. I have to be sure, Jake. I can't sell them a horse that could go loco, or worse, die. Let's go in now. Jake glanced behind them at their clients, then nodded. Colt unlatched the gate, and they both hustled through before re-securing it behind them. Colt hung back as Jake moved forward slowly. Words Colt couldn't decipher rumbled from Jake's throat, apparently as soothing to Nutmeg as they were to him. Jake was a few inches taller and much bulkier than Colt, so maybe it was his sheer size that calmed the horse. Meg had one last swing around the corral, sped straight up to Jake, and halted. Colt clenched his fist as if around a crop. Sweat snaked down his spine as he watched, powerless, Jake with only his body and Colt without even a rope. But no one was more intuitive than Jake when it came to horses. Be still. Learn. Right before his eyes, Meg astounded Colt. Whatever Jake said to her made her snort and bob her head up and down as if agreeing. Jake moved the back of his hand to just under her nostrils. Meg sniffed his hand, then bobbed her head again. Then Jake did something Colt had never seen him do. With only his palms, he started stroking Meg's muzzle, then ran both hands up the sides of her face and into her mane. Though the gesture was seemingly affectionate, Colt could tell by Jake's stance that it was all business. He was checking her eyes, testing her reactivity. With gentle strokes, he rubbed her up and down her face, then stepped to her left side and continued to run his hands over her neck, withers, back, hips, then patted her as he walked back to her head. Colt was astounded. Meg stood quietly, enjoying every pat and rub. After a few minutes of Jake rubbing her, she took the weight off her left front leg and leaned into Jake. Jake barked a laugh and gave her a shove off him. Affection. Sheer affection. What a relief. Jake grabbed a handful of her mane, turned and led her back to the gate where Colt stood. One glance over his shoulder and Colt saw the same look of wonder on both Riley's and Jimmy's faces. My God, Riley said. I know, Jimmy responded back. When Jake reached them, he grinned, released his hold on Meg and patted her neck. Meg here would like to confess. She has been showing off for the lot of you. Riley wasn't looking at Meg. Oh, no. She had her pretty little face slanted toward Jake with those sparkling green eyes wide with awe. 
"'You are everything your reputation paints you out to be,' she said. Colt bristled, a knot of jealousy forming in his stomach. Colt was supposed to be the one she saw as the horse expert around here. Then again, he'd asked for his cousin's help, and Jake was a genius with horses. What did he care if she thought Jake brilliant, or if she was giving him that doe-eyed look of awe right now? Still, no matter how hard he gritted his teeth or squirmed in his boots, he couldn't wholly eliminate the lump of juvenile jealousy sitting heavy in his gut. With his teeth clenched, he cursed in his head. He didn't even know the girl. Was he that used to women lining up for him? Was that it? Had he grown that self-absorbed? Colt cleared his throat. Riley looked him in the eye, one brow raised in question. Ah, uh, words. He needed some words. She's a beauty, ain't she? Well, that was back home and awkward. He lifted the loop of rope from the gatepost. Come on in. Get to know her, he said, happy to have sounded halfway intelligent that time. Riley's face lit with a smile, as pretty as they came. Standing this close to her, Colt felt a ridiculous desire to trace his fingertip across the bronze-colored freckles along the curve of her cheek, maybe offer the one at the corner of her lower lip a tiny nibble. "'Been out in the sun too long, cowboy?' Riley whispered to him as she darted past into the corral. "'Your neck looks a wee bit pink.' Cord pulled himself upright with a mental shake and reattached the loop. The minute she stepped foot on the soft dirt of the corral, her focus was all nutmeg. The mare seemed to be just as smitten. Riley crooned over Meg, like the horse was a lover rather than a gall-darned animal. Colt's skin prickled. What was wrong with him? He should be glad there was a woman on the ranch, besides Rebecca, who wasn't hounding him for a date. "'That's my girl,' Riley sing-songed. The horse nickered back, then raised her head to snuffle Riley's hair. Riley giggled. The sound was low, raspy, making its way under Colt's skin and past his safeguards. His thoughts swam through a fantasy of early morning light, a soft bed, and all that red hair spread over his pillow. "'You okay there, Letty?' Jake said with a pat on his shoulder. Colt jolted, snapping too. Fine, but the word sounded pinched. He cleared his throat and repeated the word. I just noticed how easily Riley soothed the mare. Riley? Jake said. Colt glared a warning at Jake. Jake stared back, seeing right through him. Riley's her middle name. Jake raised a brow, waiting for more. How do I explain? Truth was, at first he wanted to boycott Betsy just to razz her. But when he learned what the name Riley meant, Irish Meadow, all teasing had fled. He pictured a wild spring feeding acres of green, a riot of wildflowers flourishing where they hadn't been invited, free, unpredictable, hardy to a fault, and beautiful beyond compare. The name was perfect for the fresh, green-eyed Irish lass. But she was a client. Couldn't be anything more. Safer for him. Safer for her. Jay smirked at him knowingly, but then turned and strode to the gate. Susanna and Annabelle are waiting for me. You can handle it from here, eh? Colt sped after him, reaching him before he could slip out of the gate. Riley and Jimmy were busy with their new interest, so they didn't pay him any mind. "'Do you think Meg's a good fit for a barrel racer?' Colt said in a quiet tone. "'She is a show-off, plain and simple. The crowd will love her.' Jake slapped Colt on the shoulder again. "'Have fun,' Colt grimaced. "'What do you mean, have fun?' Jake grinned, all teeth. If one wee blonde could bring out a giddy side of a man who'd glowered his whole life, what could the woman do for Colt? I mean, have fun. With the training. With the lass. Jake ducked through the gate, leaving Colt to close it. Laughter rode the air around him, 
so loud it rivaled the wind of the brewing storm. Colt shook his head and smiled thoughtfully at Jake's retreat. "'I want to get started today,' came Riley's voice. Colt fingered the rope back over the gatepost, his mind circling the group at the center of the corral. An unusually animated show-off mare, a patient Jimmy, and a feisty redhead, all looking at him with hungry eyes. Colt looked to the horizon, at the deep reds and pinks coloring its rim, and then overhead, with its mix of black and white clouds swirling angrily. It's late. There's not much more we can do today and that storm may hit sooner than we thought. It's going to rain. Riley's face colored up. He was already getting used to that. It seemed to be a redhead thing. But when her nostrils flared on that pert nose, he guessed he'd have to explain the intensity of Wyoming's thunderstorms. Can we at least put a halter and lead rope on her? I'll walk her around a bit. Talk to her. Alone. Her tone grated. Something coiled deep in his spine. Anger. And his loaded spring inside wasn't just twisting tighter. It was electrified, sending odd tingles up and down his backbone. Seems to me we haven't discussed the deal yet. Colt never hit his clients with talk of money right off, but she was pushing some unfamiliar button. Her head whipped to him so fast he thought he heard her neck pop. Now? You want to talk money now? Colt winced. Yeah. He'd known that had been bad manners the minute it was out his mouth. But he wouldn't take it back now. Yeah, that's right. A word, little brother, came the deep voice Colt knew better than his own. Trevor stood on the other side of the gate, Dash sitting obediently at his feet. Colt nodded toward the dog. Something wrong with Dash? Trevor frowned in confusion, glanced down at the animal. No. Why? He's not barking. At the strangers. Trevor glanced down again. Dash was looking up at his master with a quizzical look in his deep brown eyes. That dog was much too smart. If Colt believed in reincarnation, He'd think their granddad had come back as a dog. Trevor shrugged, then leveled his gaze back on Colt. Come with me. Colt didn't hesitate. Never did when his older brother wanted something from him. I'll be right back, he said to Riley and Jimmy. Once they rounded the corner to the barn, Trevor turned. What do you think you're doing? Colt hated when Trevor called him on anything. He rarely reacted poorly to Trevor, but since Riley had awoken that smoldering spot under his backbone, well, what is your problem? Colt barked back. Trevor stiffened, rising to full height and puffing out like the giant he was. Though all the Cooper men were tall and broad, Jake and Trevor were most alike with their extra twenty pounds of muscle and brooding temperaments, at least before Jake got married. What's the idea of talking money before your guests get a chance to inspect that mare? Stay out of it, Trev. It's my business, Colt returned. Trev leaned in, nearly planting his nose against Colt's. Too much in his space. Still, Colt wasn't about to step back. It's Cooper business. Colt ripped off his hat and slammed his five fingers through his hair. Once he stuffed the hat back on his head, he huffed a sigh. It was time like these he felt so trapped. If he pushed too hard, it would only cause hardship for his brother, and ultimately the fallout would land on him. Yeah, I know it's Cooper business. I've got it covered. Looks to me you've got your head in the clouds, son. Colt fumed. I'm not your son. Trevor backed away and inhaled a deep breath, blowing it out slowly. He usually threw his weight around, and today was no different, but Trevor respected Colt enough to rarely push him when he stood his ground. This isn't like you. What's up? You've got enough to worry about. Colt spun on his heels and headed toward the barn door. I got it covered, big brother, he threw over his shoulder. 
At least Trevor didn't follow him to spout out more brotherly wisdom. Dang it. Colt would never have admitted it under threat of beating, but he knew Trev was right. His calm, low-key nature had fled for the hills the moment Elizabeth Riley Murphy had raised that feisty chin and pinned him with those pine-colored eyes. Or had she just brought out his true self, dormant as it had been for the past decade or two? Before exiting the barn, Colt ripped the halter and lead rope off a spike on the wall. Riley saw him coming with the halter in his hand, and a delightful smile lit her face. Gad, if their power went out this winter, he wouldn't need candles with Riley's smile cranked on. He mentally kicked himself. She wouldn't be staying once her new mare was trained. You have half an hour, he told her. Her eyes glimmered with excitement, while that little freckle at the corner of her mouth stretched with her big smile. A compulsion about that freckle began to take shape, but he swung around to Meg before it could. Thank you, she said. I'll just keep the halter with me when I'm done. I'll be out here again at first light. I'll be up. Colt pushed the halter up Meg's nose and situated her ears within the straps. He buckled it and handed the rope to Riley. Here you go. She beamed up at him, making his chest squeeze. As soon as she took the rope, all her attention swung to Nutmeg. Giving the mare a tug, she said, Come on, Meg. Let's just have us a little talk, shall we? Riley seemed right at home in the corral, her right hand in the mare's halter and the left holding the excess rope. The two strolled around the corral, their footsteps perfectly in sync. He couldn't wait for the moment the two redheads made their mark on the rodeo world. He swallowed numbly, fearing that one had already made her mark on him. Chapter 6 Betsy appreciated the coffee pot, coffee grounds, and cups left for Jimmy and her in the guest apartment. She stood over the percolator, waiting for its last burp so she could pour herself a cup of liquid sunshine. The gray light of dawn peeked through the window at the large sliding door, and Betsy could feel her excitement rise with the coming sun. Another plus? It hadn't rained last night. She'd found her horse, so fast that her hope of winning at Nationals was sliding back into place. Last night she'd walked that beautiful sorrel mare round and round the corral until it got dark, and Colt Cooper had insisted she stop. The percolator gushed one last time, then hissed into silence. Finally... She poured herself a cup, black, no frills, just how she liked it. Donning her denim jacket and wishing she hadn't left her riding gloves back in Texas, she slid open the door and shivered at the blustery morning. Brr! Winter was coming quickly to Wyoming, so different from the still warm temperatures of Amarillo. Wrapping her hands around the warmth of her cup, she wandered to the barn, noticing light slipping through a handful of boards here and there as she walked. Could it be Colt was really up this early? The large doors to the barn were still closed, but the small side door was open. Hello? She called into the shadows as she stepped inside. Her gaze caught on a large figure standing next to a tall horse at the open space in the middle. As she strode forward and her eyes adjusted, she saw the man was Trevor, "'Good morning,' she said, coming up to him. "'You're an early bird, aren't you?' Trevor sparred a quick glance at her, then cinched down one last strap of the saddle on his big bay gelding. He nodded. Not much of a talker. All doer, she guessed. And that was fine with her. She was, too. "'Would you mind if I get nutmeg out?' Trevor didn't look at her this time. "'Best wait for Colt.' "'Wait for—' Were these Cooper men all going to keep her from her goal? She didn't have time for this. Now wait just a minute. Interrupting her objection, Trevor turned with reins in hand and brushed past her, pulling his horse behind him. The stern expression he gave as he walked by said it all. Don't argue. I'm in charge. Funny. It worked to stun her to silence. Once he shoved the main barn door open, he and his horse were gone. 
She blinked and moved as if in a sudden thaw. Goodness, she was happy she didn't have to encounter that very often. She thought her da was hard-boiled, but this man? Oof. Morning, she heard a deep voice say outside, another cooper greeting the elder by the sound of it. Morning. She was surprised Trevor spoke back. Colt entered through the main aisle door. Morning, Riley. Colt came through the door with the corners of his mouth lifted only slightly, almost into a grimace. Not a morning person? Annoyed she was here before him? Top of the morning, Tia. Deciding not to give him a hard time about still using her middle name, she gave him a huge smile in hopes that would encourage him to get a move on. She had no time to waste. Colt's gaze landed on her mouth. He blinked a few times, then nodded before he ventured off toward the back of the barn. She's back here, he said, though he didn't have to. So far, he seemed to be a man who spoke few words, and they all seemed to state the obvious. Was he dim-witted? It would explain why their conversation had been a bit rough so far. She'd have to go easier on him if that were the case. To pay closer attention, so as not to crush his feelings with her obnoxious flair for spouting truths on high temper, or so Jimmy had warned her. Colt opened Meg's stall and rubbed her muzzle. The mare's lids slid to half-mast, and she raised her head a bit higher. Colt's chuckle rumbled deep in his chest, and right through Betsy, making her shiver. He glanced over his shoulder at her. Do you want to take her out? Well, duh, she wanted to say but instead held her tongue and nodded her head slowly, then spoke the same way. Yes, I would like that. Neither of them moved for a few tense moments. Colt turned more toward her, keeping his eyes glued to hers until a slight frown of confusion, or was it exasperation, creased the skin between those long, dark brows. Come on in and get her then, he said, sounding perturbed. Her feathers ruffled a bit. She thought she'd done very well speaking slow enough for Colt now that she suspected he must be simple-minded. It might explain why someone as handsome as him wasn't married. As she stepped past him, her shoulders brushed his chest, sending another tremor through her. My word, what was wrong with her? Mayhap Wyoming's weather was shaking up her nervous system. It couldn't be the man. When she came near Meg... The horse nickered softly, then stuffed her muzzle into Betsy's chest. Her next nicker tickled even as it left slobber running down her jacket. She giggled and brushed at her coat. Goodness, she had a cat back home who did that very thing when she petted him. But a horse? <laughs> she likes you, Colt said with a chuckle. Another obvious statement. Yep, she was right about Colt. Witless poor man. Betsy turned her head and smiled at Colt. Yes, that's right. She does. Was that delivered slow enough, she wondered? Now she was worried if Colt was capable of helping her. Is Jake coming today to help me train? Colt's frown was back, along with a tick of his jaw. No. Just like that? No? Well, we might need him, don't you think? Was that a sneer on Colt's face? A flash of anger in those pools of blue? Why? Betsy turned so that she faced Colt. Striving hard to control her speech, she tried again. Jake's the man I talk to on the telephone. He's the one I want to train Meg. She knew that might sound harsh, but she needed to be sure Colt would understand her. Along with the creased brows and the jaw tick, he now brought his big hands to his hips. Jake is not available, Miss Murphy. It's me or nobody. Were his eyes shooting daggers? She'd once heard that people who were mentally impeded got angry easily. She would have to do better. Um, now don't get upset, Colt. It's just that mayhap you aren't, well, um, that you probably 
don't know how... Listen, I'm not saying this right. She paused for a moment, gathering her thoughts. You're not used to barrel racing, right? She didn't wait for him to nod. That might take too long. That is, Jake probably has more experience training horses for such competition. Do you understand? Cole dropped his hands from his waist and fisted them at his sides. He tilted his head down and thrust his face nearly into hers. Now that she could see the flecks of deep blue swirling within his eyes, he looked flat out enraged. Shoot! She didn't know the first thing about how to handle people like this. She guessed his fine-looking face had kept her from noticing his mental capabilities, or incapabilities, as it were, earlier. How was she to calm him down? A roar of laughter came from the front of the barn, causing them both to jerk their heads in that direction. Another man, Criminy, had to be another Cooper, with the same good looks and size, came strolling into the barn. He wore a brown vest that had seen better days over a faded button-down solid red shirt. His hat was different from any she'd seen, definitely a cowboy hat, but with a deep crease down its crown above the floppy, dirt-stained brim. His buckskin chaps had long since taken a beating, but none of that diminished his good looks. Laughter rode the air as he sauntered forward, all composure and cowboy swagger. <laughs> She's talking at you like you're a dimwit, Colt. I gotta meet the woman who's got your number, brother. Once he reached her, he stretched out a tanned hand to her. Bron Cooper, ma'am. And you are... She blinked up at the man, then took his hand with gusto, shaking it as her da taught her. Betsy Murphy. My, but you've got a good grip there, little lady. His gaze dropped to the slobber on her chest, then back to her thick hair pulled tight into a working ponytail, then to the freckles on her nose. You're different from Colt's usual admirers. Colt glowered at his brother. Shut up, Bronk. What are you here for? Don't have a cow. Is that any way to talk to your own flesh and blood? You're not making a very good impression on your lady friend here. She's not my... He shook his head. Never mind. Get on with your business. Hey, this here's my barn too, Daddy-O. I'm after Ranger. Betsy watched as these two brothers snipped at each other over the top of her head, both with eyes lit with irritation. Unlike Colt's sapphire beauties, Bronx eyes were green with multicolored flecks that looked like they'd been whisked together then frozen in place. Unusual. Get your horse and go about your business, Colt said with less gusto in his voice. Well, I better do my brotherly good deed first and inform Miss Murphy here that she's mistaken about you being brainless. Bronk turned toward her. You see, ma'am, this here dimwit is actually edumacated. He was a galdarn valedictorian of his senior class. Unlike his dumb brother here, he stuffed a thumb into his own chest. Colt grimaced. Betsy figured Bronk demolished his own reputation frequently by the look on Colt's face. Knock it off, Bronco. I just thought to give her the facts about the hillbilly she thinks you are, Big Daddy. She ought to know who she's addressing. Don't you imagine? Colt gave Bronk a shove toward his horse's stall, all while Bronk swayed like a drunk and laughed his fool head off. Colt was valedictorian? Was Bronk joshing? So, you must think I'm an idiot, she said, trying for an apologetic look on her face. A frown drew his brows together. Why? Because your brother's right. I thought you were uh, slow. His face softened then, and an adorable half-smile deepened a crease in his right cheek. A crevice. No, a dimple. A crevice with a dimple. Her legs went a little weak. You thought I was dimwit like Bronx said? She poked him in the chest with an index finger. Do you like stating the obvious? 
Colt jolted as if she'd slept him. Oh, shoot. Jimmy's right. I should keep my thoughts to myself. The expression on Colt's face was impassive as his gaze drifted off to the empty stall and sat there on nothing in particular. See, now why did he do that? It'd make people think he was slow. Or at least it seemed that way to her. She couldn't keep it to herself. See, that right there. He jerked his gaze back to her. What right where? Where were you just now? He rolled his eyes and turned toward the open barn door. Let's get started before the day gets past us. What? Wait. Hold on. We're not done with this conversation. Far as I'm concerned, we are. Then he was out the door and out of sight. Well, there was nothing slow about his actions. So he was just socially inept. Yeah, that had to be it. As she thought of his superior good looks, she wondered how that was possible. Bronk did mention Colt's usual admirers, so the man wasn't without women folk to practice on. Come on, girl, Betsy said to the mare, pulling her along by the lead rope. She didn't understand this man who had control over her future. If this mare didn't get trained, she'd miss her opportunity to show the high-handed rodeo men and her daw she could make it in their world. I'll do, ma'am. Startled, both she and Meg jerked. Her gaze followed the voice to a grizzled old man coming up alongside Nutmeg's flank on the other side. When he reached Meg's head, he smiled at her brightly. You must be the Miss Murphy everyone's talking about. Who's everyone? Ah, just the cowpokes employed on this here spread is all. I haven't been off the ranch in a coon's age. And you are... Pardon my bad manners, ma'am. Name's Henry, though most call me Stogie on account of I like my cigars. He yanked at his sweat-stained hat in a gesture of hello. As much as she didn't have time for greeting everyone on the ranch, she liked the old coot. Stogie had kind eyes and an easy smile around the unlit Stogie stuffed in a gap in his teeth. His gray hair was long enough to flutter in a cool morning breeze, though most of it was trapped by his hat. I heard you was looking for a barrel racing horse. I was watching when Jake brought this here horse. She's a good one. She'll do you right fine. Now that interested her. She stopped to talk more with Stogie and was happily surprised when Nutmeg halted with her. That was an excellent sign. Distracted, she nearly forgot her question. Oh, um, what makes you think so, Mr. Stogie? The man blinked at her, then threw his head back and guffawed. Stogie! Just Stogie, little lady. I ain't been called Mr. since I was called into the principal's office when I was fourteen. Principal thought I'd needed a title since I thought I was somebody back then. He learned me real good. Not to think so highly of myself. He ducked and gave her a wink, by way of a paddle the size of an oar. He pulled off his hat with his free hand and scratched at his scalp before stuffing the battered thing back on, guffawing again. <laughs> no one ever called me Mr. Again. Never let him. Not once. She chuckled and forgot all about her question when her gaze settled on a sight in the corral. Four cooper-sized men stood in the center of the corral. The one she knew best, Blue Eyes himself, was hollering in another's face, a long finger pointing with emphasis as he yelled. She couldn't hear his words, but it was apparent the other three were stunned. Each had leaned back on his heels with hands in varying positions, as if they'd been shocked into statues by Colt's outburst. What? Did he never give them verbal thrashings? Mayhap it was the contents of his speech. Out of the corner of his eye, Colt must have seen her arrival, since he dropped his finger, ceased his hollering, and turned her direction. The three men's gaze remained locked to his back as his tense strides brought him to the gate. He swung it open for her to enter. Her quick glance at Stogie found him with a similar wide-eyed expression on his face, his unlit Stogie hanging from his lower lip. A shiver of trepidation rushed through her. Did Colt scare her? 
No, she wasn't scared. It had to be admiration then. Colt's expression was severe. What had he and these men been talking about? Come in. Let's get started, he said flatly. Stogie backed out of the way so Betsy could pull the horse through. Colt looped the rope to close the gate and headed back to the men at the center of the corral. Hesitantly, Betsy followed. Once he reached the trio, he turned back to her. He pointed from one to the other as he introduced them. Bronk, you know. Brand, his twin. They're the babies. Trevor, you know. Brand, this is Riley Murphy. Betsy. Colt eyed her. Fine. For them. He turned his head back to his brothers. You can call her Betsy, he stated. Brand stepped forward and reached out his hand. Betsy reciprocated. Then Brand captured her thin, callous hand in his. He pulled it to his mouth and gave it a lingering kiss. Good to meet you, Cherry. Betsy rolled her eyes. People were always calling her that. Or rooster, red, copper top, ginger, carrot top, rusty, you name it. None of them original. All of them annoying. She had an instant dislike for Brand. Could do without Bronk as well. Trevor was at another level of bull-headed male. But Colt? He did something to her. She didn't even mind his use of her middle name. Of course, part of that was because it didn't relate to her red hair. But there was another part, a bigger part, and she wasn't sure what that was. She pulled her hand a little roughly away from Brand. Bronk snickered. Trevor turned without a word and strode toward the barn. "'You can go now, too,' Colt said to the twins, shooting an icy blue glare at them both. "'Fine. See you, Daddy-o. Call if you need help with the filly,' Bronk said, double meaning intended, then raised a hand over his head in a wave on his way out. "'Nice to meet you, Red. Hope we see a lot of you.' The grin Brand offered was wide, charming, and dazzling. She figured there were many unsuspecting female who'd been imprisoned by that smile. He tapped a finger to the brim of his beige hat, not dirty or misshapen like his twins, then strode out of the corral after Bronk. She watched their departure, amazed at how identical they were in build and strides, yet how different they seemed in personality and dress. "'Let's do some lunge line work today,' Colt said. It wasn't a suggestion, but a solid statement. Well, at least he wasn't going to waste any more time. But she found herself more than curious about the argument, and whether Colt was the dominant brother around here. What was that about? Colt's gaze jerked away from her and onto Meg. Get your line ready. Stand in the center and give her her head. Get her to walk. Use the whip. Point it at her shoulder. Though it was none of her business, the fact he'd just ignored her question irked her. If Jimmy wasn't still asleep, he'd be sure to nudge her into silence. She took hold of the lunge line and wrapped it in big loops around her hand, then clicked her tongue at Meg. So what happened with your brothers? Did it have anything to do with me? Pat her on the rear. Get her moving. Her irritation bloomed. People who knew her watched for the flush at the opening of her collar. She gave Meg a whack on the rear, causing the mare to jump, then started moving. Colt frowned. I said pat, not wallop. Betsy turned to face him, both hands coming to her hips, akimbo, the whip's tip dragging on the ground. Well, excuse me, Mr. Cooper, if I didn't use a pat. Is there possibly something in between a pat and a wallop? A smack, perhaps? A thump? A crack? Perhaps a blow. No, not a blow? Too much? Colt didn't say a thing, his dark brows drawn straight above his eyes. Too bad that didn't ruin his good looks any. He stared at her like she'd plumb lost her mind. Well, mayhap she had. She just now realized how much she needed Jimmy to keep her in check, to smooth her ruffled feathers when that Irish temper of hers took over. Betsy closed her eyes and dropped her head, sucking in a breath. Calm down, 
He thinks you're a lunatic. She raised her chin and looked him in the eye. I'm sorry, Colt, for thinking you dim-witted, for pushing you too fast to let me get started with Meg here, for slapping her on the rump too hard. I never do that. I just let my irritations at you dictate my actions. I should heed the old Irish saying, better good manners than good looks. I have neither. I apologize. Something tells me you don't do that often. Smack a horse? She shook her head. Never. Colt chuckled. Well, at least you're forthright. She sighed, then smiled, watched her foot as she kicked at the dirt. That I am. Too much so, they say. And Riley? Colt waited until she looked him straight in the eye. I'm glad you have both. Both what? She frowned her confusion. Good manners and good looks. He lifted one brow and grinned then. A bright white bone-melting smile that exaggerated the creases around his mouth and deepened the lines in the bronzed skin at the corner of his eyes. Her lips parted and a gasp slipped out. For the first time in her life, she felt herself stumble emotionally. She could lose everything if she let this cowboy gentleman slide toward her heart. With some quick thinking and a forced glare, she pulled herself together. Colt probably used his charm on all the girls. Keep your opinions to yourself, Mr. Cooper. I'll not be interested in them. She grimaced at the Irish accent that had flared into her voice. His smile fell off, but he didn't budge from his stance nor his stare. Where the tongue slips, it speaks the truth, Miss Murphy. I do believe your ancestors would scold you for that whopper of a lie. This time she gawked. The man surprised her. An Irish proverb? How do you know it? Colt gave her a half-smile that was no less heart-stopping than the first smile before it slipped away, leaving only grimness. I'm full of surprises, Miss Murphy. Beware. He tugged on his hat-brim, turned, and disappeared into the barn, leaving her mind to stumble again. Chapter 7 Betsy twirled slowly on her heels. The hole where she anchored herself grew deeper while the peppy mare galloped around her. Full circles, half circles, changes of direction, sliding halts. All Betsy had to do was move forward, behind the mare's driveline, where the saddle would naturally sit, and cluck her tongue, and off she'd go again. Meg never really tired. The horse seemed to anticipate Betsy's every desire and then execute it flawlessly. The next time she saw Colt, she would ask him who Meg had belonged to before coming here to the Bar Six. Someone had apparently spent a great deal of time training her, at least on groundwork. Thinking of Colt, as she'd done all morning since their disagreement, made her wonder where he'd gone off to. If he couldn't stand the wee dispute they had, how would he ever hold up to days and weeks by her side training her new horse? And yes, she'd already decided Meg belonged to her. She didn't care the cost. Good job, Red. She's doing great. There was that voice she knew so well. Jimmy, she said, keeping her eyes on the mare, continuing her efforts. Where have you been? With Colt. Thought you knew. Now how would I know, James Schultz, when I've not seen you yet today? Betsy let the rope sag as she turned to look at Jimmy. Meg took that as a signal and plowed to a stop, then trotted toward her. By the look in her big eyes and her outstretched neck, the horse was ready for some lovin'. Betsy stroked the mare's neck, then rubbed her muzzle. It was wet with sweat and mucus, but neither Betsy nor Meg seemed to mind. What an affectionate animal! She was quickly galloping straight into Betsy's heart. It was a good thing, too, since that kept all thoughts of the mare's handsome owner out of her head. If she wasn't successful with that, she could lose her edge, lose nationals, and lose her chance to show her da she wasn't a failure after all. What were you two doing? she said. Jimmy reached into his back pocket and yanked out a piece of paper folded into fourths. Making this list of how to proceed with Meg here. 
He handed the paper to Betsy and stepped back out of her space. Betsy glanced at it, then whipped her head toward Jimmy. What do you mean, a list of how to proceed? Why did he make that list with you and not me? Jimmy averted his gaze, pretending to check Meg's legs. Jimmy? He hunkered down and rubbed a hand over Meg's cannon bone, then over her fetlock and her hoof. Still in a squad, he said, Well, uh, cause I'm a guy, I guess. What? She gave him a shove. He caught himself on one hand, then leapt to his feet. Now red, don't now red me. What did he say, exactly? Um, he may have said something like, We'll let Betsy get to know Meg while we go over what needs to be done. Is that right? She stuffed Meg's lead rope into Jimmy's hands, feeling the heat of her fury. Sure, Colt probably thought his actions selfless, considerate even. But how dare he? Where is he? Jimmy grabbed for her hand but missed as she turned and stomped toward the gate. Now, Red, don't go flying off the handle, girl. You were busy. We made a list, is all. She twisted back, her boot heels digging in once more. You know how I feel about men trying to run things for me, Jimmy? Why would you, of all people, be a part of that? Jimmy stuffed his hat on tighter, so she couldn't see his eyes. At least he had the decency to look sheepish. Well, Colt thought it best. Oh, so Colt thought it best, eh? She slammed her hands on her hips. You have a brain? You can think for yourself? Or can you? Fuming, she twisted back to the gate, threw off the loop, then threw the gate open and tromped along the side of the barn toward the door. As luck would have it, Colt came around the corner, heading in Betsy's direction. His eyes widened, and his jaw bunched up. "'You can march yourself right back to that gate, Miss Murphy. That's one thing we don't tolerate around here. Too many things can happen when gates are left open.' "'I can march?' She clunked her teeth together, effectively stopping her own words. She'd been about to throw his words back at him, the arrogant man. But she heard Jimmy's warnings in her head, as always. "'Fine!' Spinning back, she used exaggerated movements while pulling the gate closed and refastening it. She was so used to Jimmy following in her wake, handling things like gates, she hadn't thought through her own actions. Good. Now, did Jimmy show you the list? She tore up to him and stopped two feet short. Too close, since she had to tilt her head back to look into his eyes. Darn it. Cooper men were taller than they had any right to be. She couldn't give this man the advantage over her just from their height difference. So she poked him in the chest. About that! He looked down at the finger that was bouncing off pure muscle and chuckled. Her finger stilled. Why are you laughing? You think to control me with that bony little finger? She sucked in a breath, realizing her finger was still resting on his chest and snatched it back, whisking both hands behind her. I, um, why did you make a list with Jimmy? Her breath came out too short, but her voice reflected her irritation, thank goodness. This is my horse, my decision, my money that will be buying her. Do you think it's suitable to discuss my business with my friend and not me? It was hard, but she bit the inside of her cheek to say nothing more her glare would have to suffice. Colt frowned but kept his gaze on her. That was impressive. She'd taken years to perfect a glare that put men in their places, but he didn't seem daunted, just preoccupied by what she'd said. His mouth opened, closed, then opened again. You're right. I apologize. I know what a hurry you're in to get Meg trained. So I thought to leave you with her and get some plans on paper. In an instant, her rage drained off, along with her blush. Once again, she jumped to conclusions. If she wasn't careful, she'd ruin this for herself. Now, she not only felt ridiculous, but she also owed Colt an apology. Oh, 
was all she managed to push out of her mouth. The sound of a vehicle moving too fast, then skidding to a stop not two yards from Colt's back, brought both of them around to face the idiot. It was a green convertible, a petite woman with wind-blown blonde hair at the wheel. What the... Jenny! Colt stormed to the driver's side. Jenny? Curious and thankful her apology had been interrupted, Betsy moseyed after him. Colt threw open the driver's door and caught Jenny by the elbow. He hesitated, probably to gain control of himself, then helped her step out of the car. What have I told you about driving too fast on the ranch roads and especially so close to the barn? This Jenny glanced a glare off Colt before landing it on Betsy. She pointed rudely. Who's she? Colt turned his head. Can you give me a minute, Miss Murphy? He said that a wee too forcefully for her tastes. When Betsy stubbornly raised her chin, hating to be told what to do, especially by men, Colt's eyes softened. Please? Well, okay then. Please went a long way in her world. She nodded, turned, and hurried back to the corral and her eager mare. She's none of your concern, Betsy heard Colt say to this Jenny person. What are you doing here? Satisfied that Colt would remain occupied for a spell, Betsy let herself back into the corral and walked up to Jimmy as he worked Meg. Everything all right? he asked. She shrugged. How's she doing? Her eyes followed the tireless mare as she looped around them. I want to ride her. Jimmy's face fell. No! Uh, I mean, Colt says groundwork for a few days. Why? Look here on the list, Jimmy said, fumbling with the paper and the lead rope at the same time. It says here that we are to do groundwork for a few days. That is, running circles, walking in circles, walking her around the corral, getting her used to the bridle, the saddle, and you, of course. Jimmy, I don't have time for this. I need to get her used to the barrels and the clover leaves she has to run. She has a lot to learn in a very short time. Jimmy leaned forward and whispered, I know what you want, Red, but Colt insists. Maybe a talk with him is needed. Feeling her face fill with heat again, Jimmy put a hand on her shoulder. A talk, not an Irish temper tantrum. Betsy took three full breaths, in and out of her nose, feeling an overwhelming need to punch Jimmy in the nose. She needed to settle down. They'd hardly begun Meg's training, and she could barely keep it together. What was the matter with her? Colt. He was the reason. Well, she was here for a horse, not a man. With one final exhale, she nodded, then took the lead from Jimmy. They'd been running Meg for too long. Though the mare had endless energy, Betsy figured she'd rather drop than stop showing off. She gathered the rope, winding it from hand to elbow until Meg was standing in front of her. Betsy slid her arm through the loops and used both hands to rub Meg's face, up and down her nose, over her muzzle, over her eyes, scratching behind her ears, over and over again. Meg loved it. If she were a cat, she'd be purring. As it was, she licked her lips and her eyes drooped. One glance showed her Meg had one hind leg cocked, resting on the edge of her hoof. All three signs of complete relaxation. Let's get her into the barn and rub her down. Then once Colt's little girlfriend is gone, I'll have that talk with him. Jimmy shook his head. I'll take care of Meg. You talk to Colt now. If I've learned anything in my time with you, Red, it'd be don't wait to give your Irish demon time to rev up. He gave her a little shove and turned toward the barn. Meg lumbered along behind like a thirty-year-old ready for pasture. Betsy chuckled at the sight. What a contrast. Looking over to where she'd last left Colt, she saw the little green car was gone and there was no sign of Colt. Jimmy was right. Now was the time to address the list with Meg's current owner. After letting herself out of the gate, she carefully replaced the loop over the post. 
Before seeking out Colt, she slipped into the shed apartment to use the restroom, then took a quick glance in the mirror above the sink as she washed her hands. When she saw the same boyish-looking redhead looking back at her, she frowned. The usual lack of femininity was beginning to grate on her. She squeaked off the faucet and air-dried her hands while she walked, fighting the urge to make herself more presentable for Colt. She entered the barn, gave herself a moment to let her eyes adjust, then scooted forward to the stalls full of horses in search of blue eyes. Wham! Betsy jumped at the thunderous sound of splintering wood, her heart leaping into her throat. What in the world? She ducked around a post to see where the sound came from and saw Colt and one of the twins in motion, trying to calm a horse who was huffing breaths through flared nostrils and pinned back ears. The horse was rearing and hopping in place, its hind end adjacent to a cracked board in the side of the barn. She inched toward the stall and saw it was a stallion, a huge, furious stallion. "'Get her out of here, Brand! Now!' Colt hollered to his brother, then resumed his cooing gentle words to the hostile stallion. At first she thought he meant her, but when Brand nodded and jogged to the other side of the barn, she saw he grabbed a halter and lead rope off a nail, then scrambled back to Meg, who was in the stall right next to the stallion. The mare looked confused and shy and agitated. She kept approaching the stud and bumping her nose into his before he squealed and kicked some more. Meg tossed her head with a squeal of her own and reared away. Betsy had a bad feeling about this. What's going on? She knew she should stay out of it, but this was her horse Brand was haltering and attaching a lead rope to. The mare's showing sign of estrus. It's making the stallion crazy. We have to separate them. Hold the gate open, will you? Estrus? Betsy asked as she snapped to and grabbed the gate for Brand. She's in season, Brand threw over his shoulder as he led her out of the stall and on out of the barn. The stallion went mad, shaking his massive head, whinnying after her. In season. This was going to get complicated, and Colt was going to be furious with Jimmy for putting Meg next to the stallion. Betsy should have stayed with him, but then again, Jimmy should have seen the signs instead of leaving her where she created a ruckus. Where was he, anyway? As if her thoughts had found him, he hobbled out of their apartment, his gaze landing on Meg's rump as she and Bran passed by. Hey, Red, where is he taking Meg? I just put her up. Right next to their big stallion? So? So? Did you notice she's in season? Estrus, whatever they call it, she said, waving her hand in the air. I just say in heat. Jimmy's eyes bugged. No, didn't notice. Crap. Yes, crap. Now what? Isn't this going to goof up her training? Won't she be distracted now that she knows a stallion is near? She ran her palms over her forehead catching the pieces of hair that had gotten loose and pushed them back out of her face. As much as she knew about horses, this was one area she'd missed entirely. They didn't have stallions on their ranch back home, only geldings and mares. Well, no, shouldn't be too bad if the stallion's not around her. So that's why they're taking her out to the corral? Where will they keep her later? Heck if I know. Why can't this be easy? She kicked at the dirt and followed Brand and the mare to the corral. Why? What else happened? She glanced at Jimmy as he kept pace beside her. What do you mean? They're moving Meg. What else happened that's a problem? He asked. She frowned, asking herself that same question. Why did she feel there was a problem? Was it Colt? She had to ask herself... Was it that she felt Colt would deny her the mare? Or was it the upcoming days of training the horse shoulder to shoulder with the man that had her on edge? Sweat popped out on her back. The breeze blew past them, chilling her. Nothing's wrong. I want to get started. I want to ride her. 
Get her used to barrels. Get on with it! She halfway screamed as Jimmy popped open the gate and reattached it behind them. Okay, okay, settle down. Let's ask Bran what you can do with her now that she can't go to the barn. Betsy glared at Jimmy. I'm sure he doesn't know anything. He's not helping with the training. He's only Colt's little brother. She dashed ahead of Jimmy to reach Bran first. I'll take her. Bran jolted as if surprised by her appearance. Oh, okay, pretty lady. Don't call me that. Why not? Ignoring Bran's question, she tugged the lead rope out of Bran's hands and used the excess to slap the dirt. Hey, she said to Meg. It didn't take another word. Meg was off and looping counterclockwise around them. Though done for the day, the mare was still quivering and snorting her agitation from her encounter with the stallion. Betsy figured to run it out of her. So, why not? Bran tried again. He stood at her back, turning as she did in the center of the corral while Jimmy lounged against the fence, watching them. Loose dirt caught in the gusts of wind circling around them. Betsy coughed out some grit from her throat. Why not what? Why not call you pretty lady? I've always liked redheads. Betsy hated these games men played with her. She ran into men like Brand every day during rodeo season. They flirted in hopes of getting her into a temporary bed. They had no true respect for the horsewoman she was and what she'd accomplished with barrel racing. She glanced at Bran out of the corner of her eye. This was Colt's little brother, though, so she had to be careful how she handled him. She huffed a sigh. I'm not pretty and I'm not a lady. Well, I beg to diff. I suggest you hush, Jimmy said, coming into their circle. Betsy threw a warning glance at Jimmy, surprised it was her and not him managing social etiquette this time. A loud slam of the barn's door brought Colt in sight. He looked furious, sapphire eyes flashing like beacons across the corral at them. Betsy swallowed, worried they had lost their chance at Meg. Colt powered forward, gaining fury with each step. Betsy let the lead rope droop, knowing Meg would stop and trot up to her. She did just that. It was amazing how quickly Meg was getting to know her and her signals. Meg and Colt reached her at the same time. She took hold of the rope at the halter and rubbed her nose with the other hand while Colt steamed out his first words. Which one of you put a horse in season you don't want to breed next to a stud? Jimmy raised his hand like a schoolboy caught in the act. Uh, that'd be me, sir. Colt did a double take at Jimmy, his fury diminishing. Put your hand down, Jimmy, and don't call me sir. I'm sorry. I didn't notice Meg was in season. Uh, sir, uh, Colt? My fault. Colt rolled his lips in. Betsy stilled, waiting for an outburst like her da would have. When it didn't come, she asked, You okay? Yep. Okay. Just fine. Fine. She turned toward the horse and rubbed her face, then stroked her neck as she asked, Where do you want us to put her? We, uh, we are done with groundwork. She didn't look back at Colt, but saw when he moved to stroke Meg's neck on the other side. For today, he said. For today what? she countered. You're done with the groundwork for today. We'll start early tomorrow. With more groundwork? Why? She's perfect. I want to ride her. He stopped rubbing Meg and stared at her. You will. When she's ready. What are you talking about? Ready? She is ready. What more do you want from her? Respect. She scoffed and threw her hand up to emphasize her feelings. Meg flinched. She patted her neck. Sorry, girl. Turning her attention to the stubborn owner, she said, I want her. Make a bill of sale. I will pay you. Then I will decide how to go about this. Colt turned to Jimmy. Is she always like this? 
Jimmy gave a nervous little laugh. Mostly. She doesn't let anyone boss her around. Gold still addressed Jimmy. Until she shows signs of respect, Riley will only have trouble when she wants the mare to obey her commands. Betsy fumed that they had gone back to ignoring her. What lack of respect is she showing? Kind of like what you're doing to me right now? Colt ignored her snipe, but looked her in the eye. Sent her back out to run. Easy. Betsy loosened the lead rope, slapped the loose end on the ground, and said, Hey! Meg flinched, bobbed her head, then snuffled Betsy's hair. Shocked that Colt knew Meg would do this, she tried again. Hey! she said, and gave Meg's head a push away from her. The mare bounced once on her front feet, then tried to snuffle Colt. Colt grabbed her by the halter, tugged her in the direction he wanted her to go, then clucked his tongue, grabbing the lead rope out of Betsy's hand. Meg obeyed immediately. Was this a dominance thing? Alpha male, didn't they call it? Did she follow Colt strictly because he was alpha to Meg? She hasn't ignored me before. Betsy just got through with thinking how well they were getting to know each other's cues. What did you do to her? Betsy felt her face warm up. This mare may be a show-off, but she'll choose people first rather than obey a command. Too many of us are standing here. She wants to join the party. Well, then why did she obey you, huh? I thought you weren't all that familiar with her. I'm not. But it's obvious she sees me as someone to respect. You can either treat her as a pet or work her as a partner. I'm not selling her to you as a pet. You need a partner, and soon. Betsy wanted to clobber Colt. If she were a man, he'd sell the dang horse to her and not think twice about it. That infuriated her more. Stop trying to protect me. Sell her to me, now. Jimmy took hold of her elbow and pushed her into a walk, away from Colt, careful to make it look natural. He never embarrassed her. She wanted to make a scene about the whole male dominance thing, but she'd learned to trust Jimmy. He'd always had her best interest at heart. Red, that chip on your shoulder has no place here. These Cooper men aren't used to outspoken women. They are just treating you like they do all women, especially Colt. He's a gentleman. He's going to treat you like a lady, and you need to let him. You're going to blow this deal if you don't back off. You know that, don't you? She hunkered toward him, using her best whisper. What do you want me to do, Jimmy? Bet my eyes at him? Twist my fingers together like some bashful girl? You know I can't do that. I won't. Her last words came out loudly, and Jimmy shushed her. Shh, stop it. It won't hurt you to act like a lady some. Try it. You want this horse, don't you? She sucked in a breath and held it, puffing it back out in one big whoosh. Then she nodded. Okay, then. Practice. See what you can do. Fine. She strode back over to Colt and the trotting horse. Now... How did her feminine voice go? She hadn't used it for so many years, she wasn't sure she still had access to it. That's amazing, Colt. Do you think I can get her to obey me like that? Colt, busy with the mare, didn't look over at her, but she saw his jaw drop slightly. When he finally looked in her direction, the look on his face said it before he did. What are you doing, Spitfire? What do you mean, blue eyes? The sugary sound of her voice and the sappy words even irritated her. Pulling his lips in tight, he sent out a loud whistle, piercing the air in her ears. Betsy winced, but Meg made a turn and trotted toward him. He gave her a pat, then turned to Betsy and raised a brow. Want to explain? Rats. Betsy knew she wasn't feminine, but you'd think she could at least act feminine. Apparently, her da had scorned that capacity right out of her. 
She opted to ignore his request. You never answered me. Where do we keep Meg here? She busied herself patting and rubbing the horse, keeping her eyes off the bossy two-legged animal standing next to her. He kept silent until she chanced to peek at him. We'll keep her in the paddock for now. She'll be out of estrus in a week. Betsy whipped around, landing her hands at her waist. Colt's gaze followed her actions, his eyes lingering on her hips. That infuriated her more. Did all men act like imbeciles with women? She thought he might be different. She dropped her hands and fisted them. No, keep the stallion in the paddock. I want my mare in the barn, out of your crazy Wyoming weather. Red, stay out of this, Jimmy, she said, her glare fixed on Colt. Colt's gaze drifted off. He looked to be pondering her suggestion. Jimmy jumped in. Why is that stallion so aggressive toward Meg anyways? I've seen studs bump noses too hard, or squeal, or shake their heads, but they're usually more focused on what they want. You know, trying to please the lady. He laughed at his awkward joke. Colt lifted his hat and ran a hand down his face. Yeah, this one's different. He was poisoned months back. He's still a bit edgy. He's also sterile. But since Meg here is a maiden mare, we still want to keep him away from her. How sad. Oh, I'm sorry, Colt, she said, and she was. How'd he get poisoned? Colt hesitated, glanced around, like her questions made him as edgy as the stallion was. Finally, he said, Loco weed. He slid his hand down the lead rope and handed it to her. I'll put the stallion in the paddock. Take her to the side of the barn where he can't get a whiff of her. Give me a few minutes. Then take her back to the same stall. And then he was off. Wow, that's awful, Jimmy said. That stud was probably a big part of his future. I'd venture to say he needs the sale. Betsy felt a lead weight drop in her stomach. She felt horrible she'd been riding him so hard on things that weren't important. Poor Colt. She'd been told he'd just gotten started with his equine business not even a year ago. This poisoning must have happened soon after. She wondered how the stallion got poisoned, and just like that, she needed to know. Here, take her. I have to go to the house. Jimmy took the rope and nodded, not thinking anything of it. Betsy took off for the house in search of Rebecca. She didn't know what was going on with Colt Cooper and his business, but she knew a horse didn't randomly get poisoned by loco weed. It sounded like something purposeful to her. Inexplicably, her fury toward Colt shifted to the unknown villain. Whoever it was would get a spiny piece of Elizabeth Riley Murphy's mind. Chapter 8 Betsy wandered into the kitchen after having removed her boots in the mudroom. Hello? Anyone in here? Delicious smells coming from the oven made her stomach rumble. Had she eaten today? Rebecca came through the door from the living room and saw Betsy, a smile taking over her whole face. How's it going out there? Do you like the mare? Betsy couldn't help but smile back. Rebecca's enthusiasm and pleasantness were contagious. I love her, but Colt won't sell her to me. Rebecca's smile dropped off, and her brows knit together. He won't? Why is that? Her frown matched Rebecca's. Stubborn man, Betsy mumbled, remembering all over again why she'd been furious with him. Said he wanted to see if she could be my partner, or something or rather. Rebecca pulled in a quick breath and smiled again. Oh, that's more like him. He's such a good man. If the mare didn't serve your purpose, he would feel bad if he'd already sold her to you. Is she giving you angst? Angst? You know, grief, trouble. Oh, Betsy said and laughed. <laughs> I wasn't sure what that meant. Rebecca tilted her head with a questioning look. You're not Scottish, are you? Not with the last name Murphy. Why? Betsy returned the confused look. Oh, 
Because I said wasna? She laughed. Sorry, sometimes these words fall out of my mouth. Da lived in Northern Ireland for most of his youth. Scots came across the Northern Channel to Ireland and vice versa, all the time. Some of their words rubbed off on him, and then on me. No, we're Irish. Rebecca laughed with her. I thought so. You and Jake should have a lot in common. Aye, I guess so. Well, back to Colt. I'll warn you, if he doesn't think Nutmeg will be a good match, he'll not strap you with her. You'll have to find another. Oh, she'll be a fine fit, I'm certain. He'll see. Good. Are you ready for supper? We'll be putting it on the table post-haste. She wanted to ask what post-haste meant, but figured it meant soon. Rebecca sure liked different words. Were the fellows behind you? Betsy shook her head. They were swapping the stallion for the mare. It may take them a little bit. Rebecca closed the oven door, then placed the potholder on the counter, turning toward her. Oh, why's that? Nutmeg is in season. The stallion went crazy when she was put up next to him in the barn. Oh, for crying out loud. Bronk did it, didn't he? He loves to stir the pot. Betsy felt her blush start at her chest and move all the way up to her hairline. Uh, no. I'm afraid Jimmy did that. Sorry. Rebecca sighed with long suffering. That's actually good. Bronk is such a challenge. I'm glad it wasn't him this time. How long has Meg been in heat? Betsy grinned. I'm glad someone else calls it that. The men say in season or estrus, which I've never heard of before. The estrus part. It's just regular old heat to me. Rebecca laughed. <laughs> That's right. What do these men know about females, anyway? Plenty, I'd say, came the deep voice from Rebecca's husband as he came through the doorway, looking handsome and happy. An older version of Trevor, though the eyes were Colt's. His focus was purely on his wife as he came forward and planted a quick kiss on her lips. Think so, huh? He chuckled. I know so. He gave her a wolfish smile, then glanced up. Hello, Miss Murphy. How's the training coming along? Please, call me Betsy. I'd say fine, but Colt and I are not seeing eye to eye. As soon as her hasty words were out of her mouth, she wished she could drag them back. This man was Colt's father. She had no business tattling on him. Her intention wasn't to get him in trouble. Is that right? Well, Colt knows his stuff. I hope you'll trust him. Rebecca beamed at his statement. Even Betsy was impressed that a father could feel that way about his child. Her da would never come to her defense like that. She found herself envying Colt. Oh, sure. I trust him. What else could she say? Good. I'll run out and grab the men. Rebecca made my favorite meal tonight, didn't she, Duchess? She nodded, smiling up at him. He gave her a lingering kiss on the forehead, then exited the kitchen for the mudroom. Couples in love always amazed her. She had little experience there. No mom to watch her with her da. Their cowpokes back in Texas weren't married. Some divorced, the others widowers. Rarely did the rodeo cowboys have spouses, and if they did, they often didn't bring them along. Her world consisted of single men, and she suspected they weren't the best examples of decency and respect, with all their buckle bunnies and such. Watching Cord and Rebecca together made her heart melt and at the same time reminded her that her thinking had gotten off track. She had a job to do, and it was time to get to it. Can I help? Betsy asked Rebecca as she came up beside her. She had a pot of something on the stove and was stirring it. It looked good and smelled even better. I'll put the stew on the table, then you can help me get the honey butter ready for the cornbread. Bending over the oven, she brought out a wide sheet of cornbread. Once you wash up, you can get the butter out of the fridge. The honey is on the counter, Rebecca gestured with her shoulder. Betsy washed at the sink, then did as she was asked and stirred honey into the bowl of butter. 
something new to her, but it sounded delicious. She placed it on the table Rebecca had already set. Would you mind pouring milk next? It's in the fridge. Do you all drink milk? Betsy said to Rebecca's back as she plunked the stew down at the head of the table. Yes, don't you? Betsy shook her head. Not so much. Oh, I like it plenty. Da doesn't think I need it, is all. On her way back to the kitchen, Rebecca gave her a wee smile that looked apologetic. Well, we have plenty if you want it. As they worked side by side, Betsy had a warm feeling of hominess come over her. She rarely ate with anyone at the ranch in Amarillo. Usually she fed her da and the workers before they left for farm work, then fed herself. There was no one else. Once in a great while, Jimmy would join her, but that was only when her da was out of town, which happened little these days. I have a question I hope you can answer. Sure, Rebecca said, still moving about the kitchen to gather everything for supper. Who poisoned the stallion with local weed? Rebecca stopped dead and stared. Who told you that? Colt. He said the stallion is sterile now. It makes me furious thinking of someone hurting him that way. Colt or the stallion? Brushing stray pieces of sweat-crusted hair off her face, she wondered who she did feel the sorriest for and why she hadn't thought to wash her face at the sink. But that was just a deflection. Colt, mostly, because he lost so much. But no one should hurt innocent animals, either. Yes, I agree. Colt was devastated when Jake told him the stallion would likely be sterile. He was Colt's hope for a whole string of cow horses. Nutmeg was to be the first to be bred to the stallion for his own business. Now he has to sell her to help pay for another stallion. Rebecca sucked in a breath, as if she wasn't supposed to say all that, and turned to her. But we're happy it's to you, really. No wonder he hates me. Rebecca looked stunned. Who, Colt? No, no, he couldn't hate you. He doesn't. Not at all. Yes, he does. And it's because I'm reminding him of what can never be. If that's not enough, I'm taking his best mare. Betsy's legs felt like cooked noodles. She pulled out a chair and plopped down hard. Rebecca dashed to her. Are you all right? I should never have told you that. I'm sorry. None of this is your fault, you know. Colt offered the stallion to our neighbors to test his fertility. None of them took. So he wasn't planning to breed Meg. There would be no need to try. She ran a hand over her cheek and grimaced. I'm sorry, I'm only making this worse. Betsy looked up into Rebecca's worried eyes. And here I thought he was being surly when I'm the one causing him real grief. It's hard enough to sell a horse, let alone the one who was to be the founding mayor of your whole business. Rebecca patted her on the shoulder. Now, Betsy, it's not like that, really. Colt would never be surly especially not over what he has to do for his business. He accepts life as it comes. There is no one easier to get along with than Colt Cooper. Trust me, you'll see. Confound it, Nilla! Get that horse out of here now! Colt hollered at Brand. If you're going to use my nickname, then say the whole dang thing. Vinilla, not Nilla. That makes me sound like a girl, mush. Why'd he get started with his dad's nicknames? They'd all outgrown them years ago. His dad insisted they remind him of better times. So, being the compliant kid, he was trying to use them as his dad wanted. He should remind his dad there were no good times, but he didn't want to hurt the man like that. Just get the stallion out to the paddock. Jimmy's bringing in the mare. I'll wait here to get her settled. Fine. Bran yanked the stallion's lead rope and tugged him toward the barn door. The darned animal was a wreck. Colt wondered, not for the first time, why Riley had Jimmy tag along. She only thought of him as a friend. That much was obvious. But he was a bit of a doofus, and Riley was a sharp cookie. 
By all standards, she should have dozens of men lining up to be near her. Made no sense. Unless, of course, her temper had weeded them out. Wouldn't surprise him. She was as fiery as that red hair of hers told the world she was. He grinned to himself, had to admire that she didn't let anyone boss her around. A loud squeal and bang of the corral gate had him sprinting for the barn door. Why had he let his younger brother take the stallion out alone while the stud was still agitated? He knew better. Whoa! Whoa! Hold on there! Colt heard Brand holler. Colt rounded the corner just as the snap of the halter resounded in the chilly twilight air. The next thing he heard was Jimmy screaming like a girl from the other side of the corral, then Nutmeg's full-throated cry. Colt bolted through the open gate and barely remembered to latch it with what he saw in front of him. The stallion was covering the mare, the deed almost done. Colt cursed, looking down at the halter and lead rope lying at Brand's feet, then up to a petrified Jimmy sitting on top of the fence on the other side. Blast! I told you the paddock, Brand! Colt jogged forward, his eyes on a stricken Jimmy. Couldn't you have gotten her out of here, Jimmy? Or at least separated them? Jimmy looked stricken. You kidding me? Never seen a stallion more determined. Or quick. The stallion clumsily climbed down and stood passively, his coat rippling. Meg shook all over. Colt didn't blame her, seeing how rough the stallion had been with her, holding her in place with a vicious bite to the shoulder. He'd have to check her for blood. Her first time and the stallion had shown no manners. Stinkin' stud! This was the first time Colt was happy. At least the darn horse was sterile. Easy, girl, Colt crooned as he padded slowly up to the quivering mare and tried to run a hand down her neck to the gnarled lump at her shoulder. But she wasn't having it. She jerked and shuffled away. He cursed under his breath. Mares rarely reacted once the deed was done, but she was young and injured. He'd seen this before. He prayed she'd recover quickly and still be a worthy partner for Riley. Colt swung an arm in the air, nabbing Brand's attention. Once he had it, he pointed at the stallion. The horse would be easy to control at this point. It was time he got in touch with Doc Willows to geld this animal. He wouldn't risk any more accidental matings, especially when the stallion had no chance of siring and was so unpredictable. He'd have to figure out what to do with him after that. Brand took Colt's direction and gathered up the broken halter for the rope still attached. He cautiously approached the stallion to secure the rope around his neck, then tugged him toward the gate and the paddock where he was supposed to have gone in the first place. Colt wished his twin brother would pay attention for once. Another quick grab at Meg's halter and Colt caught her. She threw her head up, but Colt held fast. "'What the hell is going on here?' came the angry voice of Riley from the gate. "'What a mouth on that girl!' Colt scowled as he turned toward her, still holding tight to Meg's halter. He slid his hand down to the ring where the lead rope attached and on down the lead for a few feet. Gathering the rest of the line, he trudged to the gate and a fuming redhead. Thankfully, the sorrel followed along willingly. A stallion got her. His own words made his gut sink like it was full of lead. What? How'd you let that happen? Riley pistoned through the gate toward him. Gate, Colt barked, none too happy himself about the turn of events. She glared at him. What now? The gate. Close the gate. Her eyes widened a bit, showing Colt a flash of green lit with fire. Then she turned and latched the gate. She resumed her march toward him, but slowed when her eyes caught the quivering mare. Her glare melted into anguish. Oh, my gosh! From his teeth? She turned her face to him. Her fierce eyes drowned in pools of tears. Colt was ashamed to be the same gender as the brutal stallion. 
He pressed his lips together and nodded. Riley turned back to the mirror. I'm so sorry, Curl, she said, forgetting all about Colt. Nutmeg nickered her distress to a sympathetic Riley, nuzzling her neck. Huh. Seemed females, no matter the species, stuck together. Take her on into the barn and give her some oats. There should be plenty of water. I'll be there in a minute. Tension had stiffened Riley's shoulders. It looked like she would give him a good scolding, but clamped her mouth shut and snatched the rope out of his hand. He was about to apologize for the mare's discomfort, but decided against it. The spitfire was sure to flay him if they talked now. And what would that accomplish? She'd have it out with him no matter what. But at least later he could hope for her temperature to cool some. That he wasn't looking to avoid her, as he did every other female trying to control him, bed him, or give him a piece of her mind, caught him like a right hook on the chin. But he didn't allow the thought to roost. What he did allow to nestle in was a plan on how to get the redhead off his ranch with a healed, trained, and useful Meg so that the two of them could escape his small corner of the world for the limelight of their own. Chapter 9 Betsy led the mare into an empty stall five doors down from the stallion's usual space. She didn't want Meg smelling her attacker. She pursed her lips together so hard they hurt. Couldn't these Cooper men keep track of their horses? They should have kept that terrible stallion out on pasture, far away from the mares. It didn't seem like a hard task. Yet here she and Meg were, all because they couldn't do their dang jobs. Easy, girl. When Colt gets here, he'll check your shoulder. Dang men. She kept her voice to a whisper in order to not startle the jumpy mare. She simmered inside, once again having to wait for a man to handle the problem. If she were home, she'd take care of Meg herself. Closing the stall gate, she turned to find the oats and rammed her nose into a solid wall of chest muscles. Feeling the fury rise, she looked up, ready to give Colt a piece of her mind. Only, it wasn't Colt. It was Trevor. Oh, sorry, she mumbled, feeling the rise of a flush. He didn't move, just stood there and stared down at her. He was an enormous man, reminding her of the bulls the daft cowboys rode right before her event. But looking carefully, she had to admit he didn't look the part of an untamed rancher. In fact, just the opposite. Well put together not a wrinkle or collar out of place. Perfect, really. The angles of his face were a lot like his father's. But he was younger and bronzed from the hours in the sun. His face showed no sign of emotion, where the elder's was full of warmth and love. In fact, on closer inspection, this man had an edge of anger to each feature. His eyes had slightly narrowed. His lips were in a grim line, his nostrils flared on each breath. Every few seconds a knot of muscle rolled in his strong jaw. Sorry, excuse me, she said, in hopes of coaxing him on his way. His turbulent green eyes left hers and took up residence over her shoulder. She okay? Oh, the mare, of course. Betsy let out a breath she didn't know she was holding and glanced behind her. I was about to get her some oats. I hope she'll be okay. She doesn't seem to be. It'll pass. Colt will see to it, he said, then turned and continued to the back of the barn and on through the employee's door, closing it behind him with a snap. She puffed out of breath, thinking about the rock of a man she'd just encountered and noticing how her own anger had seemed to roll along with him right out the door. She breathed a quiet breath and went in search of the oats. Once she returned and poured a portion of feed into the bucket hanging from the slats, she waited for Meg to devour them. She didn't. In fact, she didn't seem to be the same mare at all, like she'd gone from flighty filly to decrepit bag of bones in one short encounter. She'll be all right, came a deep voice from behind her. 
She twisted a bit to see Colt standing with his arms akimbo, scrutinizing Meg. Betsy tried to muster up her anger, but Trevor had managed to drain it. No thanks to your brother and Jimmy. Her voice was calm, long-suffering. Colt's gaze sought hers. His eyes were dark as indigo in the barn, almost the color of the horizon at dusk. They got their reprimand. He turned and headed for the other side of the barn. Where are you going? To get medical supplies. Oh, to fix her? Good. Where's Jimmy? Helping Brand relocate the stallion. Relocate? I thought you put him in the paddock. Colt came back with his hands full of supplies. No. Thought I'd send him further out for a while. Finally. A man with common sense, she thought with a quick grin. He must have seen the small gesture. I figure to give you a peace of mind. He let the grin broaden as her gaze rose from his busy hands to his face. That's kind of you. I'm sure Meg appreciates it, too. One side of his mouth twitched with humor. I'm sure she will. Let's get her fixed up. Colt started for the gate of the stall but stopped in front of Betsy. Here, hold these. She held out her hands, and he plopped the works in them. Juggling them in her arms, they started to slip away from her. She leapt forward and caught them between herself and Colt's stomach. He held firm while Betsy continued to press. When she looked up and their gazes caught, heat rose in her face. His gaze stroked over her face before coming back to her eyes. As intimate as a kiss... It reached all those closed-off places in her soul. Before he could find her secret hurts, she lowered her eyes to the bottles and bandages in her hands. I am, um, can't hold them all, Colt chuckled, deftly plucking them off his stomach and into one of his large hands. Let's take this a little slower. Start with the ointment. He handed her a jar off the tips of his long fingers, while still cradling the rest. She grasped it, then took over plucking the remainder from him and better organizing them in her arms before stepping back. There we go. I got him. But I don't think she needs an ointment. Why was her throat so dry? No broken skin? Not that I could see. He opened Meg's gate and slowly entered. Her nostrils flared on a panicked whinny as she pranced backwards until her rump hit the barn boards. I should have killed that stallion, Colt muttered under his breath, backing out of her space. You're going to have to do this. She doesn't want a male presence, apparently. Betsy made a grunt of disbelief. Nah, she's just spooked still. Trust me. It's more than that. She looked from Colt to Meg and back again. He was right. The mare was eyeing him as if he were a cougar ready to pounce. Drat. Would Meg be ruined? Would Betsy lose her opportunity to win at nationals? Dread filled her, closing her throat and nearly upending her stomach. Okay. Tell me what to do. Here. Give me the stuff. She piled it back into his hands. And get in close. Tell me what you see. But be careful. She's unpredictable right now. Betsy nodded, then slipped through the gate. Meg tossed her head, but otherwise didn't react to Betsy's presence. Easy, girl, she coaxed, then stepped closer. When Meg took one step toward her, Betsy sighed in relief. That's it, Colt said in a quiet voice. Give her a rub on her face before you begin. Betsy reached out carefully and touched Meg's nose. Her ears twitched back and forth, but otherwise she didn't move. Betsy rubbed up and down the length of her nose, then over her soft muzzle, relaxing the horse and herself. That's my girl. Now, slowly move to her side. She did. What do you see? Betsy's stomach churned as she reached up toward the bite. Meg sidestepped, but otherwise remained calm. Feels lumpy. No broken skin. She felt it carefully with her fingers. Swollen, for sure, but no. No gash. 
She's calming down. Your voice soothes her. Colt turned to take the medical supplies back where he found them, talking over his shoulder as he walked. I'll check the skin viability in the next few days. But she'll need at least a week before we can saddle her. Betsy removed herself from the stall and pressed a palm to her heart. A week? Criminy. She didn't have a week. She gave Colt a questioning gaze, trying to keep it from turning into a glare. Can we still work with her? Or will she be out of commission for that long? Let me call Warren, Doc Willows, and see what he says. Betsy rolled her top lip in, the desire to chew on it strong, but she only nodded. Both were silent on their walk to the house. By the glances she stole at Colt, he was deep in thought about whether to sell Meg to her or whether she could still train. She wanted Meg, had connected heart level with her. Still, she couldn't afford to buy her if she wasn't going to be the horse she could use next month. The deep sadness filled her as her aspirations tried to drift away on the breeze of crushed dreams. But she couldn't let them, wouldn't let them. Colt opened the back door and gestured for Betsy to enter first. Oh, no! Mom! Colt heard Rebecca cry out from the kitchen. Without ridding himself of his boots, he sprinted through the kitchen door. He slid on the shiny kitchen floor but caught himself on the stove before crashing into Rebecca. Rebecca's eyes were huge and glistening. He'll be okay, though, right? A pause to listen as her gaze caught Colt's. Good, good. I'll be there as soon as possible. Another silence. Oh, of course. I'll see if he can get away. Okay. See you Friday. Betsy had rounded the corner after a frantic colt and stood listening with him. Today was Wednesday. It sounded as if Rebecca would have to leave soon to wherever the person on the other end was. Colt grasped Rebecca's upper arm. What happened? Rebecca dropped the receiver. It clattered onto the floor as she threw her arms around Colt and clung to him. She sobbed, but it sounded like mostly from relief. It's dead. He's had an accident. Colt pushed Rebecca back to see her face. What kind of accident? He fell off the tractor onto the disc. Colt jolted at the news, clearly shocked. What kind of shape is he in? My God! Yes, we'll need to seek God. Rebecca glanced at Betsy warily. She was right to be wary. Her statement didn't sit well with Betsy, and it probably showed on her face. Because if God existed, he would never have left an abandoned daughter to be raised by a brutal woman-hater. He has a deep cut in his thigh but they got him to the hospital quickly, and they say he'll be all right. It's just... Oh, Colt! Rebecca put a hand on Colt's arm and gave him a watery, apologetic look. I'm afraid I'll have to leave again, and your dad is needed. You and Trevor have barely had us back, and now we have to go again. My dad has no one to speak of to run the farm, a handful of men is all, mostly temporary laborers. They're there for the harvest of the safflower seeds. Dad was nearly done disking the alfalfa fields and had planned to start the harvest in a few days. Now he needs cord to finish the disking and then oversee the harvest. And it all has to be done before the rains begin. Colt used a palm to smooth Rebecca's chestnut hair back from her face. So gentle, Betsy filled with envy. Don't you worry about us. We did fine when you were on your honeymoon. We can handle this. I'll help, Betsy piped up, then bit her tongue. She had no business offering her help. This wasn't her concern. And then there was Meg who needed tending and training. But she felt drawn to this family. That was it. They were a family. She'd never experienced a family in operation, 
This was what it looked like, felt like. They were concerned for each other, helped each other. She'd gotten caught up in it, wanted to be caught up in it. Colt swung around and stared at her as if he'd forgotten she was there. Yeah, she knew she was forgettable. Especially when someone as soft and feminine as Rebecca was near. Somehow, this time, the comparison hurt. Riley, thanks, but we've got this. Betsy's stomach clenched at the dismissal. She guessed that phone call to Dr. Willows wasn't going to happen now that the family had a crisis. A flicker of resentment replaced her desire to help. She nodded her understanding, retrieved the phone receiver from the floor where Rebecca had dropped it, and hung it up. Without glancing at either Colt or Rebecca, she dashed out of the house to the barn, and the only thing that was ever real in her world, a horse. Colt, go after her. Rebecca gave him a shove against his chest. Find her dad while you're out there. He glanced down at her hand, as if she'd just stabbed him, then back up at a grimace on her face. What? Why? Why find your dad? Or why go after Betsy? Why go after her? Rebecca started for the mudroom, stopped, and twirled back to him. Her hand came up to her forehead, as if confused about what to do next, her eyes wandering. Colt pulled her hand down from her face and gave it a squeeze. It'll be okay. We'll take care of the ranch. I'll find Dad. You go get packed. Rebecca's frantic eyes came back to Colt. You hurt her feelings. Can't you see that? He stared at the doorway to the mudroom as if it could give him answers. How? You treated her like she was in the way, when she just wanted to help. What are you talking about, Rebecca? I thanked her for her offer. It's you that needs the help right now. Rebecca tugged her hand from Colt's and scuttled back to the mudroom, returning with an armful of clean clothes. You thanked her like you do when one of your fans finally agrees to leave your sight, like you wanted her gone from your space. Colt scrubbed a hand up his cheek. She is one of those. Rebecca gasped, nearly dropping the clothes. What are you saying? You've lumped your client into the category of Colt's adorning females? I've seen how she looks at me. Though in retrospect, he hadn't seen that glazed-over look of adoration the others drenched him in. Rebecca plopped the clothes down on the table. You conceited little egotist. I had no idea you thought that way. All this time I thought you as the flawless old soul. Do you see all women that way? Did he? Mostly, he had to admit. He'd gotten so tired of being stalked at the ranch or followed around town that he pretty much saw them all the same way anymore. If he didn't, he'd find himself in trouble again. He'd learned that lesson good and well. He waited too long to answer. Rebecca huffed, gathering up the clean laundry again. As your friend, can I give you a little piece of advice? Do I have a choice? No. Don't you have some packing to do? She jerked, his words reminding her of her urgent task. Shoot. Yes. You'll find Cord? Send him in? Glad to have dodged that bullet, he nodded. He's out with Trevor, fixing the latest fence snipping. I'll find him. Send him to you. The blood drained from Rebecca's already pale skin. He winced. He hadn't meant to worry her on top of everything else. Maybe you should sit down, Muffin. Looks like you might fall down. Oh, Colt. The saboteur. We can't leave with all that going on. She pushed non-existent hair out of her face with her one free hand. Stop. Don't worry about the ranch. Go up and lie down for a bit. Though he knew she wouldn't. Before you pack. Go. This time he gave her a little push toward the swinging kitchen door. He sighed in relief when she went willing. 
Could things get any worse around here? And how Rebecca saw him as an egomaniac because he thought of all women as intruders. Well, she didn't know. Hadn't had to live in his skin. As if to be proven right, he heard the sound of a vehicle pulling up in front of the house. A quick glance out of the kitchen window revealed Sherry, a short but shapely blonde who couldn't seem to leave him alone since the day they'd met. He'd been at the feed store a few weeks back when she and her father, a potential buyer then, and the proud owner of now one of Colt's mares, had stopped him next to the leather tack. The stallion's halter needed repair, and it should have been a quick fix. The little pixie had flirted shamelessly with him in front of her father until the dang store closed, frustrating Colt to no end. Now she still had a broken halter and a good reason to never want to leave the ranch again. To make matters worse, she'd since tracked him down, found him in his own barn, minding his own business, and landed a kiss right on his mouth. He still hadn't heard the end of it from Bronk, who caught him with her arms locked around his neck and trying to wedge her off. But to Bronk, it had looked as if they were locked in a hot embrace. Gad, what he wouldn't do to be left the heck alone. His mind drifted away from Sherry to Riley and Rebecca's comment about how he'd misjudged her. Rebecca was right. Riley hadn't flirted with him beyond her initial wide-eyed perusal, which he assumed would be followed up with more interest. It hadn't. So maybe he had actually come across a woman whose sole purpose for buying a horse from him was to buy a horse. That'd be a first, and a refreshing change, and maybe the reason he'd been struggling with his own attraction to her. While speculating about Riley, he'd donned his boots, coat, and hat, and was treading toward the white Ford Falcon sitting in the drive, with the blonde creature rising from the driver's seat like a siren from the sea. When her eyes landed on Colt, she flipped her hair to one side. The silken curls blew away in the chilly September breeze. A coy look followed, and Colt wanted to swear. He squashed his hat lower on his head, trying to beat down his irritation before he got to her. But it didn't work. He would have to draw from his good guy reserves to even manage a conversation with her. Howdy, Sherry. Her squealed hello scraped against his nerves, number one on the list of male loathings. Oh, aren't you the handsome one today, Colt? He tried to smile, but mostly grimaced. What brings you out? She wiggled up to him in a stylish white coat and boots that matched her new car. She came so close, she had to tilt her head back to look into his face. Oh, my! I'd forgotten how tall you are! She giggled, and he added the sound to his list. I came to show you my new falcon. Isn't it a dream? He gave it a once-over. Yep, nice car. First of its kind. Oh, <laughs> you are so smart! She grabbed his arm and dragged him closer to it. Want a driver? Sorry. Got work to do. He slipped her hand from his arm and, as slick as you please, slid her back in behind the wheel. She pouted up at him. He badly wanted to roll his eyes, but couldn't entirely be rude enough to do it. Nice to see you. Probably see you in town sometime, he said, in hopes of discouraging her from coming out again. Oh, that would be divine. How about... Colt closed the door on her words slowly so as not to catch her coat in it and gave it a thrust until it clicked. He gave her a wave and then strode off toward the barn, purposefully not looking back. When he heard the hum of her engine and the spin of tires, he let out a sigh of relief, jogging the rest of the way to the barn. Why didn't his brothers have this same problem? He'd have to ask them their secret. Upon entering the barn, the sound of crooning hit his ears, Riley soothing the mare. As he drew closer, the tone of her voice smoothed away his irritation, one tense muscle at a time. By the time he reached her, he longed for more of the same. 
She calming down? I'm worried. The bruise is bad, but I think she'll heal from that all the same. It's how traumatized she seems to be. Riley looked over at him, a deep crease between her dark strawberry brows, her unusually fiery green eyes now dull with worry. What happened to the show-off she was just this morning? Her voice caught. Colt nodded, then came closer to run a hand down the mare's face. She reared back and shook her head. Is she like that with the rest of the men, or just me? She reacted to your dad the same way a few minutes ago, Riley said. Her shoulders slumped. Colt shook his head torn between Riley's worry and Rebecca's need. Where's my dad now? Riley swung around and pointed to the employee's kitchen door. He went through there, said he's giving your brother Clay a call. Guess he had a horse that was in worse shape than Meg after a similar mating. Whatever Clay did, your dad said it worked. The mare snapped out of her egla. Colt lifted his brow. Egla? Oh, sorry. Fear. Fright. I see. Keep soothing her with your words. Seems to be working. I have to talk to Dad. I'll be back. Riley swallowed, then nodded. Colt trod to the back door and let himself into the noisy employee's kitchen. Stogie and Willie sported matching food speckled aprons around their waists and were at the stove cooking up something that smelled like heaven. His dad was talking to one of the cowhands, his back to the door. Before Colt could head in his direction, Eddie caught sight of him and swung around to head him off. Bobby was close on his heels. Hey, boss, can I have a word? Colt stopped, waited. He wondered why they hadn't approached his dad with whatever this was, but guessed Colt was the one who could sift through their crap easiest. He gave Eddie a nod to speak. Eddie leaned in. Maybe somewhere private-like? The thing is, Bobby took over for Eddie, Sam tells us it's me and Eddie's turn to muck out the stalls. Is it? Colt said. Bobby looked over at Eddie. Eddie stared at Bobby for a few seconds, then turned back to Colt. We done it last. Colt rubbed the back of his neck. When was that, Eddie? Last week, I think. Which is before R.J. and Sam, wasn't it? Um, Eddie said. You see, I think, Bobby started. Your turn, fellas. Just that simple. Bobby glared at Colt while Eddie glared at Bobby, but they finally both wandered off. Colt spotted his dad still talking at the back and made a beeline for him. Once at his side, Colt peered into his dad's face. He kept his voice low. Need to talk to you. His dad turned toward Colt and smiled, then slapped him on the shoulder. Of course, son. Let's go out back. Hey, Daddy-o, Bronx said, wedging himself between his dad and Colt. Been meaning to ask you. You feeling your age now since your honeymoon? Is Rebecca sorry she... Colt gave Bronk a full-body shove, sending the boy into a group of mingling cowboys. Silverware and plates clanged together but didn't drop. Oh, what the heck, Colt? Bronx started toward him, but the cowpokes with free hands held him back. It's time you learn to keep your trap shut, Colt hollered, rendering Bronx speechless. It was rare Colt ever snapped at anyone, but a certain redhead had somehow spurred new emotions in him, and they were materializing in all kinds of ways. He winced as he realized Bronk wasn't the only one with his mouth hanging open. Cord took Colt's arm and turned him toward the back door, giving his youngest son the fatherly glare that kept Bronk in his place. Once they were out of the door with it effectively closed behind them, Cord turned to Colt. "'What's got you so upset?' he said, concern written all over his face. "'Rebecca got a call from her mother.' Her dad fell from his tractor onto a disc. Cord's eyes went wide. 
he took off around the side of the barn and toward the house. Wait, Dad! Colt was sprinting after him. Cord slowed, half turned. He's in the hospital. He's going to be okay. Cord grimaced. Thank God. Is my wife okay? Cord continued toward the house. Colt's long strides kept up. Upset, of course. She's packing for you both. Her dad needs help on the farm. Safflower harvest is upon them. I figured. His dad turned his head toward him as he walked. I'm definitely calling Clay. He said he had a break coming up this fall. Maybe he can take it now. Help you and Trev run the ranch. Help the mayor, too. Colt ground his teeth at the thought of Clay on the ranch, but said, It'll be good to see him. Cord glanced his way. You sure about that? No, was all he managed. Cord nodded sadly, then reached for the mudroom's door. Dad, Cord stopped, his hand on the knob. Be careful. Watch that dang disc, will you? And ignore Bronx razzing. He loves to get a rise out of you. Out of anyone. Cord shook his head. I need some time to work with him. He's got some serious issues. Maybe we should take him with us. Split the twins up for a bit. The way he's been, you sure wouldn't miss him. How would Rebecca feel about that? His dad's eyes softened, and a big, glorious smile filled his face. It was good to see his dad smile. Colt wasn't sure he ever had before Rebecca. Not this way. She'll be good with whatever's needed. That woman is a jewel. One I don't deserve. Send Bronk in. You do deserve her, Dad. And she you, Colt said, and reached out for a quick, hearty hug before turning back to the barn. Be safe. Keep us posted, he hollered over his shoulder before turning back and trotting to the barn. Colt returned the way he had come out, through the back door of the barn. Once inside, he saw Bronx sitting by himself in the corner, his arms resting across his thighs, his eyes still glittering with anger when they caught his. Dad wants you up at the house, Colt said to him. Bronk groaned but didn't hesitate. As quick-tempered as he was, he never went against his dad, or Trevor, or him. Colt followed him out of the barn, almost smiling at how Bronk would react to Dad's plan for him. Separating the twins was a good idea. Having Bronk out of his and Trevor's hair for a few weeks made him breathe a little easier. Colt rounded the corner to the barn door and headed toward Meg's stall and a troubled Riley. He grimaced. They both looked terrible, sullen, dejected, beaten down. Hey, sweet girl, he whispered to Meg, his hand extended palm up over the stall door, slowly. Meg turned away. It's like she was raped, Riley said in a woeful voice. Have you ever seen a horse act like this before? Colt faced Riley inside. No, I haven't. But Clay has. We'll see what he has to say when he gets here. Riley peered up at him, her eyes misted over, resembling dew on new grass. He'd never seen anything more sad or more beautiful in his life. How could a woman who dressed and acted like a man and compete in a man's world look so soft and touchable? His fingertips itched to trace each freckle over the silken skin of her face. It shook him, those thoughts. Riley seemed equally unnerved, locked as she was in his gaze. Colt took a step toward her. Was this your idea? The sound of Bronk's angry voice made him jump and back the step he'd just taken. He frowned, looking Bronk's way as his brother tramped forward. Was what my idea? Dad, taking me with him to California. It wasn't Trevor. It was you, wasn't it? Once Bronk reached Meg's stall, he squeezed between Riley and Colt as if he had every right to be there. 
Wish it was, Colt said, using one forearm to push the belligerent kid out of his space. Bronk pushed back, and Colt wondered if he'd have to get physical with the boy. Mindful of Meg's skittish state of mind, he grabbed Bronk by the front of his shirt, hoisted him to his toes, and pushed him a good ten paces away from the stall. Settle down. It was Dad's idea to take you along. Be thankful you've been invited to go, and you're not being left behind to run this place. Colt threw him off, and his brother stumbled before he snapped to a standstill. Bronk gaped, surprised not by the shove, but by Colt's admission. Colt was surprised by it, too. Now get your butt out of here and go get packed. Behave yourself for Dad and Rebecca and help. Colt gave him another push, a little harder than he'd had intended, more than a little rattled by his own words. After Bronx slinked off submissively, Colt glanced back to Riley. She also looked surprised, yet admiringly so. That frustrated Colt. He didn't like getting after his brothers, and he sure as heck didn't want to be admired for it. Sorry you had to see that. I'm not usually that short with him. Riley snorted a breath. Hmm. <laughs> Don't be silly. It obviously worked. I thought you handled it quite well. Put him in his place. Made him realize the work he'll be missing. The honor of being asked to go. The time he'll get to spend with his da. She eyed him, waited for a reaction he didn't plan to give her. Her smile was slight and pathetic, twisting his heart. Then, with a big smile, she said, All added with just the right touch of Big Brother Gruff. It was perfect. Colt listened with glazed-eyed adoration, stunned by her praise. Right then, Jimmy and Bran came strolling through the barn door. Hey there! Got the stallion put up in the... Jimmy glanced quizzically at Bran. Southwest pasture. He looked happy to be there. Has lots of grass. We left him munching away. Jimmy glanced at Meg and frowned. She's not any better. Riley closed the distance to Jimmy and lowered her voice. No, we need to figure out what to do with her, or we'll have to find another horse. It's too late for that, Red. She's the one. I want her to be the one, but what if she doesn't recover fast enough? Colt listened to every word Jimmy and Riley said and felt terrible. It had already been too late for Riley to find another champion the moment she'd driven onto their property. One month was hardly enough time to train a horse for anything, let alone to maneuver around barrels at high speed to win the most prestigious award for women in rodeo. Clay would know what to do to help Meg, though the thought soured his stomach. Rodeo had been Clay's love at one time. It had been the main reason Clay's marriage had fallen apart. Gone too many weeks in a row, his wife wondering if he was hooking up with buckle bunnies and worrying he wouldn't make it back in one piece from a crazy bucking bronc. She'd refused to travel with him, and the strain had been too much, especially when Clay started to have his own suspicions about her, which was ridiculous. But by then, it hardly mattered. When he came home the last time, there had been no marriage left to repair. And that was then, and this is now. Fact was, Clay knew every aspect of rodeo, even barrel racing. Add the experience he'd had with his own mare and an errant stallion where his mare had been boarded at the time, and Clay was the perfect person to help Riley achieve her most important goal. Colt's gut pinched with old battles and insecurities. How could he stand by and watch his brother help Riley with her most significant dream? His tough, daredevil, single brother. Chapter 10 Colt stood on the tarmac at Gillette Campbell County Airport, watching a gleaming, low-winged, single-engine airplane lower its wheels and adjust its flaps for approach. Clay hadn't mentioned what he'd be arriving in, but Colt figured this had to be him. 
No one else had flown in yet today. Colt rubbed his eyes with a thumb and forefinger, grumbling at how he had to leave the ranch at 5 a.m. this morning for the hour-plus trip to Gillette, only to find himself waiting another hour past the supposed 6 a.m. arrival. If this wasn't Clay, the patience Colt was known for would gallop off and good old Clay would have to hitchhike to the bar six. Probably suit Clay just fine, crazy as he was. Of course, Colt grumbled to himself. He would never do that. But ever since the talk of Clay helping Riley with her horse problems, his stomach had yet to settle down. A gust of wind pushed the aircraft a bit, but whoever was flying corrected easily enough and touched down with a small screech of rubber against the asphalt. Now the piper was taxiing straight toward him. Colt sighed out an agitated breath. It better be Clay. Without stopping next to Colt, the Piper Comanche breezed past him and into an open hangar to park. Colt followed and watched as a large man ducked his head and emerged through the passenger door. He shut and locked the door before negotiating the small walkway down the side of the aircraft in signature cowboy boots Colt would recognize anywhere, then jumped to the ground. By then, Colt was upon him with a hand outstretched. Clay straightened to full height and stared at Colt's hand. After a long pause, his gaze came up. Colt? The moment Clay grasped Colt's hand, Colt pulled him in close for a brotherly hug. Their broad chests banged together before a quick pat on each other's backs. Awkward, but tolerable. When Colt dropped Clay's hand, he moved past him to the glistening white aircraft with bronze and black trim. Yours? Clay's mouth tipped up slightly. Yep. Well, I'm in the wrong business, Colt said, shaking his head and smiling for the first time. Clay pinned him with those eyes, the same green color as their baby brothers. Smoke jumping is not something you could do. Button pushed. Colt grimaced. And so it began. And what makes you think not? You think of yourself as a good guy. Good guys finish last. Colt felt the familiar ire rise. Seems to me finishing last in your trade is the honorable thing to do, little brother. A muscle in Clay's jaw bulged, but he didn't say anything back, just held Colt's gaze. Colt cursed under his breath. They hadn't seen each other in years, and yet Clay's arrogance was already drilling under his skin. He wondered when the conversation would start up again. Come on, Colt slapped Clay on the back to move him in the direction of his old Ford truck. Everyone's looking forward to seeing you. Everyone who? Funny. That was spot on. Try and behave yourself while you're here, will you? Jeez, he just got rid of Bronk for a few weeks. He'd forgotten just how much alike Clay and Bronk were, but Clay was older than Bronk. Maybe a little maturity would show up. What was the real reason Dad had invited Clay home? It probably had more to do with his sire's desire to reconnect with his sons than how helpful Clay would actually want to be. Gad. He hoped he was wrong. They didn't need another complication on the ranch. Betsy walked Meg around the corral. So slowly, Betsy figured if she were to stop, she'd never get the mare going again. The sound of tires crunching against the gravel at the front of the big house caught her attention. A glance in that direction had her peering through gate slats at two men exiting Colt's truck. Grabbing gear out of the bed, then thundering one after the other up the walkway. From this distance, she recognized Colt's clothes. The larger man following him had to be Clay. Her heart leapt in excitement over Clay being here. Maybe he could think outside the box, because nothing inside the box had worked so far. She pulled the mare behind her and opened the gate to head out. Jimmy skidded up to her, bouncing with excitement. I think Clay just got here. At least that's Colt's truck in front of the house, isn't it? Where are you going? They're here. 
I saw them walk up to the house with Clay's things. I'm not waiting. I'm taking Meg up to the house. What? No. Take her back to the corral. You're always so danged impatient, Red. The mare reared at Jimmy's raising voice. Whoa, easy, girl. She soothed as she pulled her down and stroked her face. Stop yelling around here, Jimmy, she whispered, taking a few minutes to calm her. Jimmy looked apologetic, but opened the gate for Betsy to take Meg back into the corral. Betsy complied, her anger on a slow simmer. At Jimmy for his brainlessness, at Colt for his ineptitude, at Meg for abandoning her so close to her goal. Once back in the arena, she spun to Meg, who reared and squealed and tossed her head to get away. It was then Betsy realized she'd been tugging roughly on the lead as she stomped. She nearly crumpled into tears, allowing the rope to spool through her hand until Meg felt she gained a safe distance again. I'm so, so sorry, girl, Betsy choked out. Brainless was right. She closed her eyes, let the guilt of her thoughts wring her limp, and slowly eased her way toward Meg again. She stroked Meg's neck and chest and leaned into the mare's warm shoulder. Oh, Jimmy, do you think Meg will ever come back to herself? She will. A low voice resonated in her ears. Betsy swung her gaze to the gate and the large man, Clay, she assumed, striding toward her in full cowboy garb and hat. No coat in spite of the chilly day. As he came closer, she tilted her head up to look at his face and was dumbfounded by yet another striking Cooper male. Sharp, rugged features pleasing to the eye, swirling pine-green eyes, hair the color of the buckskin stallion. No smile, but equally as attractive as his brother's. All except Colt, who, as far as Betsy was concerned, surpassed his brothers by leaps and bound. Because Colt's handsomeness encompassed more than good looks. He was the only man to reach past her walls to tap at her heart and unsettle her at every turn. One glance showed her that Blue Eyes was pulling the gate closed behind him and latching it. A flush rose swiftly both at seeing the man and at remembering they'd left the gate open. Colt strode toward them in that swagger of his with his gaze pinned to hers. Her face heated more at his intense look, until it dawned on her he probably meant to reprimand her even in front of his brother for not closing the gate. She was happily surprised when he reached them and didn't say a word. Her da would have taken full advantage of a chance to embarrass her in front of other people. Her heart swelled in appreciation that Colt was not the same kind of man her da was. Still, seeing Colt again gave her a swift reminder. She had to double her guard against the towering blue-eyed hulk who could distract her from what mattered most. She shook her head, trying to get her brain back on track. You must be Clay. I'm Betsy Murphy, she said, sticking her hand out for a shake. Clay stepped forward and swallowed her hand in a massive paw. Clayton Cooper, ma'am. He used his free hand to tip his hat. Clayton, okay. Can you help me with my horse? She probably should have started with the weather, himself or his job, anything but jumping right in. Oh, I'm sorry. I should have asked if Colt filled you in. Clayton gave a quick nod. Let's have a look-see. Take her around. He gestured to the perimeter. Finally, a man after her own heart, so to speak. Betsy was thrilled by the immediate response and turned Meg toward the fence line. Meg practically glued her nose to the back of Betsy's head. Once they made one lap slowly around the corral, she turned them back to the men at the center. Clayton slowly glided forward to assess the horse. Meg sidestepped, trying to scoot around Betsy. She's avoiding everyone but Riley. Mostly men, Colt said, joining his brother. Who's Riley? Colt rolled his eyes and jerked his head toward her. Everyone calls her Betsy. But you, Clayton said. But me. 
Clayton pressed his lips out and nodded. Sounds about right. Betsy'd wondered what that meant, but ignored it, needing Clayton to concentrate on Meg. Was she like this before? Clayton asked. No, Betsy said. She was full of life, a regular peacock, prancing and running the corral to the point we all wondered if there was something wrong with her, until Jake told us she was just showing off and would be perfect for barrel racing. Can you fix her? Clayton snorted a sort of laugh, the first sign of amusement she'd seen from the expressionless man. If she'll let me near her, most likely I'll have to walk you through how to fix her. Clayton stood behind Betsy and reached the back of his hand around her for the mare to sniff him. Meg danced out of the way. You see, it'll be faster if only you work with her. You ready to start? Surprise and delight had her shining her warmest smile at Clayton. He didn't smile back. Thank you, thank you, she said, bouncing a little. Finally, someone wanted to get going. Out of the corner of her eye, she saw a scowl over Colt's face and wondered at the cause, that he didn't get along with his brother or that he didn't agree with him. Why don't we start tomorrow, Colt said, his gaze never shifting from Clayton. Give her another day to recover from the bruise before you work her. Give you a chance to rest up from your trip. A sound of disagreement blustered out of Clayton and Betsy at the same time, dipping Colt's brows even lower. You always were the cautious one, brother. Betsy here doesn't have time to waste. Isn't that right, Texas? Clayton turned to her. Ah, another nickname. This one she liked. She warmed at the fact Colt must have told him about her. That's right. I have less than a month to train her to barrel race and be good at it. Clayton's expression was cautious. You have a shot? I've earned nationals. I have a good chance at winning, or at least I did, on Pearl. Thinking of her injured horse back home gave her a lump in her throat. He'd hoped her da heeded her request to take special care of her horse, but knew in her heart he likely hadn't. She could only hope his foreman was more obliging. What happened to Pearl? She slid into a barrel, took the brunt of the fall on her shoulder, and she was out of the running, just like that. Betsy reached up and split her ponytail, pulling it in different directions, a habit she'd done since she was a kid when she was stressed or were about to compete. It made a mess of her hair, but cinched her ponytail tight, helping to get her head in the game. Sorry to hear. She'll be all right. She had to be. She wished she could do more than hope. But for now, I've got to win. Clayton nodded in understanding. At least someone here got her need to win. Colt's brother was going to be an ally. She was grateful for that. Let's start then. I haven't decided to sell her to Riley yet. Keep that in mind. Colt said, giving her a pointed look which felt more threatening than anything. Betsy glared at Colt and took a step toward him, the fire returning. What are you talking about? Am I going to train her? Then you don't give her to me? That's not going to work, Colt. Sell her to me now. What are you waiting for? Easy now, Red, Jimmy said, jumping in with a hand on her shoulder. She threw it off not ready for Jimmy's usual calming touch. No, don't try and talk me out of this, Jimmy. Hang on there, Clayton piped in. Are you telling me you haven't sold this filly to her yet? Clayton's glare tangled with Colt's. Not that it's any of your business. He didn't know why he said that since Clayton had been asked to come help. But no, I haven't. And I'm not going to until I know she'll be a good fit for her. Clayton looked appalled. What do you care? Sell her. Colt pressed his lips together, clearly debating his next words. A word, please. Clayton puffed up, looking ready to argue again, but glanced at Betsy, then relented. Turning back to Betsy, he said, Take her off the lead. 
Get her feet moving any way you can. Round the corral backward if you have to. Just get her moving. Why? Are you going to question everything I suggest? Clayton's eyes narrowed. She wondered what could have happened to put that permanent scowl on his face. She shook her head. No. Looking somewhat apologetic, but not quite, he sighed. You want her to use her brain, not react. It'll get her mind off her fears, make her formulate thought again. Just do it. Okay, she said, wanting to give him a bit of Irish temper, but turned back to the mare instead. Clayton moved off with Colt toward the barn, a yard apart, crass words exchanged. She watched them for a moment, both rugged and formidable, verbally push against one another. Betsy recognized old wars when she saw them. She had her own ravines dug deep within her from conflicts with her da. Something had put these two at odds with each other, or mayhap just with life itself. Whatever was riding these men, she hoped they'd get it resolved, or at least not get in the way of her own goals. She was running out of time. Chapter 11 Two days, two whole days, in the corral with a sullen mare, and Betsy was about to lose her mind. Each day that passed meant another day closer to the contest of her life, and yet no closer to being ready for it. Colt and Clayton remained off balance with one another. Although Colt had backed off and let Clayton handle the mare's recovery, it seemed to Betsy herself that Colt didn't like Clayton handling. Clayton was unsympathetic with anything he expected her to do, just like the treatment she was used to from her da. Whereas Colt was forever the gentleman, expecting Clayton to take care of her needs as well as the mare's. Not used to that, the more Colt tried to take care of Betsy, the angrier she got. When was he going to realize she was used to being treated like one of the men, like an equal? Move in front of her drive line. Get her to turn the other way. They'd been at this since sunrise this morning, in the frigid Wyoming air, and Betsy hadn't gotten anywhere yet, other than numb fingers and a red nose. She shivered every time she looked at Clayton minus a coat. How could he stand the cold? Betsy moved forward, trying to do what Clayton asked, but Meg skirted round her and kept going the same way. Again! Now! Clayton barked from the other side of the gate. Between Meg's stubbornness and Clayton's demands, Betsy wanted to swear a blue streak. Would she ever make real progress? Betsy tried again to move in front of Meg, this time the horse reared, cut across the middle, and parked herself in the farthest corner of the corral. "'Back off, Clay. She's doing the best she can,' Colt hollered. Betsy glanced the direction of the gate and saw Colt coming up the side of the barn toward Clayton. "'Don't you have something better to do, big brother?' Clayton snarked back. "'That mare has no respect for her. She has to gain that or nothing will change.' Meg had made some progress, Betsy wanted to argue, but kept her mouth shut. Meg had at least stopped hanging her head and now galloped instead of shuffled. However, she was a long way from ready to ride, let alone train with barrels. Clayton was right about that. The rumble of a revved engine brought her attention to the puff of dust circling behind the men's backs. Colt twisted looking ready to give someone a dressing down, with hands fisted and spine stiff. This side of him surprised her. She was more used to the calm, collected man she'd come to recognize him as. Betsy'd wondered if it was another woman looking for the blue-eyed Cooper. In the last few days, she'd overheard the ranch hands talk of Colt and his many female admirers, and that he wasn't happy about them. Betsy rolled her shoulders back, surprised to find her tension mirroring Colt's. Ridiculous. What did she care? One look at Clayton told her that man didn't. Besides, if Clayton ever ran into the same parade of admirers and didn't want them, Betsy had no doubt he'd be a tactless pig about it. Colt would never treat a woman that way. And something stirred inside her at his innate kindness. 
She was in awe of how different he was from his brothers. "'What are you trying to do, Jenny? Run us down? I've warned you about this too many times.' Colt hollered loud enough for every person on the ranch to hear. Well, perhaps she was wrong about what to expect from Colt, though she couldn't blame him. Pay attention, Clayton snarled at Betsy from his position outside the corral. You're never going to get that horse trained by standing around gawking at my brother. Heat rose fast and full into her face. Knowing her face was now fire engine red, fury followed. How dare he embarrass her like that? She hadn't been gawking at Colt. Though she had noticed how curious she was about the little blonde exiting her car. When she caught a good look at her face, she recognized her from that first day on the Bar 6. So, Jenny was a repeat fan of Colt's, or stalker by the way Colt was acting. Betsy felt the pull of curiosity and a new emotion. Jealousy. Why would she be jealous? Colt didn't belong to her, and it didn't look like Jenny did either. Get that filly moving, Texas! Betsy's eyes shifted from Colt to Clayton in one minor move, and she bit her tongue, wanting to give Clayton a return lashing, but knowing she couldn't. Clayton was her only chance at redeeming a damaged mare and making her into a champion. Instead, she jogged toward Meg slowing when she got near her. Meg snorted and glanced over one shoulder at Betsy. Come on, girl. You're going to get us both in trouble. Let's go, okay? You got one more shot at this before I come in there, and you'll neither one like it, Clayton hollered. Fine, she yelled back, making Meg jump and pin her ears back. Oh, shoot, that wasn't good, and she was standing too close. Backing away quickly, she dodged a double-barreled buck in a near collision with Meg's shoulder as the mare pivoted to gallop to the other side of the corral. Cack! Out of the corner of her eye, she saw Colt twirl away from Jenny and scale the fence in two seconds flat. He came running to her. To reprimand her for language? Then she realized she'd cursed in Irish. He wouldn't know the word. Or would he? As smooth as you please, he scooped an arm around her waist and pulled her close. He ducked down to look her in the eye from under his hat rim. Are you okay? That handsome face riddled with concern, and those sharp eyes reaching deep into her soul, and she was instantly not okay. No one concerned themselves with her, or mayhap Jimmy at times, but mostly he was missing when she truly needed help, like now. Never anyone else, especially not her da. She was expected to hold her own, no matter what. So that's what she did. This, she didn't know what to do with this. In a panic, she slid a hand up to the hard muscle at his chest and shoved him away. Stumbling back two steps, shock replaced the concern on his features. His hands came up in surrender. Easy now, just seeing if you're okay. Did Meg hurt you? Bessie jerked her gaze up to his. What? No, no, she just ran past me. I'll take it from here, Clayton said, surprising them both. Colt scowled at his brother. For sneaking up on them? Or was it his words Colt didn't like? No, I can handle her, just... Give her a moment, Betsy pleaded. You're losing ground, little lady. That mare has learned you aren't going to demand a thing from her, Clayton said. Betsy turned entirely to face Clayton, hands planted on her hips. She's been injured. We have to go easy. Typical woman. Clayton yanked off his hat, ran his long fingers through hair several shades lighter than Colt's, then jammed the hat back on his head. He puffed an exaggerated sigh. Listen, if we're going to let her out with a bunch of wild horses, right now, what do you think would happen? Betsy felt a frown coming on. What did that matter? Well, I suppose she'd find her way within the herd. Find her way? How? She rolled her eyes. 
I don't know. They have a pecking order. She'd have to find her spot, I guess. Clayton gave her a small poke on her shoulder. Exactly, Texas. She'd have to find her pecking order. Right now, how do you see her pecking order? Betsy wanted to smack the smug look off Clayton's face. She was beginning to appreciate Colt's gentlemanly behavior more by the minute as he stood quietly for his brother's words. She knew he didn't get along with Clayton, realized he might not even agree, but he kept his mouth shut, something Clayton didn't seem to do. Something she didn't do often enough either. Pecking order? I'll give him pecking order. Me, then Colt, then all the other cowhands, then Clayton. What would he think of that? It's just her. Clayton grunted at his disapproval. And you. And Colt and me. Oh. In that case, I'm number one, and she's number two. You two aren't even involved. Wrong. The minute Colt or I get near her, she'll soon realize we are one and two. She is three, and you're four. If there were other horses or people in the corral, you'd slip down the list accordingly. Get it? Betsy turned and stomped off three steps, then twisted back and retraced her steps. Are you saying I have no control over her at all? That's exactly what I'm saying. She doesn't respect you, Texas. She sees you as a lapdog. He was raising his voice, and so could she. What the hell? She shot a glance at Colt and changed her word. Heck are you talking about? You're a pet. She likes you, wants to hang out with you, will never obey you. Betsy couldn't stop her jaw from dropping open. How dare he? She wanted to run right over the top of him with spiteful words right back. But as she gaped at him, trying to put together those words, she realized he might be right. She did the only thing she could think of to put her mind at ease. She turned to Colt. Is he right? Colt's mild manners reached deep inside and stroked her ruffled feathers back into place, just by his sweet expression. Right so, Ryle, he said and nodded. As flustered as she was, the new nickname didn't escape her. Did he use Ryle because she was riled? A lot? Colt's dear face was peppered with sympathy. Betsy felt the wrath that had built throughout the morning drain right off her. Right up until the person they'd all forgotten about raised her shrill voice. Colt, can I have a word, please? Jenny had practically draped herself over the gate to get his attention. Colt muttered something profane under his breath, shoving his hat deeper onto his head, then turned toward the gate. Betsy felt sorry for him. Of course, the more she got to know Colt, the more she was beginning to understand the draw. He wasn't just fine-looking. His honor was flawless, and his character ran deep. He was the real deal, and nothing could be more attractive. She watched him walk away, enjoying the picture he made with all that lean muscle and masculine appeal, feeling that pinch of jealousy that Jenny would have his attention. Gonna gawk at my brother some more, or are you ready to get to work? Clayton said at her side. On the other hand, Clayton Cooper rubbed her in all the wrong ways. She bit back a groan and barely managed to lasso her temper. What do I need to do? What can I do for you, Jenny? Colt said glancing back at Riley with his brother, wanting to grind his teeth in frustration. Why had Dad asked Clay to come home? He'd never been a rancher. Not because he couldn't handle the work, but because he couldn't stay focused. Daring feats had always called his name, and his willingness to risk his own life still angered Colt. He didn't know much about God, but he had great respect for the Almighty and Colt knew his creation had to be precious to him. It never made sense to him why anyone would risk his life for no purpose. Now, at least, Clay risked his life to save others as a smoke jumper. 
But that didn't erase the past. At least that's what Colt assumed. Maybe Clay had changed, but so far he hadn't seen much of it. The same overbearing demeanor was there in full force, and Riley was taking the brunt of it. Ahem, Jenny said. Do you think you can tear your eyes off Carrot Top over there and have a conversation with me? Knowing Riley hated that term was pepper sauce on an open wound. Colt had to clench his jaw to keep from jumping down her throat. Why are you here, Jenny? Colt looked her over, from the tight blonde curls pulled back on one side with a sparkly diamond clip to the three-inch heels that were useless on the ranch. She was a cute little thing, which was why he'd been interested in her in high school. But daily ranch work had forced him to grow up faster than his years, and Jenny seemed stuck in adolescence. Now the yawning difference was more noticeable each time he saw her. What she needed were some responsibilities. That would change her in a red-hot minute. He knew that firsthand. I'm going to be in a fashion show this Saturday. I thought you might want to come. Colt's eyes widened all on their own, but he stopped the grimace before it landed. He didn't want to do something he'd have to apologize for. Keeping his voice even, he said, You thought I'd go to a fashion show? Did he seem like a pansy to her? Did Riley think of him that way, too? He shook his head, didn't know why his mind took him there. Oh, she laughed. <laughs> I should tell you, it's for charity, and it's not just women's clothing. There will be men there, too. In fact, she cleared her throat. <clears> throat> um, well, you see... <clears throat> she cleared her throat again. I, um, I kind of volunteered you to be a model for it. Wrath eclipsed his confusion. You what? Now hear me out, Colt, before you split a gusset. He was about to split something all right. At least he hadn't had an audience for this. He'd never hear the end of it from the fellas. I think you should leave, Jenny. She backed away as he moved forward. Um, you see, they really need men to do this, and there aren't many... Is that right? Not many, you say? Well, fancy that. He kept moving forward. She kept backing until she clunked into her car door. Colt grasped her arm before she could whisk it away, pulled her away from the car to open the door, and scooted her on into it. Colt, listen. The clothes are rugged ranch clothes, cowboy hats and boots, things that already look great on you. You'll be fine. If you think I would seriously consider this, then you don't know me at all, Jenny Renford. Have a nice day. He slammed the door. But of course, it was a convertible, so she continued talking. The charity is for something the town has wanted to get behind for a long time. Rescues, Colt. Animal rescues. I know that's a passion of yours. Colt froze, with his hand still resting on her door. He stared into her face. She'd paid attention to something of importance to him? And since when did this girl get involved in things that mattered? There's more. They want you to handle the rescues. The horses, at least. Colt straightened, still staring down at her, so stunned he couldn't speak. She must have seen the crack in his resolve. A huge smile spread across her face. I knew you'd do it. I told them you would. Those words snapped him out of it. Told who? She looked smug. Well, the mayor, of course. Now he was back to furious. Why would you volunteer me for anything, Jenny? You're not my wife. Not that I'd let my wife do that either. I'm your girl, Colt. She is? Came the voice of Riley from behind him. Dread slipped into his gut and burned like a molten lump of lead. He swiveled his head toward Riley and hoped he wore the truth on his face. No, he said. Yes, Jenny said at the same time. Riley opened the gate and walked the mare through. 
Cold eyed them closely. Both of them looked like they'd been pulled backward through a knot hole. Riley took two steps toward Colt, but remembered herself and turned back to latch the gate. Then she proceeded cautiously toward him again. I didn't... I didn't know. Not that it's any of my business. No, it's not your business, Jenny said in a snit. And Colt and I are not done with ours, so if you don't mind... Riley looked shocked, but not put off. Nothing seemed to knock this girl off her feet. It took a few seconds, but she finally wrenched her glare from Jenny and back to him. Her expression softened. I'll just put Meg away for now. We have worked her hard in the last little bit. Clayton says we need to not overdo it. We'll start again after lunch. Where do you want me to put her? Colt scanned her face for a reaction to what she'd heard. He saw nothing there. Make sure it's a stall far away from where the stallion was. The one you had her in was fine. Rub her down. I'll be right in. Just give me a minute. She waved him off. Take all the time you need with your girlfriend. He could have sworn he heard a grunt as she turned and pulled the horse behind her. Toes curling in his boots, he fought the impulse to go after her and explain his history with Jenny. And that's all it was. History. In fact, He'd unconsciously unweighted his hands on the car door to start after her, but was stopped by Jenny's words. So who is she to you, Colt? Jenny's glare was familiar. She'd used it on him untold times before. He frowned, hating when a woman felt she had a right to demand anything from him. If he could get away with it, he'd live in the hills as a hermit, far away from the people who wanted a daily piece of him. Ignoring her question, he backed away from her car. You need to go. Wait a minute. Do I tell the mayor you'll be a model? He ground his back molars until they squeaked. I'll handle it. Be careful when you back out of here. He gestured to the barn. Back up and go slow around that corner. Then you'll be clear to go forward. Take care of yourself, Jenny. He hoped she got the underlying meaning to that statement. By the scowl on her face, she did. A model. For clothing. He growled as he followed after Jenny's car and watched her negotiate her departure. His brothers would razz him till doomsday if he walked a runway. Still, if they chose Cooper Ranch for the location of rescue horses, it would be a boon for him for his business, for the tragically mistreated horses. Just the thought of a venture into town turned his stomach. But he had to at least talk to the mayor about this, find out the truth of it. He didn't trust Jenny to deliver the correct details. He didn't trust her at all. He trapped back into the dim light of the barn, inhaling the scent of hay and horse and manure, and felt the calmness creep in slowly. When he saw Riley rubbing the mare's eyes, nose, and ears, peace crept in, and with it a longing to have those petite, freckled hands rub the last twinge of anger right out of him. How's she doing? he asked as he moved in on them. Riley stiffened but kept rubbing. A wee better, I think. Not quite so facha. He felt the slow grin take his mouth. Facha? Hi, you know. Her nose wrinkled up and her mouth puckered as she searched for the right word. The dim light of the barn seemed to brighten with each of her cute twitches. Nervous, spooky. His smile broadened. I see. She dropped her gaze from Meg and towed the dirt. So, do you usually have your girlfriend come visit during the workday? Colt reached forward, bumping his chest into her shoulder, and gave the mare a scratch behind her ears. He tilted his head down, not quite enough to trap her with his hat bill, but enough to whisper in her ear, She's not my girlfriend. Riley jumped to the side and rubbed her ear, peering over her shoulder at him. She's not? 
One side of his mouth twitched into a near smile, but he kept it contained. No. Oh. Riley focused back on Meg and stroked her neck this time. So, why did she come out here then? Anger crept back in and poisoned the mood. He backed away from Riley and strode to the other side of the barn, deep in thought. He grabbed the stallion's broken halter and new leather straps and began to repair it. So, we're done with our conversation, eh? She called from across the barn. Colt glanced up. Ryle had turned away from the mare, and now her hands rode her hips. Ah, uh, it was lambasting time. He almost looked forward to it. In fact, he prompted it. Why don't you go on up to the house and make us a little lunch? My brothers could probably use some, too. Make us... She sputtered for a minute until her brows dipped. Colt watched with his amusement in check as she lowered her chin. She looked for all the world like a bull about to charge. The chuckle nearly got away from him. I'm not your nanny, Colt Cooper, or your cook, or your housekeeper. Who do you think I am? Yep, that got him. The smile snuck out before he immediately tucked it away. Uh, no, none of those. I figured you're probably hungry is what you are. Her green eyes widened until he thought he could see himself in them. Isn't it your job to feed your guests? Guests? Is that what you think you are? Silly me. I thought you were clients who wanted to buy a horse. Stop teasing her, Colt, Fran said from the open barn door. I'll make lunch. Give me about fifteen minutes. Riley shot Brand a grateful smile. It was big and sparkling white, matching all that white skin under her freckles. Dazzling. Pain shot through his temples as if the thought had pierced him, a sharp reminder of the trouble women caused. He tossed the halter at the top of the barrel, missing it entirely. That brought Riley's attention back to him with a scowl. Fine. Did she want to play it that way? He could do that with no problem at all. I'll see you back at the house. That is, if you're hungry. With a final glance in her direction, he stuffed his hat on tighter and strode out the barn. Chapter 12 Riley didn't fix lunch? Had he ever come across a more spoiled woman? She probably never cooked. But as he stomped off toward the house, he knew that wasn't right. She wasn't spoiled. He knew spoiled women. Riley wasn't anything like them. Spoiled women didn't cover up their beauty. They flaunted it. Letting himself into the mudroom, he removed his boots and plodded into the kitchen. Brand was hard at work creating a pyramid of sandwiches on a platter. He was a pretty good cook, and with Bronk not around, he was darned agreeable. Looks good. What kind? Some tuna. Some olive. Yum. Olive mixed with mayonnaise. One of his favorites. Great. Where's Betsy, or Riley, or whatever you call her? Colt had been sure Riley would follow him here. Yeah, he was learning he couldn't be certain of anything with that woman. For the first time, he wished one of his adorning women, as Rebecca called them, were here to teach her. He shook his head. Was he crazy? He hated fawning women. Dang, he didn't know what he wanted anymore. Right then the mudroom door slammed, followed by the laughter of two people. Bold, deep laughter. Clay. Raspy, feminine laughter. Riley. Colt ground his back teeth for the second time today. Clay never laughed. Jealousy rose up to devour him from the inside out. Colt was never jealous. Had never found reason to be. Still, he recognized this emotion, unfamiliar or not. The two newcomers dropped their boots and shuffled toward the kitchen. Colt clenched his fist. Send him back to Alaska. Before he did something ridiculous, he yanked the fridge door open and bent down to look inside. 
the chuckling pair surfaced from the mudroom. When Colt peered over the fridge door and saw two sets of green eyes twinkling in mirth at one another, Colt lost it. What the heck is so gall darn funny? he bellowed, rattling the glass stacked on the table. Brand stopped building his triangle of sandwiches to stare at Colt. Riley sucked in a breath and froze, but Clay stormed into the room, mischief evident on his face. Wouldn't you like to know? Then he shoved past Colt to Brand's stack of food and snatched one off the top, devouring it in three bites. Before Colt could say anything more, Clay marched out the living room exit. His heavy footfalls could be heard on a stair here and there as he ascended to the second floor. Silence reigned, but for the breathing of the three. Colt felt his chest tighten with suffocating frustration. He had no idea what to do next. Brand came to his rescue. You like tuna or olive, Betsy? Olive? In a sandwich? Yeah. One of Maria's favorites to feed us. At first we hated them. Then they grew on us. Bran laughed nervously, which was his usual reaction when his older brothers fought. Colt brought his head around to catch the look on his face. Had he embarrassed Bran too? He'd have to apologize for that later. For now, he needed to get them fed and back to training Meg before Clay set him up for another fall. Had he forgotten precisely how bad life was all those years growing up with Clay? He never quite understood it. Sure, they were on the opposite side of reason from one another. But this... No. Colt had never been out of control. This was something more. Riley carefully scooted around him as if he were radioactive and strode up to Brand. She faced the pile of sandwiches and asked, Can I help? Already done, Red. Brand must have picked up the name from Jimmy. When had he done that? Speaking of which, anyone seen Jimmy? He's asleep in the apartment, she said. Who's Maria? Her head was turned to Brand as if Colt weren't even in the room. That did nothing to cool his temper. Brand grinned at her. She was like a mother to us because, well, our mother died when Brock and I were born. Maria did everything for us since Dad was so busy, he swallowed, audibly, shook his head. She moved back to Mexico to her family when we were eighteen. We miss her. At least you had a mother in Maria. The rancor in Riley's voice was thick. He hoped Brand asked her more. Thankfully, his brother was the talkative one. You didn't know your mother? Colt slipped a chair out quietly and sat. She shrugged. She left us when I was five. I don't remember her. Jiminy Cricket, Red. That's awful. How could she do that? Colt winced at Brand's lack of tact. But apparently she didn't take offense. I don't know. I sure couldn't leave my child. Something had to be wrong with her. In the next moment, her shoulders slumped and she looked crestfallen. My da says I'm just like her. The forlorn look on her face slew him. Her eyes glistened while the little freckle at the corner of her mouth went slack. Colt rose out of his chair so quickly it whacked Bran in the leg and nearly took him down. While Bran was hollering his protest, Colt touched Riley at the elbow, swung her around, and wrapped her in a bear hug. He squeezed, trying to rid her of ancient, deep-rooted grief. That's when it hit him. This wasn't just grief for what she'd had to live through. This was also grief for his loss. Of his mom. Of his dad. Since the old man withdrew at the same time. Of Colt's ultimate freedom. Mmph! Riley said while she wriggled in his arms. He loosened his hold and leaned back. You say something? She exhaled. Her eyes were wide, and she seemed out of breath. Phew! You have quite a clutch there, cowboy. Sorry. You all right? She gulped another breath. Was that a tremor he felt? Um, 
You can let me go now. Colt released her as heat filled his face to the tops of his ears. Uh, he's the hugger of the family, Brand said, and stepped forward with his arms out. So am I. Colt straight-armed him in the chest, but chuckled. He knew Brand was just covering Colt for his embarrassment. Not happening, little brother. Okay, fine. Let's eat. These are great, if I do say so myself. Brand settled the plate in the middle of the kitchen table, then glanced at the door to the living room. Do you suppose Hot Dog is coming back? Hot Dog? Riley repeated as she put a sandwich on her plate, then looked at her hands and leapt to her feet. Oh, yuck! I need to wash up. It's good you didn't let me help you earlier, she said to Brand. I'll just... She pointed in the direction Clay had gone, though Colt knew it was to the downstairs bathroom. Of course, make yourself at home. She tilted her head and studied him. A lock of red hair slid across her cheek. He wanted to rub that curl between his fingertips, then tuck it back behind her ear. What? The guest thing? I was teasing you. Of course you're a guest. Make yourself at home. He smiled with one of those smiles his admirers always seemed to stare at. Beat the heck out of him, why? But it seemed to work on Riley, too. Her mouth parted, and he thought her eyes were saucers earlier. Well, they were moons now. What was he doing? He clamped his lips shut. Now she would follow him around like a mare in season. Trying his best not to groan aloud, he watched her watch him. Just when he thought he'd need to retreat to the barn, she snapped her gaping mouth shut, narrowed her eyes like he'd tried to trick her, and sped off for the bathroom. Huh. Well, maybe he'd misunderstood her after all. He strode to the sink and washed his hands, grabbing up the hand towel to dry them, all while Brand stood smirking at him. What's your problem? Colt asked. What's yours? I don't know what you're talking about. I need to eat and get back to work. Colt took one of each kind of sandwich and slapped them on his plate. One glance told him Brand was still staring and smirking. Colt dropped the sandwich he'd just seized and sat back in his chair. Spill. Oh, nothing, Brand grinned. Just seems to me this is one little filly who's not affected by Colt Cooper's grand looks and heart-stopping smile, is all. Colt sat forward again and snatched up the sandwich, taking a large bite. After half a dozen chews, he said, What makes you think not? Bran rolled his eyes. It's kind of different having a little hot sauce in your porridge, eh, Mush? Get out of here. You've got work. Thanks for the sandwiches. Bran slapped Colt on the back and jetted out of the kitchen. Maybe he should talk to his dad about keeping the twins separate for longer. Then again, it would be a few weeks before Bronk returned. He found himself grinning. A small gasp brought Colt's head up. Riley stood in the doorway with her eyes on his mouth. Yeah. See there? She was taken by his smile. The thought made his smile grow. Which in itself was a significant change. Typically, he would have already clamped his mouth shut and been plotting his escape. Riley just stood there. You okay? Come, sit. Eat. Brand's pretty good at putting a sandwich together. When she finally moved her feet, she reached for half a sandwich and put it on her plate. Oh, no, you don't. We've been through this before. Half a sandwich isn't going to sustain an athlete. What would you say if I only fed Meg a pony's portion daily before expecting her to carry you around those barrels? Okay, fine. I'll eat another half. As long as you don't call me skinny again. I never called you... The blare of a car horn log jammed the words in his throat. Colt came to his feet to look out the kitchen window. He groaned loudly before realizing how ill-mannered that sounded and tried to turn it into a cough. It was another female on the make. This time, one of the waitresses from the Longhorn Saloon and Grill downtown Sundance. 
Every time he and his brothers visited the place, they ended up with three or four waitresses hovering over them, and Lila always seemed to pick him. Excuse me a minute, he said to Riley, then dashed to the mudroom for his boots before Lila could make it to the front door. He strode out the back and swung around the house, just as the dark-haired girl was heading up the walkway to the front door. Lila! She twirled to the left and saw him coming. Oh, hi, Colt! Neither said another thing as she waited for him to reach her. What can I do for you? he asked, when what he wanted to say was, What the heck are you doing here? I've missed seeing you at the saloon. Are you okay? Why wouldn't I be? Is that why you came out here? To ask me if I'm okay? Yes. Well, no. Also, to bring you the clothes you're going to model this Saturday. She blushed a perfect shade of tomato. I can't wait to see you in them. I'm helping Jenny put the fashion show together. She smiled so big, her almond-shaped eyes became slits. He groaned. This time he didn't care if it was rude. I haven't talked to the mayor about this yet. I want to know why they picked me to... The mayor didn't set this up. Jenny did. She looked confused. Colt rolled his eyes. Of course. That made more sense. Still. Is it true the proceeds go to animal rescue? She bounced on her feet. Oh, yes. Isn't that wonderful? The mayor is involved in that part. When Jenny told him you would be modeling to help the cause because of your passion for rescue horses, he decided then and there to have you Coopers board the horses. Isn't that grand? She frowned as she scrutinized his expressions. That is, if you want to. Oh, he wanted the rescues, all right. But he hated being manipulated into it. And modeling? while he wrestled with whether to be a part of the fashion show to fulfill his passion. Lila looped around and nearly skipped to her car. When she returned, she set a canvas bag down in front of him. Here are your clothes. Let me get the hats. Wait a minute, Lila. She stopped and turned back. Yes? She said in a breathy tone. Uh, I... Haven't decided yet whether to do this. Can you tell me more about it first? He heard the front door bang shut, and out of the corner of his eye saw Riley standing off to the side, watching. With a wince, he turned his head toward her. I'm going back, she gestured toward the barn. He nodded, relieved Riley had no intention of gawking, then turned back to Lila, who'd returned with a stack of four hats and shoved them into his hands. Oh, Lila swallowed, her eyes darting from Riley to the front door and back again. Hello. Not happy about seeing another woman emerge from his house? Good. Maybe that would discourage the waitress from just showing up whenever she wanted. Who's she? Lila said. Ignoring her question, Colt asked, Is this all? How did you know my size? Pfft, easy. Jenny's mom knows the owner of the feed store. You've bought Carhartt shirts and Wranglers there before. When he found out what it was for, he told us your sizes and also offered bruised oats, free for your startup. Just Wranglers and shirts? Well, how could he say no to that? It didn't sound too uncomfortable, and it was a heck of a deal. Maybe the rest of the community would pitch in, too. That would do a lot for the abused horses and his budget. Is Warren Doc Willows going to be modeling, too? He'd be the one doing the vet checks. Uh, Lila hedged. By her reaction alone, he knew he was alone in this. But it was a good cause, and he'd been wanting to start a rescue. Never mind. Okay, he sighed. I'll do it. Where do I have to be on Saturday? What time? Really? She squealed and bounced some more. Why had he never noticed her adolescent behavior before? Must have been the beer. He nodded. Though he was aware of the frown, he couldn't quite erase from his face. She didn't seem to notice. 
I'll help too. Riley was unexpectedly at his flank, an exuberant look on her cute face. I can model some clothes for you if you'd like, if it's for Colt's rescue horses. Lila looked her over from head to boots, and he guessed the jealousy had fled. Great. I'll tell Jenny. We'll see you. What's your name? Betsy Murphy. Okay, Betsy. We'll see you at the community center at nine to get fitted for your clothes. She looked to Colt then. I know you're too busy to come that soon, so be there by noon. The fashion show starts at 1 p.m., but be sure to try the clothes on ahead of time to make sure they fit. Thank you both. She rushed back to her car as if he might change his mind in the next few minutes, which he should. But since Brock and his acid sense of humor were out of town for a few more weeks, the damage would be minimal, he hoped. Colt kept his eyes on Lila the whole time she backed and sped off the ranch. Once the twirl of dust settled, he dropped his gaze to the large sack in front of him. Modeling. He needed his head examined. That's a nice gesture, Riley said at his side. He hadn't noticed she was still there. He groaned. Yeah, real nice. You too. She patted him on the arm. I'm serious. Abused horses are also ignored horses. I see it all too often at rodeo. Cowboys mistreating, neglecting the very horses that carry them to the wind. I want to pound some heads in when I see it. Which reminds me, I need to call home and make sure Pearl's being looked after properly. Colt gawked at her. This was as much as he'd heard her talk outside a tirade. Ill-treated horses seemed to be a passion of hers, too. Deep respect began to swell in his chest for her. Not many people gave a darn when it came to horses, as if horses were only intended for man's use and abuse. The more he learned about God from Rebecca, the more convinced he was God would be disgusted by such conduct. He'd put animals in mankind's care, after all. Colt bent down to retrieve the bag with his free hand. Here, I'll get that. Riley grabbed up the bag before he could. Thanks. He shook his head. I'll try them on tonight. She laughed. The sound was raspy and alive and reached inside him, seeming to calm his spirit. <laughs> will, will you model them for us first? Hell, heck no. Bad enough in front of the whole town. They strode to the front door together. And don't you dare use the word model around me, he said with a wink and a smile. She laughed, and he joined her. Chapter 13 Colt squeezed into a pair of the wranglers Lila had brought him, too tight around the thighs. Had the company changed their sizing? Or was he gaining weight? He hadn't bothered to try them on before today, since the tags showed the right size. He'd already been in a slow seethe since he'd gone through the clothes in the bag after Lila left last Wednesday. Finding long johns and even a swimsuit at the bottom, he'd be darned if he was going to model under things or swimwear. When he saw Lila, he'd tell her as much and hand her the bag of items he wouldn't wear. You're up after two more girls, Mr. Cooper, the young teenager at his side of the stage said. She'd been shyly glancing at him with a little smile ever since he'd shown up. Her attention reminded him a whole crowd of gawkers awaited on the other side of the curtain. Sweat popped out on the back of his neck. He swiped at it, powerfully tempted to turn tail and run. Only he wouldn't do that. Whenever he gave his word, he never reneged. Instead, he awaited his turn to walk down the blasted runway in front of the entire town, while one woman after the next modeled everything from full-length gowns to nighttime wear. Blast! What had he gotten himself into? As the next woman approached the runway from stage left, Colt did a double-take, and his mouth went instantly dry. The next lady is a newcomer to Wyoming, Elizabeth Murphy, visiting from Amarillo, Texas. She just happens to be in the running for Barrel Racer of the Year, She'll be competing in nationals this next month. 
we couldn't find a local girl to model our swimwear, but when Elizabeth, or Betsy, she likes to be called, found out the proceeds of this show went to rescue horses, she stepped in to help. Please help me welcome Miss Betsy Murphy. The audience clapped liberally as she began her descent across the stage and down the runway. As Colt watched, if he'd had the right, he would have dashed to her, thrown a horse blanket around her shoulders, and escorted her right off stage. The fact the whole town watched as her hips rocked and those long, naked legs slid past one another made his spine seize and his jaw bunch. The men in the crowd edged closer as the hair on the back of his neck prickled. Stop. Just enjoy the show. Exhaling in frustration, he allowed his gaze to slide down her body and back up. Admittedly, she was a sensation in a low-cut, bright yellow swimsuit with a stretchy panel at her lower abdomen and across the top of her thighs and matching sandals on her dainty feet. Too much cleavage showed, though, making his mouth go dry and his hackles rise. As she turned and moseyed back up the runway, he saw that her snow-white legs were dusted with adorable freckles. Her red mane was out of its ponytail for once, and it hung in generous waves around her shoulders, back, and chest, bouncing with every step. She had a white and yellow lace something strung over one shoulder, held by one fingertip and a self-confident bright grin on her face. Gad, she was stunning. When she'd finally made her way back to the podium, she turned and gave a small wave over one shoulder to the audience. The audience applauded as the woman at the podium thanked her. She sped off and escaped behind the curtain. He wondered if anyone had noticed he hadn't blinked while she dominated the stage. Now, the moment you've all been waiting for, especially the ladies. This fashion show isn't just women's clothing, as I'm sure you've heard. There's also men's clothing. This particular man will also be the recipient of many gifts from the sponsors of this show to start up the Cooper Horse Rescue Project, CHIRP for short, with proceeds from the day. So be sure to buy up your year's clothing since, as you know, it's going to a good cause. Put your hands together and welcome Mr. Colt Cooper from the Bar Six Ranch. Everyone went wild. Colt stood on the sidelines and stared at the crazy herd of people of all ages and both genders. His heart banged around his chest. Could he do this? He had to. Concentrate on the rescue, the one they'd already named for him. Come on out, Mr. Cooper. They'll eventually quiet down the announcer said into the microphone. Colt strained to hear her over the noise. When she gestured for him to come forward, Colt took one step, barely hearing his boots thwack against the hardwood grain, then another and another, until he stood before them, center stage. His first outfit was the tight wranglers with the extra length in folds atop his own work boots and a sapphire-colored Carhartt shirt neatly ironed and buttoned at the wrists. The belt buckle he'd worn the one time he competed at their hometown rodeo shined at his middle, and a black velvet resistol western hat was pulled low over his eyes, efficiently blocking the stage lights. Since the crowd didn't settle, Colt figured to get on with it. He started down the runway at a pretty good clip until he heard shouts from the audience to slow his pace. Doing his best not to grimace, he slowed and instantly regretted it. Wolf whistles rose from the masses, and catcalls followed, until the din was ear-splitting. Colt finally made it to the end, then turned to head back, picking up the pace whether they liked it or not. Once he got to the podium, the announcer put her hand up to stop him and gestured with one finger for him to slowly turn. None of the ladies had to do this so he almost ignored her to escape to the back. But a glance at stage left had him slowing to a stop in spite of his urgency to escape. He froze, drinking in his fill of the vision of the woman waiting her turn. Riley wore an adorable peach-colored sundress with tiny straps and material gathered around her chest. It fell loose to her knees just above the cowboy boots she usually wore. 
that red mane still hung free, and he itched to run his fingers through it. Her creamy white and freckled shoulders were bare, and he wanted to smooth his hands over them next. He couldn't remember when he'd been so poleaxed by a woman. He'd always been too busy running from them. His pulse beat in his ears, muffling the noise of the crowd. With another gesture from the presenter, Colt tore his eyes from Riley and made a slow turn for the mob. The community center filled with more noise, and finally Colt made his way off the stage and to the dressing room, shutting himself in. The next hour moved slower than the hay harvester while Colt modeled one get-up after another. When the time came for the long johns, he threw them back in the bag. If he had to model one of the two that were left, it would be the swimming trunks. He stripped and pulled on the trunks, but didn't come out of the dressing room. A knock sounded at the door. Colt, you ready? They say you only have two more things to model. You can do it, Riley said. How did they know the only person he'd do this for was her? Had they watched him watch her? Or had she volunteered to put a fire under him? He half chuckled to himself. She did have a way of generating fires. I'm not modeling the underwear. I don't know you all that well yet, but I know this is hard for you, she said through the door. I'm proud of you for doing this. Not many men would put an animal's needs before their own as you have. Yep, those were the right words. With one last glance at himself in the short navy swimming trunks, he threw on the matching shirt with the terry cloth liner and buttoned it. He knew men usually kept these things open, but he was exposed enough. He slipped his bare feet into a pair of thongs and ventured out. Betsy stepped back when the door opened, and, oh, my word. The man who stood in the doorway wasn't the same one who'd gone into the dressing room. In clothes, Colt was spectacular, but half-dressed? There was no describing him. On first glance, her face filled with heat and her eyes wanted to pop out of her head. On second glance, she decided he could have easily walked straight out of Life magazine and into the limelight in Hollywood. Not an ounce of Catalan Wyoming remained. Colt was all sunny beach California. His legs drew her gaze first, legs built by years of living in a saddle, heavily dusted with curly hair. The trunks were super short and tight around his thigh muscles, and his calves were thick and well-formed. And those bare feet! When moisture dribbled out of the corner of her mouth, she swept her tongue around and clamped her lips shut. She blushed and looked up, expecting to see a smirk riding his face only to find he wasn't looking at her at all. The look on Colt's face was priceless. Part frustration, part disgust, mostly searching for an escape. Can you tell me why swimwear is necessary to show Wyomingites? We're heading into winter. I don't know Texas, but here we'll have snow soon. For months, Riley. Why swimsuits? Though he'd kept his voice down, he practically spit out each word. To say he was incensed was an understatement. She valiantly crushed her smile with her fingers, but the chuckle burbling up would be unstoppable if she didn't hurry up and say something. Well, she moved her fingers and grinned, if I were to guess, I'd say that crowd out there, she pointed toward the audience, will get one glimpse of you in swimwear and you won't have to worry about how to fund your rescue service for years to come. Colt's face distorted from disgust to horror. She did giggle then, and hurried forward and grasped his forearms. They were warm and inviting, and she instantly regretted touching him. She let go in a flash and clasped her hands behind her back. No, it's good, Colt. Think about it. She pulled in a large draft of air, trying to quiet her hammering heart. When she thought she could continue without sounding breathless, she went on. You'll be able to take on many horses, not just one or two. Think of the ones you'll save. She raised her brows, waited for him to get it. 
His jaw rotated back and forth. He tilted his head back and regarded the beams. No, I'm not doing this. He lowered his gaze and glowered at her as if it was her fault. Cowboy gear is one thing, but this? I feel like a male stripper. Men. As tough as they made themselves out to be, their egos were fragile as glass. She crossed her arms and lifted both eyebrows. If I can do it, you can. Colt's glare softened. He pressed his lips together, considering what she'd said, and looked over the robe she now wore. You're right. You did it. And the horses... His gaze drifted off again. Yes, the horses. She patted him on the shoulder, then turned him and gave him a little push toward the stage. One foot slid off his flip-flop. His arms shot out to catch his balance as he nearly rolled his ankle. She bit her lip, waiting for him to turn and glare at her again. But he only shifted his foot back on and moved out toward the stage. She watched him gather himself, shoulders squared, a hand run through his thick hair. And then he strolled past the curtain and into the glare of lights. She swelled with pride. When he reached center stage, the crowd thundered. He started down the ramp, and all the ladies shot to their feet and pushed closer, scraping chairs, whistles, shouts, obscene requests, arms waving in the air, cursing like they were at Elvis Presley's first concert. Betsy kept her eyes glued to him, like every other woman in the place. She enjoyed the view as he walked down the runway and back up. Once again, the lady behind the lectern put a hand up to stop him. Betsy saw the shirt stretched taut over his chest as he inhaled slowly and turned to face the crowd. The announcer patted the air with both hands, trying to get the people to settle down. It took several minutes, but they finally did. Sit down, everyone. There's still a couple of surprises left for you. Surprisingly, everyone in the crowd found a chair to sit on, with more than a few women doubled up and all teetering. The spectators looked like a bunch of teenagers in a round of musical chairs, though all had their eyes glued on Colt. She understood the draw. She'd been around the Cooper men long enough to see it, feel it. Colt's shyness had to be the reason he was the most sought after of all the brothers. Or maybe he was too kind to be rude to them. Either way, there was no mistaking his popularity. Now first of all, the presenter turned to face Colt, you must remove your cover-up to show potential buyers a full view of the swimming trunks. You can't expect them to buy the set if they can't see it all. She looked to the crowd. Isn't that right, ladies? Again, the women shot to their feet. This time, Betsy noticed the majority of men had milled to the back wall of the auditorium, while others had fled the scene. She couldn't blame them. These women were mad as hatters. Cole glanced her direction and caught her gaze, his own glittering with rising fury. She had a bad feeling about this. It was her who'd talked Colt into this. She didn't know what the announcer had in mind and wondered if Colt would be angry enough to seek revenge on her. Do you need help with your buttons, Mr. Cooper? said the lady in a tease. Laughter spread throughout the room and not just female titters. He shook his head as it filled with color and with those long fingers he worked the buttons. Even from where she stood, Betsy could see the muscle in his jaw bulge as he ground his teeth. Her stomach started a slow churn that would be a whirlpool by the time Colt got off the stage. Good grief, but she was in such trouble. When he finally finished, what the crowd must have thought was a slow strip tease, though she could see plain as day he was having trouble with the tight buttonholes, he removed the outer cover and slung it over his shoulder like he'd seen her do. The audience nearly blew the roof off the building with a roar that matched finals at rodeo. Take one more walk down the runway, Mr. Cooper. I'm sure the ladies would appreciate a better view. 
Cold glanced at the MC and hesitated as he saw her scoot off to the side and drop her head into a private powwow with a couple of other women. When she came back to the podium, she waved him on. As he trudged down the long runway, turned and came back up, a few wild women were crawling up on the stage trying to touch him. They were snatched off by masculine hands. Betsy had never seen anything like it. While Betsy's own eyes remained glued to the muscles beneath the layers of chest hair, a glance up told her those piercing blue eyes were hot with rage and directed right at her. Perhaps it was time she slipped away and headed back to the Cooper Ranch. She backed up, step by step. Another glance in her direction, and Colt caught her plan. He narrowed his eyes and slowly shook his head. She knew what that meant. If she escaped now, she'd get a double tongue lashing whenever he caught up. Stay right there, Mr. Cooper, the lady behind the podium said. That got Colt's attention. He looked ready to shoot someone. One last surprise for you ladies out there, the announcer said, until Colt looked at her before she went on. I apologize, Mr. Cooper, that you didn't know about this ahead of time. It was a last-minute decision. But then, I'm sure you're up for all this, since it will bring large sums of money to your horse rescue operation. Isn't that right? Colt shifted his jaw side to side, but remained mute, other than the unspoken words he was conveying very clearly right now. The fashion show committee just decided we should offer one more bonus. She grinned at the crowd. Ladies, how would you like to bid on a date with Mr. Cooper here? She clapped her hands daintily as the ladies in the crowd burst into a cacophony of dollar amounts and uproarious loud chants. The announcer put a hand over her ears as if trying to hear. What was that again? Did I hear one hundred dollars? Wow! That's a great start, ladies. The woman droned on and on, but Betsy tuned it out, as if the sound was the death of her dream. Would Colt be so angry with her that he wouldn't sell her Meg? Had she risked her own dream for his? All she could fixate on was the flabbergasted man who dropped the cover up to the floor and was now fisting and unfisting his hands at his sides. His skin flushed, getting pinker by the minute. If it was Clayton standing there, she had no doubt the man would curse his way off the stage and slam out the back door. But this was Colt. He took care of people, didn't like to disappoint, was considerate to a fault, and kept his word. In an instant, guilt landed heavily on her shoulders, drilling her into the floor. It was her fault he was being subjected to, in his mind, the very pinnacle of humiliation. He shifted slowly on the balls of his feet toward her, and the masses lit up again. Sure, this was him displaying a side view of his magnificent physique. Betsy knew better. This was to give her a frontal view of his menacing scowl. She could practically read what his mind was saying to her. Wait until I get my hands on you. You will wish you'd never come to Wyoming. I will wrap my hands around that freckled neck of yours. Nay, she knew he'd never hurt her, but she sure didn't want a verbal lashing in public either, and he seemed mad enough for that. Backing up a few more steps, she saw him take one step toward her. The fury in his eyes warned her not to move. Hold up right there, Mr. Cooper. The bid is up to seven hundred dollars. Seven hundred dollars? That's a fortune. That could find the rescue of dozens of horses for years. Colt's eyes bugged out. He swung back to the speaker, and when he did, Betsy made her escape. Once in her telephone truck and on her way back to the ranch, she was glad she'd thrown a coat over her sundress. The temperatures had dropped, and the sky looked as angry as Colt with rain threatening. The strike of lightning in the distance, and several seconds later, the boom of thunder told her it was still a ways off. Her mind drifted. Not only was Colt a vision of perfection, 
He'd also been the only man she'd seen that unclothed. She never had the time or inclination for swimming. Sure, she'd seen men with their sweaty shirts yanked off a few times, but she'd never seen any that made her take notice. It had been a treat she hadn't known she would even enjoy. She'd only thought of men as competitors or critics before now. No wonder the women folk of Crook County followed Colt around. She was afraid if she lived here, she might take up the same hobby. A siren blared right behind her, and she nearly jumped out of her skin. She grasped the wheel tighter and glanced in her rearview mirror before remembering the telephone truck's bed was too full of tall compartments for that view. She looked at her side mirror. A sheriff's car loomed behind her, right on her bumper, within a vast billow of black smoke coming from her vehicle. Black smoke? She'd never seen the truck do that before. Now what? Waiting to find a place to pull over that would easily fit the oversized truck took some doing, but she finally found an extra-large area that happened to be the entrance to the Bar 6 Ranch. She groaned, embarrassed and still rattled from the day's events. She hoped none of the Cooper men noticed her out here with the authorities. Once she stopped and switched off the key, she rolled her window down to the officer standing patiently at her door. Hello, ma'am. Where are you from? Surprised by the question, she hesitated. Uh, I'm, uh, from Amarillo, Texas. You're a long way from home. Why are you in Wyoming? That seemed an odd question, too. Why did he want to know that? Actually, she pointed toward the name across the top of the poles where they were parked, I'm buying a horse from the Coopers. Good people, the Coopers. Her lips twitched with the onset of a smile. Yes, they seem to be. But then the thought of cold showing up here madder than hops made her want to speed things along. Um, officer? Sheriff. Sorry, Sheriff. Why did you stop me? Is there a reason you don't have a license plate on the back of your truck? What? What happened to it? Well, that's a good question. Are you saying you had it on when you got in your vehicle? Yes, I did. At least she thought she did. Had she even noticed? It should be there. Hold on a minute. The man stepped away from her window and went to the front of her truck, looked down where that license plate should be, and nodded. When he stopped at her window again, he said, Your front plate is in place, so I'll let this slide. Best look for it. It may have fallen off along the way, or is back at the ranch. Either way, put the front plate on the back. You'll have less trouble if you do. Thank you, Sheriff. How long has your vehicle been smoking like that? It never has, as far as I know. You can take it to Ralph's in town. He can take a look at it for you. Okay, I will. She glanced at her side mirror and saw a vehicle speeding up the road toward them. Is that all, sir? Why don't you show me your driver's license before we call it a day? Oh, of course. She hurriedly dug it out of her purse and showed it to him. He nodded. Have a nice day, Miss Murphy. Before she could even start her truck, a pickup truck crunched to a halt behind the sheriff's car. What is it, Harvey? Colt's tight voice came through her open window loud and clear. All she heard next was a bluster of laughter coming from the sheriff. A quick glance in her side mirror told her Colt was still in the bathing suit, cover-up, and thongs, still looking as wildly furious as a wet cat. Yeah, 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 Harvey. Get a good laugh in. Now what's she done? Betsy didn't wait another second. She flipped the key and started the big engine. As she was about to press the clutch and put it in gear, she heard Colt holler. Hold up right there, Miss Murphy. I will have a word with you. Should she obey? If she didn't, he'd catch up to her on the ranch and just think of the audience they'd have there. No, she waited, make him believe she was submitting. Then maybe he wouldn't take his pound of flesh. Or more importantly, refuse to sell her nutmeg. The sheriff finally quieted. 
Does she do something we can put her in jail for, maybe? Colt said, a definite edge to his voice. Her stomach sank. She should zip back to the ranch, gather her things with Jimmy, and hightail it out of Wyoming for good. But surprisingly, it wasn't leaving the horse that brought her sadness. Leaving this temperamental, big-hearted bloke did. Nay, she'd stay, face the problem she'd helped create. The sheriff glanced at Betsy's face in the side mirror and back to Colt. Had some trouble with the little filly, did you? The look on the sheriff's face spoke volumes. He knew something had gone down with the two of them. He must be good at his job. Nothing I can't handle. This time Colt glanced her way, his face lined with rage. Wasn't he supposed to be the peacekeeping sweetheart of the family? She wasn't seeing much of that today. Could be it took a whole lot to trigger his temper. Or could be it took a particular person to do that. Her. If that was the case, she needed to stay clear of Colt and work with Clayton until Meg was ready for nationals. Betsy itched to start her truck and head in. Shoot. Should she ask Colt about Ralph's? Or check with someone else? Brand mayhap but Colt would no doubt notice the black smoke when she started up. Deep in thought, I see. The tone of his voice was angry in spite of the casual words. She jerked her head toward the window. Her hair swished into her face and caught on her mouth. She missed her ponytail. In fact, she couldn't wait to put her regular clothes back on. Before she could do it herself, Colt reached in and tenderly pulled the wad of hair off her lip. She licked them. His gaze dropped and stuck there. Colt was taller than the sheriff, which made him eye-level to her in the high truck. Those striking eyes had darkened and were focused solely on her lips. He looked at them as if he didn't know she owned a pair before today. The scrutiny did funny things to her. She wiggled and tore her gaze away. Um, I need to find out where Ralph's is. When she looked back, she wanted to laugh. Colt shook his head, looking downright confounded. She did that to the poor man, regularly. His head must be spinning. Chapter 14 Colt was reeling. One minute he was ready to strangle Riley for the way the fashion show had gone, and the next he was utterly baffled. Ralph's garage and food mart? Why Ralph's? She looked happy he'd asked her that. Yes. You see, the sheriff said, I gotta go there. The truck is spitting out black smoke. Wait till you see it. Also, something happened to my license plate in the back. He said I need to have the front one put on the back. What? That plate was there this morning, when you left the ranch. And you weren't burning oil. What's going on? A look of fear covered her face. The first one of its kind he'd seen from the daring redhead. I don't know. Hold on. Colt strode toward the back of the truck. He squatted down to check her license plate and saw it had been ripped off. Purposefully? Or had she backed into something? As he came back around... He couldn't help but notice those wide green eyes in the side mirror latched onto his naked legs. He winced, reminded of what she'd caused today. If she hadn't talked him into wearing the dang swimsuit, he wouldn't be trapped into a date with Jenny, the very person he should be, and would successfully be, avoiding if it hadn't been for Riley's meddling. Maybe a jab to embarrass her? Like what you see, Spitfire? The next words out of her mouth were laced with fire. Thought I had a right to look. After all, it was me who talked you into wearing it. Gutsy. Her chin stuck out in emphasis, bringing on his temper rather than the amusement he'd planned on. You have no idea what you cost me, he said, unable to swallow the anger. Oh, poor little Colt has to actually date one of the women who worship him. If she knew the history... Would she be so calloused? Yeah, 
a woman who is only going to be hurt by this. She blinked. What do you mean? How could anyone get hurt by dating you? Her brows dipped into a serious frown. Are you a violent person? What? No. How did this woman manage to upend every conversation? It just went to show she didn't know him as well as she thought she did. We have a history. It's not a good one. He hadn't meant to say so much. Still, his mouth kept going in spite of his mind cautioning it. She'll only be hurt by spending time with me again, when it can't go anywhere. She stared at him so long and so hard, her usually bright green eyes began to lose their luster. I... I'm sorry. I didn't want anyone hurt. Tears welled up. He cursed himself under his breath, dang it if his attempt to lay the guilt on didn't show Riley's good heart instead. I'm not planning to hurt her. It's only she will be hurt, she finished for him. Yes. Riley's face fell. He couldn't keep at this had to tell her the truth. Riley. She looked up, concern squishing her freckles together on her forehead. He wanted to smooth the creases back down. This is not your fault. I chose to do the fashion show. But it was me who made you go out there. She swung her hand up and down, gesturing to the swimsuit. In this. As much as I've been blaming you, it was my choice, mine alone. He grinned, thinking of the horses he could now help, excited to share the news. Eighteen hundred dollars came in. Half goes to the veterinary clinic for other rescues. What? She squealed, bouncing in the seat. That's a mint. Oh, Colt, how wonderful. Think of how many horses you can save. He watched her delight the way her smile took over her face, the way her green eyes glistened like gems under the lingering tears. And if not for your meddling, he grinned again, it wouldn't have happened. Her gaze dropped to his legs, this time with a frown. You must be freezing. Let's go back and tell your brothers. She grinned all over again, making his heart swell. If she hadn't been sitting in this tank, he would have thrown his arms around her and swung her around. As painful as this afternoon's spectacle had been for him, he couldn't be happier with the outcome. Apart from the date. That worried him more than anyone would ever understand, except maybe his dad. Whatever happened, he'd make sure he didn't end up in his dad's shoes. Shoes he'd nearly found himself in once before in trouble, and married to the wrong woman. Ten grueling days of working with Nutmeg, and Betsy was ready to call it quits. The sweetheart of a mirror was gone, and the unpredictable one, shy one minute, bucking and biting the next, had been all she and Clayton and Colt and even Jake had seen. She wasn't getting better. It seemed the constant attention was making Meg worse. She sidestepped all the time now, showed her backside rather than her eyes all too often, didn't let men get close to her. She even shied away from other horses. If she'd been in the wild, she would have no pecking order at all. She'd have been left behind when the alpha mare moved the band on. Each day Betsy's dream of winning nationals slipped further and further away, until only a glint of it remained. She wanted to cry. Colt still wouldn't sell the mare to her, and now she was grateful. Do you suppose Meg should be your first rescue horse? Betsy rested her eyes on the mare, who had her nose buried in fresh hay. Meg seemed happiest in her stall these days, mayhap because it meant no more work or no other animals. The bruise has long since healed. We haven't even saddled her yet. Why isn't her mind okay, Colt? Colt slung his arm around her shoulder and pulled her in for a side hug. She rested her head on his chest and sighed. 
They'd all been working so hard. You never know how a horse will react, Spitfire. The stallion was brutal with her that day. Ahem, <clears throat> came the sound of a woman clearing her throat. Colt released Betsy, and they both turned tiredly toward the barn door. Who was that? Betsy squinted. The light had faded outside, and no one had flipped the lights on in the barn yet. Spitfire, huh? Jenny came strolling forward like she had all the time in the world. She wore a beautiful fur-lined coat, and her blonde hair was wrapped up in a tall beehive. You never gave me a nickname, Colt. Colt was quiet. Betsy glanced his way and saw his mouth set as it always did when he was tense. She'd learned that look every day in the corral as they struggled with training Meg. What can I do for you, Jenny? His words were as terse as his stance. They needed to be left to their business, as much as Betsy didn't want to leave Colt with this unsavory task. Guilt wound its way through her again as she thought of the time he would spend with Jenny and how Colt had said this date would hurt her. The date would be even worse for him, she knew, now that she had begun to see his heart. Still, he had to do it. He had already received the money for it. Betsy turned back to the stall to fetch her coat from the top slat, then started for the door. Colt caught her hand, squeezed when she tried to take another step. Jenny glared at the connection. We need to talk, Colt. This is not a good time, Jenny. We've been having trouble with Betsy's horse. We still have work to do. It hadn't gone unnoticed that Colt had called her Betsy probably to keep things less complicated with the woman he wanted out of here. The woman who seemed more arrogant today. Had this upcoming date with Colt made her pretend they were something to each other? Was that a possibility? That thought made dread seep even deeper into Betsy's soul. Jenny sidled up and wedged herself between Colt and Betsy, forcing Colt to release her hand. None of them moved. I heard you talking about the mare. There's nothing more you need to do tonight. If you want me to drag our past out in front of Carrot Top here, then I will. But we will talk. Right now. Betsy was aching to hear about Colt's past with this woman. To satisfy her curiosity, sure. But even more, to help Colt move on from it, if she could. Still, she needed to give them their space to talk. She owed that to both of them. It's okay. I have to find Jimmy anyway, Colt. She retreated to the barn door. Once the evening wind hit her skin, she slowed her steps and sighed. She needed a dose of Jimmy's silly antics or humdrum conversation. He grounded her when she was anxious. She headed to the apartment. She hadn't seen much of her friend lately, but then... Jimmy often disappeared into his world when he knew she was in good hands. Right now Jenny was in those good hands. The thought made her legs wobbly. She stopped and stared at the door to hers and Jimmy's quarters, her mind wandering off. Colt had done something to her no other man had done. He had caught her attention and beckoned her to look closer still, to see the man he was at his heart. Far from wanting to compete with her or use her, Colt looked out for her, and everyone else he felt responsible for. He endured public embarrassment to rescue horses, spent grueling hours trying to train Meg for her without making her buy the horse first, housed and fed his guest, and in between never left Trevor's side in running the ranch. And though she hadn't seen it, She'd heard from more than one cowhand how Colt had acted the peacemaker for the entire Cooper clan. Except for Clayton. What had happened to cause their rift? Then again, what had happened between Colt and Jenny? It seemed more than the usual high school sweetheart breakup. No, there was something more profound there, something that kept Colt on this ranch rather than socializing in town at the restaurants, bars, and dances, as the rest of the crew seemed inclined to do. No one his age worked as hard as he did for no reason. Everything okay there? 
Startled, Betsy twirled around to face the new voice and saw an older, pot-bellied gentleman with wisps of gray hair sticking out from under his worn hat. Willie's the name. He stuck out his hand, and she shook it. You must be that little filly from down in Marilla Way. Aye, uh, yes, that's me. Oh, you're a Scot like our Jake. Irish. Okay, Irish. Good to have you here at the bar, Six. How's that little mare coming along? Not good, I'm afraid. I'm Betsy, by the way. A warmth engulfed her. She couldn't quite explain. If she'd ever had a grandpa, this was what she envisioned. With Stogie, too. Have you ever seen a mare abused by a stallion? Can't say as I have, but Clay has. Is he helping you? Well, not really. Clayton and I don't get along that well. She glanced around to see if anyone was listening. They were alone. What happened between Colt and Clayton? There doesn't seem to be much brotherly love there. Willie shook his head sadly. Nah, happened years ago, when Clay was married. Clayton was married? That surprised the heck out of her. He couldn't be much older than early twenties. Yeah, they were kids, just out of high school. Curiosity welled up. How long did it last? So rightly remember. A year, I think. He took off for Alaska after she left him. She left? What happened? Just overheard it one night. Had to do with Colt. It's why those two boys don't see eye to eye no more. Oh, drat. What did Colt do with Clayton's wife? An affair? No. Somehow she wouldn't believe that. Not the Colt she'd come to know. Think you can mind your own business, Willie? Her head cranked over to where Colt had come out of the barn, a deep scowl showing on his face. His eyes looked black in the dusk light. The skid of back tires and spinning gravel brought Betsy around even further to see Jenny's car heading out of the ranch at too fast a clip. Hey, son, Willie greeted Colt, oblivious to the younger man's irritation. Just having me a conversation with Irish here. Colt looked at Betsy, his mouth twitching, a need to smile. Irish, huh? A nickname to match your temper. Without her permission, her eyes narrowed and her mouth twisted. No, she wasn't going to let that temper out. What happened with Jenny? she asked, knowing the question would rile him, take his mind off her. Set your date? Colt glanced to the taillights disappearing down the road within the car's dust cloud and darkening sky. His tense jaw told her that he'd had another disagreement. She knew Colt had tried to set a date with Jenny a couple of times over the last ten days. They neither one could agree. Not so much on a day and time, but on what to do. Colt had never mentioned why. Well, old Willie here is going to leave you two kids on your own. Behave yourself now. He chuckled at his own joke, then ambled off toward the back of the barn and likely supper. Colt shook his head. Dad should have fired those two long ago. Shocked, her mouth gaped. You wouldn't. One side of Colt's mouth tipped up in a half smile. No, we wouldn't. They're like uncles. I was thinking more like grandpas. She grinned at him hoping to lighten his mood. Poor Colt. Nothing seemed to go right for him. She wondered if he'd always had bad luck, or if it had only been since she'd arrived. Colt watched her mouth. His intense scrutiny made her tummy flutter. Why aren't you able to set a date with Jenny? She glanced pointedly at Jenny's retreating taillights. I'm assuming you didn't again. He growled. She wants to help me round up strays. Betsy's eyebrows shot up. Of all the things, why would she want that kind of date? It would be a night or two out on the range. She tilted her head, tried to read Colt's expression in the dimming light. Of all the dates a citified woman would want, is that so she'd have you all to herself? His gaze flickered away from her. 
When he looked back, he said, Come on, let's get some grub. He took hold of her elbow and pulled her in the direction of the house. She thought of yanking out of his hold and demanding an answer, but who was she to question anything Colt did? No one. No one at all. On their way back to the house, Colt released his grip and continued beside her in preoccupied silence. Oh, how she wanted to ask about Jenny again. But she reached up and tightened her ponytail, squared her shoulders, and forced her brain onto a different track. Why do you suppose my truck is smoking? And what do you think happened to my license plate? Colt exhaled a huff as if he'd been holding his breath. His shoulders seemed to ease. He had expected her to drill him about Jenny. Thanks for reminding me. I need to call Ralph and check if the truck's ready. As far as the license plate, I've been meaning to ask, could you have backed into something? Her brows dipped as she looked off into space contemplating the question. I haven't been anywhere where I needed to back up. You said you knew it was there. How do you remember that, by the way? Do you always check out people's license plates? Colt chuckled. I happened to notice yours this morning since the letters caught my eye. B-R-A-C-O-1. I thought, nice license plate for a number one barrel racer. Oh, I hadn't put that together. She laughed outright, and Colt swung his gaze to her. His eyes widened, his lips parted. When he swallowed loudly, she decided she'd stunned him. Did she laugh so little? He faced ahead, his expression back to subdued, and didn't say another word. Are you okay? Ignoring her question, Colt instead bounded forward to open the mudroom door for her. She wasn't used to that would have to stop him from treating her like a lady. She wasn't one. She was one of the guys, doing her job, trying to make a mark in a man's world. They padded into the kitchen to the sizzle of cheese in a griddle. You're making yourself useful, Brand. We may have to keep Bronk away from you permanently. Colt slapped him on the back, good-naturedly. Brand scoffed. Grilled cheese and potato chips for supper. Hungry? Yes. yes. Both Colt and Betsy said at the same time, then laughed. She hadn't understood she could enjoy someone she was attracted to. She'd only seen buckle bunnies and cowboys making fools of themselves with their lust and flirting. Colt was such a sweetheart, she'd come to realize she liked him. Really liked him. Betsy had just finished her sandwich, and Colt his too, when the sound of gravel under tires had Colt on his feet with a glance out the window. He didn't hold back a loud groan. Another one of your admirers, Mush? Bran said. Should I take care of this one for you? Do they come around every day? Betsy asked, as Colt excused himself for the mudroom. Loud stomping told her his boots were going on. Then the back door slammed. Why doesn't he just choose one, so the rest will leave him alone? She frowned as she thought over what that would mean. Personally, I think Colt finds women who drool over him less than tolerable. Heck, I don't get it. I like it when they drool. Bran winked and flashed a heart-stopping smile. He was pretty young yet, at twenty, but she saw he would be a lady killer one day. Probably already was in his circle of friends. Bran went to the kitchen window, peered out. Is it one of them? she asked, a knot forming in her stomach. She tried not to care that Colt had admirers, but she did. She was beginning to care too much. No, it's the dang widow. Who? She's a hay farmer now. Used to be a rancher. Sold my dad cattle and yearlings and tried to swindle him. She's not allowed on this property anymore. Betsy stood and leaned over the sink, trying to get a glimpse of the woman who dared to swindle a cooper. Why'd she come, do you suppose? She couldn't see much in the low light, but what she could see of the woman was what most people would call exquisite. If this lady was a widow, she was likely older, but it sure didn't show in how closely she leaned into Colt. Betsy's temper shot through the roof. 
Why couldn't Colt catch a break from all these rutting man-eaters? Before her brain could stop them, her feet had her stepping into her boots and on out the back door. With colossal dirt-clumping strides, Betsy was at Colt's side with one arm slinked through his before either he or the widows seemed to notice her. Colt started and jerked his head down at her. Well, who do we have here? The widow purred as she backed away from Colt. Betsy gave the widow a mega smile. I'm Colt's girlfriend. Haven't you heard? She spared a glance at Colt, suddenly afraid he would give her ruse away, embarrass her. But then this was Colt. He wouldn't do that. One of the things she knew about him. He was a gentleman through and through. Colt's lips gave a little twitch of amusement, but he said nothing. Before Betsy could think of something to say, the widow said, Then why didn't you buy him at the fashion show? Drat. Beautiful and smart. But she was as good at lying as the next person, so... I had to head back and miss the whole auction for Colt. From what I heard, it was a last-minute decision. He couldn't get out of it and I guarantee you he wanted to. Another glance at Colt, and she saw his Adam's apple dip in a huge swallow. She hoped it was to keep from laughing. Yes, well, Jenny Renford bought him. You do know they have a history together. What is it you want, Miss Mayfield? Colt barked. Betsy still clung to Colt's arm as he talked, though she was only trying to protect him. It felt like so much more. I'm looking for cord. That made Colt's jaw tick. From what Brand had said, cord would not want to see her. Maybe I can help you. Of course, Colt would offer to do that. Cord must be gone, or he'd be out here by now. Always so worried I might cross paths with that young wife of his. Pfft. Last time. Colt said. Either tell me why you're here, or get in that big red Cadillac of yours and see yourself off the ranch. His gaze rested on the car, and so did Betsy's. It was an expensive car. The widow must be a wealthy one. Thought you gave that car to Jenny's mom to get her to marry my dad, Colt scoffed. Didn't work out so well, did it? Tell Cord I came by. She turned in a huff and took herself and her pretty car off the property. Once the swirl of dust settled, Betsy looked to Colt. She gave a car to Jenny's mom? Colt moved out of her hold. Her hands dropped to her side. A payoff. Long story. Not important anymore. That is, unless she starts harassing my dad again. I didn't know she was back in town. He looked contemplative as he started toward the barn. Betsy had a hard time keeping up with his long, agitated strides. A gust of wind hit them, reminding Betsy of what she'd left in the mudroom. It was near dark now, and the temperatures had dropped considerably. I'm going back to get my coat. Did you want me to get yours? Nah. He slowed, turned to face her. See you at the barn. She nodded, turned to go. And Riley. She turned back. She said, I? Thanks for the rescue. He grinned. She grinned back. Chapter 15 I can't figure out what she wants, Colt said to Trevor. Don't matter. Yes, it does, Trev. Dad told the widow to stay off the ranch. Had to be pretty important for her to think it was okay to come back. Trevor shrugged. Man, a few words that he was. Got something else. More sabotage. Kind of interesting timing, her being back in town and all. Trevor's head shot up from the sawhorse where he was oiling his saddle. What now? He threw the rag down on the horn and trudged over to where Colt stood next to Meg's stall. Colt had finally gotten her used to his touch again. His fingers rubbed her forelocks. Then he ran a palm over one eye, then the other. Riley's truck. Who's Riley? Oh, for crying out loud, Trev. Miss Murphy. Thought her name was Betsy. Colt used his other hand to push his hat up a mite. It's not what I call her. Why not? Trevor said, then joined Colt by sliding a hand down the mare's neck. 
Then he ran a hand over her withers. Her hide twitched, but otherwise she remained still. He ignored Trevor's question, figuring Trev wasn't really after an answer. Her license plate in the back was ripped off, and the truck's billowing black smoke. And before you ask, no, it's not burning oil. This just happened the day of the fashion show. Where is it now? Ralph has it. Come to think of it, I don't know what's taking so long. He told us it'd be a week before he could take a look, but heck, it's been ten or eleven days. Ralph never calls. Colt nodded. He was right. The truck was likely ready. He'd take Riley in to pick it up. So what do you make of it? Trevor shook his head. Don't know, but I'm dang tired of things happening. I can't keep up fixing stuff someone's wrecking on purpose. It's time we involved the sheriff. Colt centered his gaze on his older brother, surprised by the defeat in his voice. Lines creased Trevor's forehead and bracketed his mouth. There weren't laugh lines anywhere. Colt worried Trevor's heart and soul might give out before his body did. I've been too busy with the horses, he patted the mare's neck, especially this one. He turned back to Trevor, then stood nearly eye to eye, though Trevor had a couple of inches on him and a whole lot of girth. What do you need done? Nah, you're doing too much already. Keep at it with the filly. She's bound to respond eventually. Trevor gave Colt a mock punch to his chin. He turned back to work on his saddle, in silence. Trev, he looked up, met Colt's eyes. The thought of going into town, especially since the fashion show, made Colt's gut turn in on itself. But his brother couldn't take on any more. I'll talk to the sheriff when we pick up Riley's truck tomorrow. Trevor flashed a grimace that could almost pass as a smile, then nodded. Colt swung the pickup into the narrow lot that served as a service station and a garage. He parked in the only spot available, next to a telephone booth. I'll run in and get the skinny on your truck. Be right back. Riley nodded, then eyed the telephone booth. She should call her da. This was a perfect time since her da would be having lunch. Before she could talk herself out of it, she jumped out of the pickup, opened the folding door, and let herself into the booth. Lifting the grimy receiver with just two fingertips, she slipped the coins out of her pocket and into the coin slot, dialed. Hello? Da? Bet that you? I'm calling from Sundance. Everything is fine. I just wanted to check in. Good. But time. Couldn't her dad ever say just it's good to hear from her? He loved her? When would she be home? Any of those things? Find a horse, he asked, like he was in a hurry to get back to his tuna sandwich. Aye, a mare. She's beautiful. She had an accident, though. It's a long story, but I'm not sure she'll be ready for nationals. We're still working with her. Come home, then. Doc says Pearl's good. Got better faster than expected. You can use her? Use her? Yeah, that's exactly how her da thought. I won't put her through that if she's not well enough, Da. All she has to do is get through one barrel run. After that, who cares? Her stomach churned. Even if being around Colt had begun to change the negative way she looked at men, her Da managed to bring it all back in just one phone call. I care, Da. Call Duck, then. If you don't believe me, she'll do fine. You don't need to spend the money on another goddamn animal for us to feed. Come home. Nay, she didn't want to come home. She was reveling in her time away from her da, even if it put her lifelong dream in jeopardy. She nearly choked on her own spit with that realization, but there it was. With a glance at Colt's truck, she knew why. She didn't just want relief from her da's mean-spiritedness. She yearned for the kindness and protection Colt offered. The way he searched her eyes, reached inside her with such intensity, she felt swallowed up. He was doing funny things to her, things she didn't understand. I'm not coming home right yet, Da. Uh, I'm going to try a wee bit longer with Meg. Who the devil is Meg? The mare. 
Now see here, Elizabeth, you need to do what I say. Nay, da, not this time. She wanted to hang up on him, but the operator saved her another regret by asking for more change. I'll be in touch. She replaced the receiver and climbed back into the cab. It wasn't much longer before Colt returned, a receipt in hand. Removing his hat and placing it on the seat beside them, he pushed off the ground and slid in to face her. His mouth was grim. Ralph says someone put diesel in your gas tank. He had to drain it and put more gas back in. As far as the license plate is concerned, it was ripped off its bolts. So that I would get stopped by the sheriff? Did the person think I'd be arrested for that? Truth is, if it hadn't been Harvey himself, it could have gotten complicated since you're not a resident of Wyoming. For sure, someone wanted to make trouble with you. Do you know who'd want to do that? Her eyes widened in shock. I don't know anyone in Wyoming except you folks at Cooper Ranch. Colt blew out a breath, then reached to slam the truck door shut. He stared out the windshield. Finally, running one hand over his jaw, he turned his head toward her. It's us, then. Us? Meaning Cooper's? He nodded dropped his head as if reading the receipt. I'm sorry you got caught up in this, Riley. In what, Colt? Tell me. Maybe I can help. He looked over at her. Really looked. One side of his mouth lifted in one of his charming crooked smiles. You have a big heart, Elizabeth Riley Murphy. She shook her head. If he knew how selfish that heart was, this man wouldn't give her another moment of his precious time. It's the least I can do. You've helped me so much. Colt's laugh was raw, like it had to scrape over brokenness within him. <laughs> yeah, I've helped so much. You come all the way to Wyoming for a horse, and I managed to get the only one you want so broken she may never recover. Riley reached across the seat, grabbed the hand he had resting on the gear shift, and squeezed. You didn't do it to her, Colt. Criminy, you weren't even there at the time. Stop taking the troubles of the world onto your shoulders. Colt looked down at her hand. It felt good, this touch. Made her heart flutter, her tummy tumble. It fleshed out the invisible connection she'd felt since the first day she'd met him. He focused there until finally he slipped his hand from out under hers and rested it on his thigh. Her face heated with embarrassment. To him, she was just another one of his many admirers, ready to hook him and never let him go. His gaze met hers, an apology in the blue depths. Back to acquaintances, where a client should be, she reminded herself before he could make an apology for real. Well, blue eyes, what do I owe you for my truck? Is it ready to go? Glad her voice sounded almost normal, she reached for the receipt on his lap. Before she could get it in front of her eyes, he snatched it back. No charge. She doubted Ralph had fixed it for free. It's ready for you, parked on the side right over there. He nodded in that direction. Keys are in it. I have a stop to make, so I'll see you at home. Okay, thanks, but I'm sure I owe you money. At the very least, for the gas he had to put in it. Colt grinned and shooed her out. Go. She opened the door and started to climb down, then turned back. Wait a minute. You didn't tell me why you think my truck problems involved you. He heaved a weary sigh. Not for you to worry about, Irish. His smile didn't reach his eyes. Be careful driving home. Her heart sank. Willie's nickname for her was meant to push her away. One look told her he was trying to move her out of his space, back out of heart range. Without another word, she jumped out and pushed the door closed. She stared at Colt through the glass for a long moment, hoping he'd return the glance, give her something to hang on to. When he didn't, she shook off her disappointment. What was she thinking to wrap her head around a man rather than a horse? Back to your dreams, Betsy Murphy.
she muttered to herself as she strolled to her truck. The problem was, she no longer knew what her real dream was. Chapter 16 That's it, Meg. You can do it. Colt cooed to the mare. Meg cantered along the fence line, her inside ear cocked toward him. The fact that she was finally showing obedience rather than fear gave him hope, though he knew it was too late for Riley to train her into a barrel racer in time for nationals. His heart clenched in regret for her and in guilt for his part in it. He'd have to tell her soon. Maybe she had other options. He couldn't justify keeping her here over the ruse of training a horse when it was her company he was after. She was the first woman without a secret agenda who'd actually become his friend. I'll take over. You need to get ready, don't you? Riley said at his shoulder, mirroring his pivot to drive Meg forward. Colt ground his back teeth. He should have put a stop to the money-for-date scheme the moment the fashion show committee sprang it on him. He sure shouldn't have risked what he risked. It had taken a full year since their close call to push Jenny away, only to have lost all that ground in one short evening. He groaned. At least he was no longer tempted by her. That was what he'd have to bank on. Colt! Riley took hold of his biceps and turned him toward her, peering up into his eyes. Meg stopped her canter and moved into a walk. What worries you about this date? Tell me, please. I've been working with you for long enough to know that look when something deeply worries you. This isn't just about avoiding one of your admirers, is it? No. What is different about Jenny? Did he want to tell her? Is that why he hadn't shut her down and told her to mind her own business? I feel responsible you were even in that auction, being sold for a date. Let me help. Part of him wanted her help, though he knew from watching her these last few weeks that she didn't have experience with men. For crying out loud, she was barely aware she was a woman. Oh, but he was aware. Every time she tilted that adorable face up to him like she was doing right now, he became mesmerized by those freckles sprinkled across that cute nose, the rosy lips surrounding that sassy mouth, those eyes so big he could count every speck of brown, yellow, and swirl of green, and that sweet little body she'd tried to hide under men's clothes. Colt swallowed. Tearing his gaze away from her, he glanced around and saw the cowhands had scattered to their various jobs. Even Clayton was missing. Maybe he could trust her with this. I need to figure a way to get through this date without doing something I'll regret. Has that happened before? Is that why you're so afraid to date one of your followers? He frowned. I don't have followers. I'm not Jesus. She cringed. Jesus was just a man. Colt winced at her words. God and man. God in the flesh. I don't believe any of that. Why not? It's pretty simple, straightforward truth, Riley. If it weren't for Rebecca, he probably wouldn't have believed it either. But she'd been so sure. So he'd looked in the Bible. What he found amazed him, mainly the scripture in John 1.1. 1, 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. John 1.14 and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Those two Bible verses explained Jesus in the most uncomplicated terms. For Colt's simple mind, anyway. He'd been a believer ever since. She scowled. I don't want to talk about it. I want to help you with Jenny. Fine. But can we talk about God another time? Riley searched his eyes. From one eye to the other and back again like she'd see a lie if she looked long enough. But there was no lie. Jesus is God. The end. Or really, the beginning. Fine. I'll let you badger me later. He started to say he wouldn't badger, but she plunked one of her slender fingers against his mouth, shifting his thoughts away from the spiritual and straight into the physical. Before he could playfully grab her finger and kiss it, as he planned to do, she swiped it away and behind her back, 
He found he wanted to chase it down more than anything he'd ever wanted to do, and that stunned him. He backed a step, then another. She blinked, as naive as they came. Her innocence made Colt stop backing. She wasn't flirting, or playing, or plotting, or doing any other devious thing the women he was used to did. She'd just reacted, then caught herself in her mistake. Uh, she started. I, um, what were we talking about again? She said, then shook her head. Her ponytail swished about her face, and he wanted to lace his fingers through it, take that sassy mouth with his, and give her a kiss she'd never forget. Her first, he was sure of it. He took two steps back to her, planning to do what his mind had devised until he remembered where they were who she was, and why he was trying to stay away from women. He tried to step back again and nearly toppled. Glancing down, he saw the lunge line wrapped around both his and Riley's legs until they were tussled up like two steers awaiting the brand. He whipped his gaze up to Meg, who was nearly on top of them. Cute. How'd you manage that one? Clay said from the other side of the gate. He let himself in and strode up to them with a saddle and blanket in hand. The mare took one look at Clay, sniffed the air, then yanked backward against the rope, eyes wide with fear. Easy, girl. Easy, girl, both Clay and Colt said, but she was having none of it. Clay dropped his armload and leapt toward the mare, caught her cheek piece and tugged her forward. Colt let loose of the useless end of rope he was still holding and, with the speed of a calf roper, pushed the wound line both down his and Riley's bodies. He lifted Riley out of the coil seconds before Meg reared. Clay's arms snapped straight, then Meg hauled him backward in a cloud of dust. The coil tightened around Colt's boots. Next he knew, his back hit dirt and he was careening feet first across the ground. Colt! Riley screeched, then ran toward Meg. Whoa, girl, settle down, she purred. It's okay, it's okay, easy now. She held her hands out before she glided closer. No, Riley, Colt said in a low tone. Stop. But she didn't heed his words. She grasped the taut rope and helped Clay pull against her, all the while trying to calm her with words. Finally, Meg stopped, planted her front hooves in the loose dirt, and stood quivering. Easy now. Riley gathered the rope as she eased up to her. Eyed Clay and gave him the signal to let loose and back away. Clay nodded and did what she asked. After another few tense seconds, Clay twisted around and came to Colt. I'm fine. Colt reached down to yank at the rope, but he couldn't undo himself fast enough before the mare backed and the line went taut again. Come on, girl, Riley said to Meg. The mare eyed Riley, then finally took a step toward her. The rope loosened. Clay undid him so fast Colt barely saw it. Once he was free, Clay offered his hand, then hauled him to his feet. You okay there, partner? Colt harumphed, but he couldn't hide his smile. This reminded him of the early years with Clay, the good years. Colt dusted himself off, feeling the pinch here and there of strained muscles. He'd be all right. Thankfully, Riley hadn't been tangled up in that mess with him, he didn't think her small body would have weathered as well. Once he'd taken stock of all his body parts, he searched out Riley and found her standing next to a calm Meg with her eyes locked on him. Worry lines seemed to connect the dots on her forehead. He frowned, not happy he'd put that expression on her face. She had enough to worry about to concern herself with him. He took a few steps to her, feeling a twinge of pain in his knee and hip on one side. Forcing through the pain, he tried not to limp. She saw it, though. You're hurt. She looked over his left side. You need to let me help you with that. He wanted to laugh at the visual of Riley with her slender hands and petite body trying to yank and maneuver Colt's heavy frame. Then just as quickly, the amusement ended and a desire to let her try took its place. Seriously, Colt, 
I've learned some moves on the rodeo circuit. I can help you. She was so green. She had no idea the double meaning she had just given him. The quick fury rose up, filling his cheeks with heat. How many cowboys had she helped? And how many of them faked injuries so she would? He vowed before she left this ranch to have a serious talk with her about men's motives. The scowl remained on his face. Clay's eyebrows lifted. I'll take Meg back if she'll let me. You two go on back to your apartment, Betsy. Give him a good working over, he said as he tried not to grin. Colt saw it and would have socked him if the skittish mare hadn't been standing so close. Here, Riley said, handing the rope to Clay. Just don't talk to her as you pull her along. For some reason, men's voices scare her most. Clay grinned, nodded, then turned and led the quieted Meg away. Can I help you back to my place? she asked. My place. That sounded better than it should, considering it was on his ranch. Now nah, I can walk. Really, I'm fine. She jogged ahead for a few feet, then turned and walked back, watching his gait. You're trying not to limp. I can help you. You have a date tonight. Her voice trailed off as her own words seemed to sink in, leaving a somber look on her face. She didn't like that he had a date. Before he could question her about it, she went on. I can at least help you not be in pain. Come on. She sidled up next to him and threw her arm around his waist. His arm had nowhere to go but over her shoulders. It felt good. Too good. Having her fitted into his side as if she belonged there. They walked that way until they reached the fire truck by the door to the back apartment. Where's Jimmy been? he asked. She paused, her brows knit together in a frown. I noticed my truck was gone a while ago. Jimmy tends to find the nearest bar whenever we're on the road. I worry about him sometimes. It's usually why I chose to drive on the rodeo circuit. She jumped forward to slide the apartment door open, then came back to him. He didn't need her help, but found comfort in the feel of her. So he let it happen. He hadn't allowed anyone this close since he and Jenny had gotten in trouble. He missed the feel of a woman's soft body pressed against his, missed the smell of a woman. Hers was plain old soap, hay, fresh air, and Riley's own scent. Pleasant, natural. Come on, Gimpy, we'll get you fixed up. She smiled playfully up at him. The impact of that smile hit him dead center. He didn't let Riley move him, wanted to be still, soak up the look of it and how it made him feel. Before long, he found himself returning the smile. They stood grinning at one another until Clay's voice broke in as he closed the barn door. Don't you have a date tonight, big brother? That jolted them out of their mutual appreciation of each other and into matching frowns. Colt lifted his hand off Riley's shoulder and flipped a crude gesture at Clay that he made sure Riley didn't see. Clay laughed as he turned away toward the house. Sorry about my brother, Colt said. He never did know when to butt out. Riley looked like she wanted to ask him about that, but chewed on her upper lip instead. She took his hand. Come on, let's fix you. Pulling him past the fire truck, she led him through the apartment's small kitchenette and kept on going toward the bedroom. Colt's hand tingled where she grasped it, his body lighting up with alarm and awakening all at the same time. Where are you taking me? To bed, she said simply. Colt ground to a stop. Wait, why exactly? He tugged on her arm, and her tiny body flew back and lodged into him. His arms came around her unconsciously to hold her steady. She took one look at his face, only inches from her own, and burst out laughing. <laughs> Relax, blue eyes. I'm only planning to adjust you. Adjust me? I'm sure you've heard of Clarence Gonstead, doctor of chiropractic. He jumped back, practically throwing her off him, then grimaced from the pain. Oh, no, you don't. You're not going to crack my spine. Riley planted her hands on her hips and laughed some more. 
The sound transported him to a time and place where fun and freedom and light-heartedness existed. He stared at her face and watched her laugh. His gaze landed on his favorite freckle at the corner of her mouth, the one he wanted to nip, then lick, before he took her mouth in a heated kiss. He'd do this chiropractic baloney if that's what it took to keep her laughing, and near him. She soon stopped and tilted her head as she studied him. You okay? He shook his head, then nodded. Sure. Good. Now listen up, Mr. Cooper. That got his attention. Her hands were still on her hips. Chiropractic is a legitimate way to unstick your joints when they get out of alignment, by injury or even everyday life. Joints get stuck, then they swell and cause muscle spasms. You're in pain, right? He debated whether to admit that or not. Are you a doctor of chiropractic? Well, no, but I've had it done many times, and I've seen it done many times. Here's something you'll like, I'm sure. Dr. Gonstead's philosophy is, the power that made the body heals the body. Colt raised an eyebrow. Ah, a reference to God. That was a start. So stop arguing with me and lie down on the bed. She gestured with her arm toward the other room and the awaiting bed. Bossy little thing. Without warning, Colt found himself thinking of other ways she could boss him around. On that bed. Hold up there, he admonished himself. He'd end up in trouble again if he didn't watch himself. Thoughts of Jenny circled his brain, effectively cutting off any reckless yearnings he started to entertain for Riley and bringing him back to the dangerous night ahead. No time, Spitfire. I have a date tonight, remember? He said in a clipped tone wanting to blame Riley all over again. She had the grace to look sheepish. I'm truly sorry about that. If I hadn't had a horse to buy, I would have stayed and bought you in a red-hot second. The minute those words came out of her mouth, her eyes grew large. I, I mean, you, you know what I mean. To get you out of it. Colt's eyebrows shot up to his hairline. Her face filled with pink, then darkened to red, and made every freckle stand out even more, which he was sure she hated, but which he grew fonder of by the day. Then reality crowded in again. I've got to get cleaned up. That snapped her out of her embarrassment and right back to Bossy. Uh-uh. I'm going to fix you first. Come on. She grabbed his hand, and the energy between them crackled. She tugged, and he was helpless not to follow, even with the deepening pinch of pain that accompanied each footstep. With a gesture toward the bed, she said, Lie face down. Let your toes hang off. What are you going to do? he asked, but decided surrendering was the simplest path. He grunted as he braced himself with his arms and flopped down, stuffing his face into his grandmother's quilt and its dozens of squares of old clothes. It still smelled of her. He missed the old girl. Thinking of her was the only time he contemplated having a family. But the thought was fleeting, and so was his comfort level, apparently, since Riley had a hold of both his feet, had bent his knees, and put the heel of his boots together. Oh, my gosh. I wish you could see this, Colt. One leg's shorter than the other. When you're injured, sometimes the pelvis rotates. It looks like that's what happened here. Her logic was sound. Now he hoped she knew what she was doing and didn't create more pain. He turned his head to one side so he could talk. What can you do? Nothing drastic. I'm going to do what my chiropractor taught me. Pull on the shorter leg, then the other if needed. The whole idea is to unstick what's stuck, you know? Now put your head back straight and try to relax. With that... She gave a hefty yank on one of his legs. He grunted, surprised by her strength. She did it again, and he felt a pop in his hip, an immediate relief from the pain. Whoa, the word muffled in the quilt. I heard a pop. Does it feel better? Yes, but I'm afraid to move. She laughed. It's fine, really. Here, let me help you. First, we'll turn you on your side. 
Dropping a knee on the bed next to him, she pushed his shoulder as he turned off his stomach. Now he was facing her, looking up into her face. Their eyes locked as she grinned, plainly happy with herself. They were very close. He could feel her breath on his face, sweet and warm. You okay? Any pain? She asked, a little breathless. His gaze swept over the features he loved to look at. She was striking this little spitfire. And what made it better? She didn't know it. Before he thought better of it, he slid his hand around her neck and drew her closer, prepared to give her that kiss he'd contemplated. She gasped. He let loose. Sorry, I just... Uh, thank you. I wanted to thank you. Her perplexed look gave him pause. He'd surprised her, but didn't think he'd revolted her. She hadn't moved, after all, which meant... He reached up and grasped the rubber band holding her ponytail in place and pulled it slowly toward him. Her hair fanned out around one side of her face and fell into his. He spread his fingers and combed them through the silkiness over and over, watching it fall on his face again and again. When finally he pushed the soft waves over her shoulder, he looked her in the eye. You have wonderful hair, Riley. I've wanted to touch it since the day you arrived. I love the color. So alive. The way the sun catches it and lights it on fire. Her lips parted, and her green eyes widened, and he was a goner. Slipping his hand back into the sleek waves, he pulled her to him and fixed his mouth on hers. She was responsive, though hesitant and a little awkward. He was right. Her first real kiss. That knowledge sped his blood. He wanted to pull her onto the bed with him and into his arms. Instead, he called on his control, forced himself to release her and not to touch her again. He didn't want to scare her off. Needed to keep her near. Promised himself he'd kiss her another time but his next thought brought gloom. Colt was about to go on a date with another woman. Here, let me help you up. Grasping his hand, she pulled him upright. Slowly now. Their eyes remained locked until she dropped her gaze to his hands. Grasping them, she carefully pulled him toward her until he was standing, looking down into her sweet face. After a few seconds, she let go and studied his face, assessing his pain level. Good? Good, he said, then grinned. Thankfully, she hadn't reacted badly to his boldness or the kiss he'd be thinking about all evening. She backed out of his way, and he took a few steps around the small bedroom and back to her. No pain, no limp. He released a happy sound, grinned, then came forward and grasped her head in both his hands. He nipped the freckle on the side of her mouth like he'd been wanting to do, then gave her a peck on the lips. I do love that freckle, he mumbled, and slid his hands down to cup her cheeks. Short breaths sawed in and out of her mouth. He leaned back enough to take in her face. She was adorable. Time to switch the focus. Well, I feel great. You made a believer out of me. He'd be sure to return the favor. He didn't know much, just knew he cared enough about what happened to Riley when she left this earth to share Jesus with her. You need to get ready, she said, within his large grip. The delight of the moment flew off as dread settled in. Colt dropped his hands from the soft skin of her face and pondered his evening. Got any ideas? Dinner in a movie? Do you have a drive-in theater somewhere close? Yeah. I think Parent Trap is still playing there. Perfect. Any woman would like that. She's probably already seen it. Abruptly, her mouth opened, and she sucked in a quick breath. I have an idea, he chuckled. Okay. Spit it out before it strangles you. He laughed again. It's obvious you don't want to be alone with her, right? He rolled his eyes and nodded. 
How about you tell your cowpokes out there, she gestured toward the outdoors, that you're going to be at the drive-in. I don't know about your friends, but mine would take the opportunity to harass me on my date if they knew where I was going. She stopped, an ample smile lighting up her whole face as she waited for his reaction. Great idea! All he wanted to do was stare, watch the freckled dance about her face as she talked and grinned. I'll spread the news. Oh, and I can pick up burgers to take with us. No restaurant needed. It's perfect! Well, as perfect as it could be with the wrong woman on his arm.'